Water, earth, fire, air, YouTube. Long ago, the five nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when the YouTube nation attacked. Only Channel Frederator, master of all five elements, could stop them. And when the earth needed them most, they put out a whole bunch of fun and informative avatar videos. And then we took all those videos and made a mega marathon for you to binge. Welcome back to Channel Frederator. We've collected some of our favorite Avatar and Legend of Korra videos and put them into one big wicked compilation. Bitter patter, let's get at her. Let's start at the beginning, which is to say an overview of the Avatar The Last Airbender timeline. Books 1 through 3, Water, Earth, and Fire. We'll save the Korra timeline for a bit later. Get ready for that. For now, let's take a look at the complete Avatar The Last Airbender timeline, which debuted on Channel Frederator in 2019 to the tune of about 5 million views. flamey -o, Hotman. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and just like you, I remember Aang as the adorably charming hero from Nickelodeon's hit series Avatar The Last Airbender, which premiered back in 2005. But I just finished a rewatch of it a few weeks ago, and... It's somehow even better than I remember it. And with the announcement of a live action reboot of the series coming to Netflix almost 15 years later, we here at Channel Frederator thought that this would be a pretty good time to take a trip down memory lane and look back on Michael DiMartino and Brian Konitzko's awesome series. But before we can even get to the adventures of the gang, we have to go a little bit further back. So brace yourselves because this is the Avatar The Last Airbender timeline. The Era of Rava Since the beginning of time, the spirits of light and dark have been engaged in a constant battle. These spirits are known as Rava, the spirit of light and peace, and Vatu, the spirit of darkness and chaos. Once every 10,000 years, a supernatural occurrence takes place in which the planets align and spiritual energy is greatly amplified, enveloping the Earth. During this event, Rava and Vatu engage in a battle that determines the fate of the world for the next 10,000 years. This event is known as the Harmonic Convergence. During the convergence of 19,829 years before for Aang's time, Vatu destroyed the boundaries between the mortal world and the spirit world. With nothing to keep the spirits in their own world, they began migrating to the physical world, taking most of the land for themselves. These parts were known as the spirit wilds. Humans eventually had to split apart to seek shelter and protection on the backs of giant elemental lion turtles, and over time, many started to forget that other communities existed beyond their own lion turtle. The First Avatar During this era, people would leave their lion turtles to hunt for food in the spirit wilds. In order to survive, the lion turtle would temporarily bestow the humans with the power to control, or bend, whichever of the four elements that turtle happened to possess. One day, a young man named Juan stole the art of fire from the lion turtle in order to steal food from the rich and give to the poor. He was caught, however, and banished to the spirit wilds permanently. Out of sympathy, though, the lion turtle allowed him to keep his firebending ability. During his banishment, Juan encountered a dragon who helped him master the art of firebending. The technique he learned from the dragon became known as the dancing dragon form. Then one day, he came across two battling spirits and decided to interfere. Unfortunately, these spirits were Rava and Vatu, and because of Juan's interference, Vatu was freed to wreak havoc on the physical world. Seeking redemption, Juan teamed up with Rava and began training to master all of the elements before the next oncoming harmonic convergence. When the time came, he challenged Vatu in the name of Rava, allowing the spirit to possess his body. The two remained together during harmonic convergence, and it caused them to permanently merge together, creating the first avatar. Literally, the human avatar of the spirit of light. Thanks to the avatar's powers, the lion turtles were able to pass on their duty to protect mankind to the Avatar. Avatar 1 became the bridge between the two worlds. His task, and the task of all avatars that came after him, was to maintain balance and peace between the mortal and spiritual realms. Many years passed, and when Wan neared the end of his life, Rava assured him that their spirits would remain together throughout time. The Avatar would go on to be reincarnated in each new generation, ensuring the balance between the worlds. The Four Nations Era As humanity left behind the cities established on the backs of the Lion Turtles, they began to come into contact with one another and because humanity is humanity, wage war against each other. Juan had intervened to keep the peace in the past, but to little avail. Once he passed away and was reincarnated, the next avatar would do the same, and thus the cycle continued. Eventually, humanity split into four different nations, dictated by their respective bending arts. They were the water tribes, who learned the art of water bending by studying the moon and tides, the earth kingdom, whose people learned earth bending skills from the great badger moles tunneling underneath the ground, the sun warriors, who were taught the ancient art of fire bending from the dragons themselves, and of course, the air gnomes nomads who were taught by the flying bison. As 
centuries went by, the nations evolved. The waterbenders split into two tribes situated at the North and South Poles, the Fire Islands were united as the Fire Nation, and the Earth King's power began to wane as civil unrest began to worsen throughout his kingdom. Meanwhile, the Air Nomads eventually expanded into four different temples, North, South, East, and West. The Fire Nation would go on to enter an era of great prosperity and modernization unlike the other nations. Avatar Roku and Crown Prince Sozin were born into the Fire Nation during this time of progress and became close friends in their childhood. Eventually, though, their friendship went sour, as Avatar is gonna Avatar, and Roku became a force of balance and peace, not just among the two realms, but all of humanity as well. Conversely, Sozin dreamed of a global empire under his rule, and these ambitions led the now Fire Lord Sozin to initiate a number of reforms that militarized the country. As a result, both spirituality and respect for life rapidly declined throughout the nation, leading to the near extinction of the dragons. One might say that everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Eventually, several colonies were established in the weakened Earth Kingdom, which in turn quickly became local industrial centers. Sozin's expansionism was eventually stunted by Roku, though, since all of this goes against his whole spiritual purpose. Years later, though, as Roku lay dying after a failed attempt to control a volcanic eruption, he begged Sozin for help. Sozin rationalized, however, that with Roku out of the way, he would be free to continue his crusades. Blinded by his own ambition, Fire Lord Sozin left his former best friend to die. A new avatar. Raised by the monks of the Southern Air Temple, young Aang possessed a mastery in airbending. By age 10, Aang had surpassed his master in the art, and by the time he turned 12, he had invented a new airbending technique called the Air Scooter, which led to his becoming the youngest airbending master to ever live, earning him his very own blue arrow-shaped tattoos that all of the masters wore before him. It wasn't long after that the monks revealed to Aang that he was the avatar, and that he alone was destined to master all four elements and bring peace to the world. Typically, this news is given once the avatar reaches 16 years of age, however, the monks feared that a war among nations was imminent, and it didn't leave them much time to prepare. Aang immediately began to feel overwhelmed by his new responsibility, though, especially once his caretakers pressured him to train harder. The only monk who was sympathetic towards Aang was the elder monk Gyatso, his airbending teacher and guardian. Whenever his training would start to take its toll, Gyatso insisted that Aang take a break and have some fun. He believed that it was vital for Aang to be allowed to grow up as a normal boy. Unfortunately, the other monks disagreed, and they decided to send Aang away to the Eastern Air Temple, where he would focus solely on training. Unbeknownst to them, though, Aang had overheard their conversation, and frightened by the new circumstances, Aang jumped on his flying bison Appa and made his escape. Aang couldn't catch a break, though, because while over the southern ocean, a storm caused Appa to plunge into the sea. In an incredible display of power and self-preservation, Aang surrounded himself and Appa in an air bubble, but it quickly froze into an iceberg, leaving them in a state of suspended animation. The Last Airbender Hey, wait a minute, that's, that's the title of the- A hundred years passed since the Avatar's disappearance until one day two bickering teenagers from the Southern Water Tribe, Katara, a waterbender, and her brother Sokka, a boomerang boy, which is not a real thing, I just made that up, accidentally free Aang from his iceberg. Upon discovering that Aang is an airbender, they escort him back to the Southern Water Tribe where he's met with many bewildered stares. As it turns out, none of them have ever seen an airbender before. No one has in over a hundred years. That's because during Aang's absence, the Fire Nation waged war against the others, starting by completely wiping out all of the Air Nomads. The Fire Lord Sozin took advantage of an incoming comet, later dubbed Sozin's Comet for obvious reasons, to enhance his firebending abilities and storm all four air temples, slaughtering every monk within to ensure the death of the new Avatar, thus making Aang the last known airbender in existence. The news of all of this transpiring doesn't come lightly to Aang. It's a, it's a bit of a wake-up call, to put it lightly. Aang quickly realizes that the entire fate of the world rests on his shoulders. Not only is it his duty to defeat the Fire Nation, but it's his destiny. So to fulfill the prophecy, Aang and his new friends set off on a quest to master every bending technique while carefully evading capture by the Fire Nation, who have been in search of the missing Avatar for all these hundred years. Book 1, Water. On their journey to the North Pole in search of a waterbending teacher, Team Avatar finds themselves in a small Earth Kingdom village under attack by Hei Bai, a monster from the spirit world. Because Aang is the one person who can bridge the physical and spirit worlds, the villagers believe he can make peace with the spirit. So he travels to the spirit world where he's told that Avatar Roku has a message for him on the winter solstice. Aang returns and calms the attacking spirit, restoring peace to the village. In order to retrieve Roku's message though, Team Avatar must cross into the Fire Nation waters on their way to a fire temple dubbed 
robbed Roku's temple. Before arriving at said temple, the three are met with a blockade of Fire Nation soldiers led by the newly promoted Admiral Zhao. They make it through, but the Fire Prince Zuko pursues them through the blockade. While inside the Fire Temple, Aang manages to enter the sanctuary after narrowly escaping capture by Zuko and the other Fire Sages, who instead capture Sokka and Katara. He's confronted by the spirit of Avatar Roku, who warns Aang about Sozin's Comet. The Comet is due to return in less than a year, at which time it will increase the Fire Nation's power, allowing them to end the war with a final assault. If Aang is to stop the Fire Nation, he must defeat the Fire Lord before the Comet's arrival, and for Aang to have any hope of defeating the Fire Lord, he must first master all four elements. It's a hell of a ticking clock. Roku's spirit then briefly possesses Aang's body, repelling Zhao's forces and destroying the temple. Aang is unnerved by the fact that he has to master all elements in under a year. Why doesn't he just learn every language in a week while he's at it? So despite still being a relatively inexperienced waterbender herself, Katara begins teaching Aang everything she knows about waterbending. While in town to buy supplies, she comes across a waterbending scroll owned by pirates and swipes it so that they can both learn its new techniques. Katara struggles to learn the new moves, while Aang picks them up quickly, much to her frustration. Meanwhile, Zuko, always hot on the trail, encounters the pirates and agrees to help them search for the scroll, knowing that it will lead them to the Avatar, which of course leads to the capturing of Aang, Katara, and Sokka. Luckily, the three manage to escape using their newly developed waterbending skills. And also, Sokka is there, but... He does, he can't, he's not a waterbender. Meanwhile, Zuko's crew begins to question his leadership skills, so his uncle Iroh explains to them that the prince didn't get his trademark scar in a training accident, as the crew were led to believe, but in an Agni Kai, a type of ceremonial firebending duel with his own father, Fire Lord Ozai, the grandson of Sozin. When Zuko spoke up in a meeting protesting the Fire Nation generals' ends justify the means mentality towards their own soldiers' lives, his father challenged him to Agni Kai as a punishment for such insubordination. And when Zuko refused to fight back, his father burned his face and banished him from the Fire Nation. For the last three years of Zuko's life, he's not been allowed to return unless he restored his honor by finding and capturing the Avatar, something no one has been able to do in over a hundred years, so until recently, the odds haven't exactly been with Zuko on this one. During this time, Team Avatar arrives at a Fire Nation town that's hosting a festival. Here, the trio learns about the Deserter, a man named Zhang Zhang who went AWOL on the Fire Nation army and lived to tell the tale, making him a powerful firebending master who unaffiliated with the Fire Nation. Unfortunately, Aang has difficulties maintaining the self-discipline required for safe firebending and accidentally burns Katara. However, this leads Katara to discover that she possesses the power of healing. Meanwhile, Admiral Zhao arrives to fight Aang, but Aang escapes him by using Zhao's lack of self-control against him, causing him to burn his own ship. Turns out uh, Zhao's not exactly the master tactician he'd have people believe, and Zhang Zhang, being Zhao's former teacher, has always seen right through. Afterwards, the group journeys to the Northern Water Tribe, where they're welcomed warmly by its citizens. Aang and Katara seek the teachings of Paku, the Northern Water Tribe's best waterbending master. However, being a stubborn traditionalist, he refuses to teach a woman like Katara in the ways of combat. That is, until he notices Katara's pendant, which was a gift from her mother. Paku recognizes the necklace as the same one that he gave to his fiancé years earlier, meaning, wait, is Katara Katara his fiance? Nah, I'm just kidding, but her grandma was. She left him after realizing he was kinda sexist. Imagine that! Realizing that it was his stubborn commitment to tradition that drove away his true love in the first place, and impressed with Katara's fighting skills, Paku finally agrees to train her. Meanwhile, Uncle Iroh helps Zuko fake his death and sneak aboard Zhao's lead ship as his fleet departs for the North Pole. Zhao had previously attempted to assassinate Zuko after Zuko secretly thwarted one of Zhao's attempted captures of the Avatar. After all, if Zhao captures the Avatar, then Zuko can't do it to regain his honor, can he? As the Fire Nation's armada approaches the Northern Water Tribe, the citizens scramble to set up their defenses. Aang believes speaking to the moon and ocean spirits could give him some insight into defeating the Fire Nation. However, once Aang's spirit leaves his body, Zuko arrives and kidnaps Aang's defenseless body just before the Fire Nation begins their attack. The Firebenders manage to infiltrate the fortress of the Northern Water Tribe and raid the city. Aang attempts to return to the spirit world, but since his body has been moved, his spirit rockets across the sky towards the location of his body. This allows Sokka, Katara, and Yue, princess of the Northern Water Tribe, and Sokka's girlfriend, to follow his spirit back to Aang. In order to destroy the moon, thus eliminating the source of the Waterbender's power, Admiral Zhao slays the moon spirit Tui in its physical form, despite warnings from Iroh to not destroy the moon. What kind of crazy plan is that? Thankfully, Aang returns and slips into the Avatar state, a sort of turbocharged mode where the Avatar is able to channel the knowledge and power of all of their previous incarnations and joins forces with the ocean spirit La to wipe out the Fire Nation armada. After Iroh and Zuko both survive the assault, Zuko confronts and fights an escaping Zhao, while Iroh stays with Team Avatar to 
try to revive Twi. It's at this point we should probably mention that while Iroh was a renowned Fire Nation general at one point, Iroh is now a good-natured person who doesn't necessarily stand with the Fire Nation so much as he wants to keep his nephew from slipping into the abyss, and therefore doesn't really harbor any ill will toward Team Avatar like Zuko does. It's revealed that the Moon Spirit touched Princess Yue as a baby, giving her a spark of life. Yue gives that spark back, sacrificing herself to become reincarnated as the Moon Spirit. Oh, poor Sokka. That's rough, buddy. Zhao is then pulled underwater by the Ocean Spirit and is cast into the spirit world to wander through the fog of lost souls for all eternity as punishment for his misdeeds. Good lord, at this point I think drowning would have been a better fate for him. Upon hearing the results of the battle, Fire Lord Ozai back at the Fire Nation commands Zuko's sister Azula to hunt down her traitorous uncle and brother for failing to capture the Avatar. Book 2, Earth. After their journey to the North Pole, Aang and his friends travel to Omashu, searching for Aang's childhood friend, King Bumi, in hopes that he'll teach young Aang the ways of earthbending. It's also suggested to Aang that he consider fighting the Fire Lord by triggering the Avatar state, since doing so at the North Pole was so effective. However, Aang is later warned by Avatar Roku that if he's killed during the Avatar state, the Avatar spirit will disappear and the line of reincarnation will end forever. To make matters worse, Aang and his friends arrive at Omashu to find it captured, having been renamed New Ozai by Azula. Meanwhile, Zuko and Iroh receive a surprise visit from Azula, who asks them to return home. Zuko, believing his banishment to be over, excitedly agrees, while a more reserved Iroh reluctantly accompanies him to Azula's ship, where they discover her invitation is a ploy to imprison them. They escape, but are forced to live as outcasts because their actions at the North Pole are viewed as treasonous by the Fire Nation. Team Avatar's search for an earthbending teacher takes them to an underground earthbending tournament, promoted by a guy named Shin Fu. It's here that they witness a young blind girl named Toph show off formidable earthbending skills. She fights under the secret of moniker, The Blind Bandit. Unfortunately, Toph is restricted by her overprotective parents who keep her isolated in hopes that she'll eventually conform to the social roles of the Earth Kingdom aristocracy. It goes about as well as you'd expect. So Toph runs away from home and joins Team Avatar, but her parents, believing she was kidnapped, pay off Shin Fu and local earthbending teacher Master Yu to retrieve her by any means necessary. Aang begins his earthbending training with Toph, but it doesn't come easy. Avatars naturally have more trouble learning elements that run counter to their own, as the elements are a reflection of their personalities, and the strong, steady willpower requires required for earthbending is a little difficult for a twinkle-toed air nomad. Elsewhere, Zuko, determined to get stronger, struggles with lightning bending, an advanced form of fire bending. His anger keeps him from obtaining the precision required to pull it off, and his frustrations only grow in knowing his father and sister have already mastered the skill. Trying a different approach, Iroh shares his belief that wisdom comes from many sources. He advises young Zuko to study the other elements, and in doing so, he can become a wiser and more balanced individual. To drive the point home, Iroh then teaches Zuko the art of not lightning bending, but redirecting lightning, a technique he originated by training with waterbenders. At an oasis, Team Avatar encounters a professor who tells them about a hidden spirit library in the desert. The group travels into the desert and eventually locates the entrance to the library. Toph, claiming she's never really seen the appeal of books, pun completely intended, elects to stay outside with Appa. Wan Chi Tong, the giant owl spirit who guards the library, lets them in on the condition that they don't use any of the knowledge in the library for war. Sure, no problem. Inside the library, however, Sokka learns something that could end the war. An upcoming solar eclipse will temporarily render the firebenders completely powerless. Unfortunately, Wan Chi Thong refuses to let them leave with this information and sinks the library into the sand. And while all of this is going on, a group of sandbender bandits attack, making away with Appa. Toph, who's learned to use her feet to gauge her surroundings, is marred by the desert sands and is unable to stop them. The rest of Team Avatar makes that out of the library, but the professor decides to stay behind forever and revel in the endless well of knowledge that he's discovered. I, mean, I don't know what he thinks he's gonna eat down there, though. I mean, maybe the owl will give it. Oh. Uh oh. Oh no. With their main mode of transport, Appa gone, the team is stranded. After a long, exhausting hike through the desert, Aang tracks down the sandbenders who stole Appa and learns that his beloved flying bison was traded to a merchant in Ba Sing Se, the capital of the Earth Kingdom. When Aang learns that Appa's been traded, he gets so angry that he triggers the Avatar state, nearly killing the sandbenders, showing once again the true terrifying power of the Avatar state. The group then travels to the impenetrable walled city of Ba Sing Se on a mission to find Appa and inform the Earth King about the solar eclipse. However, they soon discover that this is no easy feat. They're assigned a liaison, a young woman named Ju Di, who gives them a tour of the kingdom along with its many disturbing rules, one of which forbids mentioning the war. There is no war in Ba Sing Se. However, the rigid rules aren't the most disturbing thing they encounter within the Earth Kingdom. Team Avatar also discovers the existence of the Dai Li, the secret police force of Ba Sing Se, which enforce the law under the command of their corrupt leader 
leader Long Feng, who appears to know something about Appa. Finally, the group decides to sneak away from their chaperones to find Appa. They discover a facility located at the bottom of Lake Laogai, where they uncover a brainwashing operation perpetrated by Long Feng and the Dai Li to control Ba Sing Se from behind the scenes. Zuko, who had been hiding out in Ba Sing Se at the time, helping his uncle manage a tea shop, finds that old habits die hard and tracks Aang down to the facility, but stumbles upon an imprisoned Appa first. He plans to use Appa as a bargaining chip, but his uncle encourages him to free the Sky Bison instead. Surprisingly, Zuko agrees with his uncle. Team Avatar faces off against the Dai Li in an intense battle that ends with the good guys victorious, but not without loss. And afterwards, Aang and Appa are joyously reunited. After discovering the king has been kept in the dark about the war with the Fire Nation, as well as the Dai Li corrupting his kingdom, the group breaks into the Earth King Kuei's palace to warn him about the upcoming eclipse and the conspiracy against him. Though initially unsuccessful, as the king is unaware that there's even a war going on thanks to the Dai Li's propaganda, Team Avatar is ultimately able to expose Long Feng's lies. Long Feng is then promptly arrested for treason, and the Earth King agrees to cooperate with Team Avatar as they prepare for an invasion of the Fire Nation during the Solar Eclipse. Meanwhile, Zuko falls mysteriously ill, which Iroh believes is caused by his nephew's internal conflict. Zuko struggles with both what's required of him as Prince of the Fire Nation and his true self, whose growth Iroh has been trying to foster for years. Later, Aang travels to the Eastern Air Temple to meet with Guru Pati, who trains him in mastering the Avatar state through unlocking his chakras. During this time, Toph is captured by Shin Fu and Master Yu, remember them? They lock her in an iron case to negate her earthbending powers and start to take her back to her parents. However, they've vastly underestimated Toph's ability as she realizes there are tiny bits of earth within the metal and tears open the enclosure, thus creating a new form of earthbending, metal bending. Back at the Air Temple, Aang slowly unlocks all of his chakras, except for the last, which requires he give up all earthly attachments, including his feelings toward others, specifically Katara, which he simply cannot do. He abandons his training with the Guru after sensing Katara is in trouble back at Ba Sing Se. What sort of trouble is Katara in? Well, Azula and her entourage have infiltrated the Earth Kingdom disguised as friends of Team Avatars, the noble warriors of former Avatar Kyoshi. Upon gaining everyone's trust, Azula frees Long Feng, captures Katara, and takes over over the Dai Li, having Zuko imprisoned as well. Zuko officially meets Katara for the first time and discovers they have a lot in common. Katara even considers lifting some of Zuko's burden by healing his scar with her healing powers and a small amount of water from the spirit oasis of the Northern Water Tribe. It's basically super healing water, and Katara only has a small vial of it. At that moment, Aang, aided by Iroh, attempts to free Zuko and Katara. Iroh implores Zuko to consider the path he's on, in hopes that the prince will abandon his brutal past and become enlightened. Much to Iroh Iroh's dismay, though, Zuko chooses to attack the Avatar instead, and a battle ensues. Aang enters the Avatar state just as Azula strikes him with lightning, essentially killing him and severing his connection to the Avatar spirit. Launching into the offensive, Iroh delays the Fire Nation's forces just long enough for Team Avatar to escape. Iroh then surrenders and is taken prisoner as a traitor to the Fire Nation, and Katara uses her healing powers as well as that spirit oasis water in order to resuscitate Aang, but consequences of being killed in the Avatar state remain. Aang is no longer able to enter the Avatar state at all. Book 3, Fire. Aang awakens to find himself and his friends aboard a stolen Fire Nation ship. He's still very weak, sporting a wicked scar on his torso, and to top it all off, everyone outside the ship believes him to be dead. Again. Though Aang's friends assure him that this is a good thing, because if the Fire Nation thinks he's dead, they won't be chasing him down, nor will they expect their impending invasion. Back in the Fire Nation, Fire Lord Ozai finally makes an in-person appearance to welcome his children home and praise them for taking out the Avatar. However, Zuko secretly suspects that Aang is still alive and seeks out a terrifying-looking assassin to finish the job as a failsafe. Sokka finally admits that his lack of bending skills have made him feel like a bit of an outcast, so to ensure that he can hold his own in the oncoming battles, he decides to build upon his sword fighting skills. Sokka eventually convinces Pian Dao, a renowned Fire Nation swordmaster, to be his instructor. Pian Dao puts Sokka through the ringer, but delivers on his promise and even helps him forge his own sword out of the metal from a meteor. After all, one sword is an extension of oneself. Sokka's guild grows, though, and he eventually confesses to Pian Dao that he is not, in fact, from the Fire Nation. A bold move, considering the Fire Nation's attitudes towards anyone who's not Fire Nation. Piandao responds by attacking Sokka, but after he proves himself in an intense sword duel, Piandao reveals that this was his final test, assuring Sokka that he already knew he wasn't Fire Nation, but trained him nonetheless because he truly believed that the way of the sword belongs to all nations. On Eclipse Day, many friends and allies reunite with Team Avatar to launch an invasion on the Fire Nation. Their invasion forces rely heavily upon several forms of bending and even some aquatic vehicles, but with their combined efforts, they're able to circumvent the Fire Nation's defense 
defenses and infiltrate the capital, waging a grueling assault on the place. However, once Aang finally reaches the Fire Lord's palace, he discovers that no one is there. After all, Azula had already learned of their plans after infiltrating Ba Sing Se and gaining the Earth King's trust. The eclipse begins as Sokka, Aang, and Toph search for the Fire Lord. They find Azula in an underground bunker, and she provokes them into chasing her to stall them until the eclipse is over. Meanwhile, Zuko at this point has learned many things about himself since returning home, including the fact that he is the great-grandson of Avatar Roku on his mother's side. In light of this information, as well as growing disdain towards Ozai's plans, Zuko confronts his father and tells him that not only does the Avatar still live, but he's decided to join forces with him. Before Zuko can leave, though, Ozai offers to tell him what happened to his mother. Fire Lord Azulon, Zuko's grandfather, had ordered Ozai to kill Zuko as a punishment for Ozai mocking the death of his brother Iroh's son, Lu Ten. In order to save her son's life, Zuko's mother created a treasonous plan to poison Azulon so that Ozai could take the throne. The plan worked, and Zuko's mother was banished for her efforts. You know, I'm starting to think that this uh, Fire Lord Ozai is uh, not such a great guy. Suddenly, the eclipse ends and Ozai attacks Zuko with his firebending finally back. Using Iroh's technique, Zuko redirects Ozai's lightning back at him and retreats to free his uncle. However, upon arriving at his cell, he discovers that Iroh has already broken out. At this point, the invasion force is exhausted and has no choice but to surrender. Aang then flees with his friends to the Western Air Temple, with Zuko trailing them on a stolen war balloon. There, Zuko desperately tries to prove himself to Team Avatar and wishes to atone for all of his past mistakes. It's only after he helps save them from Sparky Sparky Boom Man, or Combustion Man, or whatever you want to call him, the very assassin that he had previously hired to kill them, that the crew accepts him as Aang's firebending teacher and the newest member of Team Avatar. Except Katara. Katara's still a little salty about the whole following them and constantly betraying their trust and helping Azula kill Aang thing. But a quick field trip with him and a confrontation with her mother's killer eventually convinces Katara that Zuko's really changed. Unfortunately, once Zuko tries to teach Aang how to firebend, he discovers that he's lost his ability to bend now that he no longer fuels his bend with his own rage. Toph suggests that they learn from the original teachers of firebending, the mighty dragons, but supposedly Iroh killed the last dragon long ago during his metaphorical past life as a general. Recalling that the dragons imparted their knowledge to the Sun Warriors, Zuko and Aang travel to the ruins of the Sun Warrior civilization where they discover a tribe of Sun Warriors still exists. In order to learn the true meaning of firebending, they must first carry a sacred flame up a mountain and be judged by the masters, who turn out to be a pair of surviving dragons. After being deemed worthy, the two dragons teach that firebending is a source of life, not destruction. The Sun Warriors reveal that Iroh lied about the extinction of the dragons after his own training. They then ask Zuko and the rest to do the same to protect the remaining members of the species. Team Avatar leaves with both Aang and Zuko firebending better than ever. With Sozin's Comet on the horizon, Aang decides that it's probably best to fight the Fire Lord after it passes, since, you know, that would be when the Fire Nation is most powerful, but Zuko derails the plan when he reveals that Ozai intends to use his Comet Enhanced Firebending to destroy the entire Earth Kingdom continent during that time. The gang begins frantically training Aang to make up for lost time, with the end goal of stopping the Fire Nation's assault on the Earth Kingdom. Needless to say, the kid starts to get a wee bit stressed out, not to mention conflicted at the idea that in order to stop the Fire Lord, Aang has to kill him, which goes against many of his teachings and philosophies. That night, Aang dreams of a mysterious island that appears in the middle of the sea. The next day, Aang awakens on the island he'd seen in his dreams. Uh, much to the worry of Team Avatar, because Aang has vanished at a pretty important moment. Meanwhile, Ozai names Azula the successor to the Fire Nation throne, effectively making her the leader of the Fire Nation now, while Ozai declares himself Phoenix King, ruler of the world. A bit presumptuous, but... Uh, that's just how he is, I guess. On the island, Aang discovers that he's on top of a giant lion turtle, who gives him the insight and guidance he's been seeking. Meanwhile, Team Avatar enlists the help of a bounty hunter named June to find Aang, but when June is unable to locate their friend, Zuko asks her to find his uncle Iroh instead. Her tracking skills take them to the outer wall of Ba Sing Se, where they're reunited with Iroh, along with King Bumi, Zhang Zhang, Master Paku, and Master Piandao? What is, what is this? What's going on? Turns out that all of these old guys are members of the Order of the White Lotus, a secret society led by Iroh dedicated to sharing wisdom regardless of nationality or politics. The team decides to split up to help stall the Fire Nation's plans. Zuko and Katara set out to handle Azula. Sokka, Toph, and Suki, one of the aforementioned Kyoshi warriors, but, you know, it's actually her this time, will attempt to deflect the Fire Nation airships headed towards the Earth Kingdom, and Iroh is to lead the White Lotus Society in the liberation of Ba Sing Se. Sozin's comet arrives, and Ozai prepares for 
for battle. Zuko and Katara confront Azula, but as Azula had been steadily unraveling ever since her return to the Fire Nation, she stubbornly challenges her brother to Agni Kai. Zuko initially prevails, but is struck down when Azula fights dirty and fires a lightning bolt at Katara, which he dives in front of. During this time, Aang begins to duel Ozai, but narrowly avoids his powerful attacks, which are augmented by the comments. After a long battle, the Order of the White Lotus successfully liberates Ba Sing Se, while Sokka, Suki, and Toph stop the attack on the Earth Kingdom. Katara fights Azula, freezing her in ice and chaining her to the ground. She then revives Zuko with her now exceptionally strong healing abilities. Katara got, like, super OP throughout the series? Remember the scene in the Southern Raiders where she just literally suspended the rain around her and turned it into icicles? I'm not complaining, that was an amazing scene. I love that episode, it's, it's just an observation. During their duel, Ozai overpowers Aang with his enhanced firebending, pushing him back first into a jut of rock. But the rock hits Aang in exactly the same place that Azula's lightning did, miraculously unblocking his chakras and restoring his connection to the Avatar spirit. Nice. Aang enters the Avatar state and easily overwhelms Ozai, yet refuses to kill him. Instead, he employs a much more honorable technique that he learned from the Lion Turtle back when he went missing. Energy bending. By using an ancient form of bending, Aang is able to alter Ozai's energy and permanently strip him of all firebending abilities, thus defeating the Phoenix King and saving the world without bloodshed. Days later, Ozai and Azula are imprisoned, the newly appointed Fire Lord Zuko declares the war over, and Team Avatar have a little celebration at Iroh's tea shop in Ba Sing Se. Aang and Katara slip out to share a quiet moment together, where they finally embrace each other and share a kiss under the sunset. And as we learn in The Legend of Korra, the Avatar's friendships go on to transcend lifetimes. Let's follow up that awesome timeline with a more in-depth look at the world of Avatar. We love our 107 facts videos around here and I'm sure you do too. This one comes from September 2015 and garnered over 8 million views. That's more views than the Cabbage Man has cabbages. With that in mind, here's 107 Avatar The Last Airbender facts you should know. Water. Earth. Fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when M. Night Shyamalan attacked. My name is Tim, and here today on Channel Frederator, we're going to forget that the live action movie ever happened and instead count down 107 facts about the cartoon Avatar The Last Airbender. Let's get started. Number one co creator Michael DiMartino left Family Guy to work on Avatar The Last Airbender. If you ask me, he traded up. Who the hell? Cash. Number two, the four Chinese characters shown on the title screen translate to the divine medium who had descended upon the mortal world. In other words, it's a rough translation of what an avatar is. Number three, Zutara shippers may want to check out American Dragon Jake Long. Katara's voice actress Mae Whitman played Rose, the love interest of the titular character Jake, played by none other than Zuko's voice actor Dante Bosco. Even in that show, the two are on opposing sides. Number four, in some Avatar The Last Airbender comics, Katara's name is misspelled as Takara. Whoops. Although to be fair, it's not as egregious as M. Night Shyamalan's pronouncing of Ang in the movie The Last Airbender. Number five, the episode The Southern Air Temple was originally going to be titled Ang Goes Home. Number six, The Southern Air Temple is the only episode without a white background for its title screen. Instead, it has a sunrise. Number seven, Sokka's name comes from the Japanese phrase Soka, which means something along the lines of I see or is that so? It ties to Sokka's intellectual capabilities and his use of logic and understanding, which is odd because I've always felt like he has a limited use of logic and understanding. He's creative though, that's the whole point of the Swordmaster episode. Number eight, Sokka is seen using both of his hands to write, attack, and draw, even switching them mid-activity at times. Number nine, there were no plans for the Cabbage Man to be a recurring character, but the writers found him to be hilarious and he was a hit with the fans, so it became a running gag. The Cabbage Man eventually went on to found Cabbage Corp, which may or may not have been responsible for the Cabbage Patch doll fad of the 1980s. <laughs> Number 10, it's hard to imagine Team Avatar without Zuko, but it was a real possibility. Our favorite Firebender was one of the last characters to be added to the show. The Fire Lord himself was going to be the focal antagonist, but writers soon realized that they couldn't do much with him from his throne, so they added Zuko. Not to be confused with Danny Zuko. Although he would make a good villain as well. <laughs> Maybe there's two of us, right? Number 11. A melody plays during the opening shot of each episode when the episode's number and title are displayed. This tune is unique for each episode and is usually pulled from something significant to the episode. In The Painted Lady, a 
portion of the Painted Lady's theme is played. In The Firebending Masters, a slower version of the Sun Warrior's chant is being played. And for the first and final episodes of the series, versions of the Avatar theme are played. Number 12. Airbending is based on the Chinese martial art Ba Gao Zhang. Number 13. Waterbending is based on the Chinese martial art Tai Chi. Number 14. Earthbending is based on the Hungar style of Kung Fu. Number 15. Firebending is based on the Northern Shaolin Kung Fu. Number 16. Though earthbending is based on Hungar, Toph, who is taught by badger moles, has her own style based on the Southern Praying Mantis style of Kung Fu. This is appropriate because Toph often looks like she'd be willing to bite your head off. Also, why do badger moles know Praying Mantis Kung Fu? Number 17. Iroh isn't just Zuko's uncle, he's also his mentor. Well, he wasn't always going to be both. Originally, Iroh was just going to be Zuko's firebending mentor. Number 18. In the early stages of development, the show was going to take place thousands of years in the future. Number 19. Almost all of the show's animals are hybrid creatures. Appa the flying bison is half bison, half manatee. Momo the winged lemur is half bat, half lemur. I wonder if there's any like really delicious commos like half pig and half beef. Number 20. Mako, Uncle Iroh's original voice actor, sadly passed away before completing his recordings for the last seven episodes of Season 2. Staff had to rush and recast the part, which temporarily halted production of Season 3. Number 21. For the first half of Season 3, Iroh only made two appearances, both silent. Greg Baldwin, Mako's understudy and longtime student, took over the role from there. Number 22. In the show's opening, five silhouetted figures demonstrate bending. The waterbender is Master Paku, the earthbender is Sud, the Firebender is Azula, and the Avatar is Roku. The Airbender is the only one of the five who never corresponded with a character appearing in the series or in supplementary materials. Number 23. Aang's good friend Bumi, the Earth King's name, is most fitting. In Malay, Indonesian, as well as several Indian languages, Bumi means Earth. Number 24. In the show's unaired pilot, Katara's name was Kia. This was changed before the series start when Nickelodeon's legal department discovered that there was an existing video game character named Kia. The name Kana was then considered, but later became the name of Katara and Sokka's grandmother. Kia became the name of Katara and Sokka's mother. The legal departments are really cautious. I mean, what, if one person has a name you can't use it? Tim is useless forever because it is my name. Number 25. Admiral Zhao was inspired by William Tavington, a character from the 2000 film The Patriot. Number 26. The show's casting director, Marianne Dacey, was asked to find someone similar to Tavington and managed to get Jason Isaacs, the actor who portrayed him. Number 27. Each episode from the start of the script writing to being ready to air took around nine months. In other words, a human child could be conceived and born in the time it takes to make an episode. Number 28. Darth Vader may be Luke's father, but Luke is Zuko's. Fire Lord Ozai is played by Mark Hamill, best known for his roles as Star Wars Luke Skywalker and Batman's Joker. And Fire Lord Ozai bends lightning, so in the end, Luke did get his dark side lightning powers. Number 29. Only five characters in the series have had their exact ages revealed. Aang is 112, but really just 12 if you subtract his ice block years. Zuko and Yue are both 16, Toph is 12, and Tom Tom is 2. For those of you who forgot, Tom Tom is Mai's younger brother. Number 30, it's mentioned that Mai is 15 years older than her sibling, so if we do the math, she's 17. Number 31, the calligraphy on the top and bottom of the map shown during Avatar's intro sequence form a rhyming couplet in Chinese. Translated, it means powers are divided into four, the world is guided by one. Number 32, depending on how you pronounce it, Yue's name can be the Chinese word for moon. Number 33, Suki's name also means moon, but in Japanese. Sounds like Sokka's got a thing for girls who are out of this world. Uh. Number 34, Aang, Katara, and Sokka appear in every episode of the show except for Zuko alone. Which makes sense because Zuko can't be alone if the whole gang is there. Zuko just needs a me day. Treat yourself. Number 35, Momo comes in second for most appearances at 56 episodes, then Appa with 54, Zuko with 48, Iroh with 39, and Toph with 36. Number 36, a traditional firebending duel is called an Agni Kai. Agni is a Sanskrit word for fire, as well as the name of a Hindu fire deity. Kai translates from Japanese to meeting or together. Number 37, we all know that Toph is a standout gal, but did you notice that she and her family are the only characters with last names? Presumably you only give your best characters last names. Number 38, okay, okay, okay. So there are two other last names that appear in the series, but they don't really count because they're fake. 
When they snuck into the Fire Nation, Saki used the last name Fire, and Aang used Pippin Paddle Obsicopsilus. You'd think that he'd pick something easier to remember or pronounce, because that word is hard to pronounce. Let's take a break from those facts so I can tell you about a giveaway we have coming up. Be sure to download the Channel Frederator app now on iOS and Android to be entered into our first giveaway. The giveaway runs until October 3rd, so don't wait. We'll be giving away this Appa plush, and we'll be revealing more items in the coming weeks. In the app, we'll be showing exclusive content that won't be on YouTube, and we'll be releasing episodes of your favorite shows early. Click here to learn more about it. And now, back to the facts. Number 39. Remember the Dai Li from Ba Sing Se? In Chinese, Dai Li means to act on behalf of someone in a responsible position or to act as an agent or proxy. Number 40. Lake Laogai is the headquarters of the Dai Li. In Chinese, Laogai is short for Laodong Gai Zhao, which means reform through labor. It references Chinese political prison camps, which were frequently used in the 1960s to incarcerate counter-revolutionaries and other political criminals, where prisoners were forced to take part in labor and are often brainwashed. Number 41. Toph Fei Fong was originally going to be a male. Number 42. It was confirmed by creators Brian Konietzko and Michael DiMartino that Sood's design was a prototype for Toph. Number 43. The show used the same music for its credits throughout all its episodes except for one. The series finale, Sozin's Comet Part 4, Avatar Aang, used a more heroic tune. Number 44. The word Avatar is derived from a Sanskrit word that literally means those who descend. Number 45. Zuko's great-grandfather on his mother's side is Avatar Roku, who, via reincarnation, is Aang. By the transitive property, does that make Aang Zuko's great-grandfather? Number 46. Earthbenders learn from badger moles, airbenders learn from sky bison, firebenders learn from dragons, and waterbenders learn from the moon? One of these things is not like the other. Although if you want to expand it out to the Legend of Korra, perhaps they all learned it from turtles, because that's what Avatar 1 did. Number 47. The calligraphy on the four corners of the Avatar world's map each represent one of the nations. Each corner's box has a circle with two characters. The one on the left is just the element of that particular nation, but combined with the character on the right, they take on new meanings. Water becomes virtue, earth becomes strong, fire becomes fierce, and air becomes peaceful. Also, earth, wind, and fire come together to form one of the best bands of the 20th century. Number 48. There has been a great deal of debate on whether or not Avatar The Last Airbender is an anime. Many fans in the United States say that because it doesn't originate in Japan, it can't be anime. On the other hand, many fans in Japan say that whether or not something is an anime is based in style, not nationality. What do you guys think? Be sure to leave a flame war below in the comments. Number 49. Despite its ties with anime, Avatar The Last Airbender was never released in Japan. The first season was dubbed and advertised in the country, but never officially released due to network failure. Sadly, airbending does not translate to airwave bending. Number 50. In the episode Zuko Alone, Zuko almost attacks a man cooking by a fire to steal his food, but refrains when he sees the man is taking the food to his pregnant wife. The man and his wife are both seen again when Aang and the gang come across them in the episode The Serpent's Pass. Number 51. Aang's mentor and guardian, Monk Gyatso, is named after the current Dalai Lama, whose full name is Tenzin Gyatso. You may recognize the first portion of his name from The Legend of Korra, where Aang's son is named Tenzin. Number 52. Ran and Shaw are the two ancient dragons who help Zuko regain his firebending. Ran means burn or ignite in Chinese, and Sha means burn or blaze. When the Chinese characters for their names are combined, they spell out combustion, flaming, or kindle. Number 53. When written out in Chinese characters, Ang's name means peaceful soaring. Number 54. Michael DiMartino and Brian Konietzko have said that they feel that Katara is the deuteragonist of the series. His dudeness or uh, deuter or... Uh... Number 55. In a scrapped storyline, Azula was going to have an arranged marriage in Book 3. Number 56. You do not want to have Appa sit on you. The flying bison weighs 10 tons. That's 20,000 pounds. Number 57. In early designs, Appa had spiral horns. They were removed because they were too difficult to animate by hand. Number 58. In Avatar Extras, it's revealed that Momo was originally going to be the reincarnation of Monk Gyatso. Number 59. Avatar Extras also stated that Appa has a double chin. That's not nice. They were way nicer to Momo. Number 60. Early on, Appa was going to be a polar bear dog. The concept was scrapped, but was later used in The Legend of Korra for Korra's companion, Naga. 
Number 61, co-creator Brian Konietzko has said that Momo is his favorite character to draw and that many of the creature poses, mannerisms, and body language stem from memories of his childhood cat, Buddy. Number 62, during the series' early development, Momo was going to be a Cyclops robot monkey who had survived the destruction of a lost civilization more than a thousand years before. He had arrows and a staff to match Aang's and was going to be named Momo 3. Number 63, Grey Delisle, Azula's voice actress, also played Ta Min, Avatar Roku's wife. Number 64, the writing on the top left of Liu Ten's portrait roughly translates to to General Iroh, see you after we win the war, your loyal son, Liu Ten. Number 65, Uncle Iroh is one of the most kind and soft-hearted characters in the series, but he was originally going to be strict, similar to how he was portrayed in Zuko alone. Number 66, the show's creators initially planned on having an episode dealing with Iroh's past, but it was scrapped. Number 67, the actors from the Ember Island players didn't quite match up with who they were portraying, but maybe Zuko's theater counterpart was closer to him than you'd think. Actor Zuko was actually voiced by Zuko's voice actor Dante Bosco's older brother. Number 68, in the show's on-air pilot, Aang was voiced by Mitchell Musso, best known for playing Oliver on Hannah Montana. And as we discussed a couple weeks ago, he also played Jeremy in Phineas and Ferb. Number 69, everyone's familiar with the infamous foaming mouth guy, but can you imagine him sans foam? He was initially just going to faint in this scene, but a creative contribution by animator Ki Hyun Ryu made the moment and the foam. Number 70, Brian Konietzko and Michael DiMartino joked that Suki had once dated Foaming Mouth Guy, a feat she wasn't proud of. Number 71, Suki wasn't going to appear again after The Warriors of Kyoshi, but she was so popular among fans and staff that she showed up in books two and three, becoming an official member of Team Avatar. Number 72, Momo means peach in Japanese, fitting because Momo stole a peach from Sokka shortly after joining the group. Number 73, Sokka and Katara were created at the same time. Brian Konietzko and Michael DiMartino liked the idea of a sibling rivalry having sisters of their own. I have a sister too and I love her very much, but the things I don't cherish fondly are sibling rivalry. Number 74, Sokka was going to be 13, but was aged up at the suggestion of Eric Coleman. Number 75, similarly, Katara was going to be 12 before she was aged up. Number 76, Lego released a Sokka minifigure in one of their sets. The description of the product on the company's official site stated that Sokka had received his boomerang from his father, Hakoda. Number 77, speaking of Hakoda, if Sokka's outfit in the graphic novel trilogy, The Promise, which takes place one year after Ozai's defeat, reminds you of his father, Father, good. It was meant to in order to symbolize their bond. That's a very sweet gesture, as long as you have a father who dresses really cool. Number 78. In Zulu, Sokka's name means lover boy. Fitting when you consider the fact that Sokka was kissed more than any other character in the franchise. He's basically Brock, but the pitch works for him. Number 79. The pilot episode shows that Zuko was originally going to have a pet hawk. What sinister thing could you combine a hawk with? Probably something really cool, like a hawk giraffe. Number 80, Avatar Extras revealed that Zuko has an above average hearing and can hold his breath for an unusually long amount of time. Number 81, The Great Divide is one of the least popular episodes in the series. It turns out it was divisive amongst fans. Number 82, Appa's design was based on the cat bus from My Neighbor Totoro. Number 83, according to Avatar Extras, Sokka's special brand of sarcasm is called Sockchasm. The actual show is beating me in bad puns. Number 84, stylistic influences on Avatar The Last Airbender include the work of Studio Ghibli, Studio 4C, and Production IG, as well as Shinichiro Watanabe's Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo and Gainax's Fooly Cooly. Number 85, Avatar director Giancarlo Volpe has claimed that the show's staff were all ordered to buy Fooly Cooly and watch every single episode of it. Number 86, the story of Avatar The Last Airbender was heavily influenced by book series and novels like Harry Potter and The Lord of the Rings. Aang and Sokka would be Gryffindor. Katara would be a Ravenclaw. No, Sokka's a Hufflepuff. I changed my mind. Number 87, though the pair were never seen smooching on screen, according to Avatar Extras, Jet was Katara's first kiss. Number 88, Jet's final moments on the show may have seemed ambiguous, but it's been confirmed multiple times that he did indeed die. Nickelodeon was against showing a kid being killed or fatally wounded, especially in a violent manner, so it was never outrightly revealed in the series. Toph's declaration that Jet was lying when he said he'd be okay was meant to be confirmation for the viewers. The show poked fun at Jack's questionable fate during the Ember Island players. Number 89, airbenders shave their heads to get a better feel for the air. In fact, Aang normally shaves his head every morning. 
Number 90, Avatar was written and produced at Nickelodeon Animation Studio in Burbank, California. The team actually shared a floor with the SpongeBob SquarePants crew. There was only one bathroom between them. Number 91, many settings in the Fire Nation were inspired by actual locations in Iceland. Co-creator Brian Konietzko actually traveled to the country to get inspiration for environments. Number 92, Lo and Lee are Azula's firebending mentors, but neither one of them is a firebender. Yes, you don't have to know it to teach. Number 93, an Avatar Extras rumor alert stated that some say Combustion Man was a Fire Nation soldier who was injured in battle and then healed using experimental techniques that enabled him to firebend with his mind. Speaking of minds, mine is blown. Number 94, Avatar Roku took 12 years to master all four elements. Aang had less than 12 months. Talk about a time crunch. Number 95, in the writer's room for Avatar, bloodbending was jokingly called the stop hitting yourself technique. They didn't call it this in the show because bloodbending is actually terrifying. Number 96, Appa is capable of carrying 10 to 15 people at a time, depending on their sizes. Number 97, creators knew that Zuko would be Aang's firebending teacher from the very beginning. In the original series Bible for the show, he was actually going to join the Avatar gang at the end of book two. What's the holdup, Zuko? Number 98, flying bison love honey. Though realistically, who doesn't? Honey's amazing. Number 99, Aang was identified as the Avatar after he chose four specific toys out of thousands. These four toys were the same chosen by his predecessors in the same process. This procedure is based on a near identical one the Tibetan Buddhist monks used to identify the Tolku Lama. Number 100. Avatar extras suggest that Iroh learned how to breathe fire from Ren and Shaw, the two dragons that he saved. That's a fair trade. I saved your life. You teach me to breathe fire. Number 101. Suki is the oldest of the Kyoshi warriors and began training when she was only eight years old. Number 102. Speaking of eight-year-olds, Katara was eight when her mother died. The episode that revealed her fate, the Southern Raiders, is a fan favorite. Number 103. The design on the poster, The Ember Island Players Performance, is an exaggerated version of the cover of Avatar's Season 1 DVD box set. Number 104, Huan Tim, the playwright who wrote The Boy in the Iceberg, was named after actual Avatar writer Tim Hedrick. Number 105, the Katang ship was Endgame, but that doesn't mean Zutara didn't go down without a fight. The show's creators and writers themselves actually toyed with the idea of having Zuko and Katara fall in love. Number 106, Master Piandao's appearance was based on Sifu Kisu, the martial artist consultant behind Avatar The Last Airbender. Since he is the martial artist consultant, I know he can beat me up, so I am super, super sorry if I mispronounce your name. Please do not beat me up. Number 107, the final line in the series is spoken by Toph, who declared to her friends, well, I think you all look perfect. One good 107 facts video deserves another. So here's 107 Avatar The Last Airbender Facts You Should Know Part 2. Don't spend them all in one place. So, we're doing it twice? That's right, we're back, and bending harder than ever. Hi, I'm Melissa with Channel Frederator, and we're here to throw down the Earth Gauntlet one more time. So hop on an otter penguin and slide on down, because we've got 107 more facts about Avatar The Last Airbender. Let's get started. <laughs> Series creators Brian Konitzko and Mike DiMartino met in college at the prestigious Rhode Island School of Design. Other famous RISD alums include Seth MacFarlane, James Franco, and Shepard Ferry, the Obey Giant dude. They met at a Halloween party where Konitzko was in a homemade iguana costume wielding a Nerf gun and calling himself Iguana Man. Now I kind of wish Iroh called himself the Iguana of the West instead. Konitzko was initially inspired to pitch something to Nickelodeon after the network canceled the Mater Zim and he lost his job there. One door closes, another door opens. Originally Konitzko and DiMartino know we're going to pitch a show inspired by their childhoods in which they spent playing in the woods. They worked on the idea for months, until Nickelodeon head developer Eric Coleman told them that the channel was looking for something but human coming-of-age stories. Whoops. Starting from scratch, Konitsko and DiMartino went through every drawing and idea they had. Konitsko found a sketch of a robot cyclops monkey holding a staff, a bald sad man in a futuristic outfit, and a polar bear dog hybrid standing on two legs. And so Avatar was born. Sort of. Coleman suggested a kid character as a starting point to make the show relatable to a Nickelodeon age audience. For some reason, Konitsko really liked the sad bald man, so he just redrew him as a kid, baldness and all. That was the first drawing of Aang. Avatar's original story idea came from the terrifying survival tale of Ernest Shackleton's 1915 Antarctic expedition. Shackleton's ship became trapped and slowly crushed in breaking ice, forcing the crew to abandon ship and trek across the barren wasteland to get help. Originally, The Last Airbender was going to focus entirely on a tribe trapped in Shackleton-style hostile ice environment. While that didn't happen, an idea of an ice-bound tribe stuck, as did the idea of starting the story with something happening to 
them. The Southern Water Tribe village and life was also inspired by Atana Jawat, the fast runner, the first film to be written, directed, and acted entirely in the Inuktuk language. It depicts life and myths interacting in the Inuit village. Aang was always going to be unfrozen from a more peaceful time, but originally he came from a technologically advanced society. Momo was his sidekick, but originally in the form of the former sketches Robot Monkey and named Momo 3. If you squint, it sort of looks like Momo. Aang fell into place when Konitsuko and DiMartino watched the Shaolin Wheel of Life performance featuring a kid doing insane acrobatics. That was their guy. Fun, sweet, and a master of martial arts. You can thank Bikram Yoga for Avatar as you know it. While doing the first pose in class, Konitsuko suddenly thought, what if there were fire people causing trouble for the ice people? And what if that bald kid was involved somehow? Bam! From there, most of the story arc and world of Avatar fell into place, and two weeks later, they pitched the show. Right before they officially pitched, they realized they'd been so focused on creating Aang, they'd completely forgotten to sketch Katara. They had no art for Katara to ready to go. So what did they do? Mere hours before the meeting, Konitsuko came up with a couple drawings. The front locks are a little chunkier, and she's not wearing her choker, but otherwise, pretty much the same. Hey, some people work best under pressure. The Four Nations are a nod to the traditional belief that all matter is composed of earth, air, water, or fire. These classical elements were the staples of science and philosophy for ancient cultures all over the globe, from Greece to Tibet and everywhere in between. Weirdly, out of the Four Nations, only the Fire Nation uses the term. Otherwise, it's Earth Kingdom, Water Tribe, and Air Nomads. It may sound backwards, but to get the inspiration for Fire Nation locations, Konitsuko took a trip to Iceland, a highly volcanic and thermal country. Then when he got back, he showed the crew a vacation slideshow of the thousands of photos he took. A lot of the Earth Nation's design was supposed to be based on the Forbidden City and Great Wall, but when Konitsuko and DiMartino took a trip out there, they stumbled upon an architecture park filled with Chinese buildings from different areas and ethnicities, an architecture goldmine. Unlike many other shows, the Airbender team doesn't ship off material to a Korean studio. Konitsuko and DiMartino wanted the actual animator's creative input. Konitsuko lived in Korea for months working with the animators to create the pilot. Before the animation was intense and the companies were small, they ended up working with three companies, JM Animation, DR Movie, and Moi Animation. Jeremy Zuckerman and Benjamin Wynn composed the music for Avatar. To get a unique sound, they used a lot of unique instruments that are not usually heard in cartoons, including a kalimbo, a pipa, and a duduk, an Armenian wind instrument. Zuckerman actually studied the guchen and pipa with a master Chinese musician to honor the instrument's history when using them on the show. Honoring East Asian art, the show takes its calligraphy seriously. Dr. Su Lung Li is an expert in archaic Chinese and provided all translation and calligraphy for The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. Different styles are used to reflect the characters in place. For example, fortune teller Aunt Wu's sign is written in the difficult to read rough script style of So Shu, and it's all real readable language on the show. Dr. Lee was extremely disappointed when the movie chose to go with vaguely Chinese looking squiggles instead of the aerograms. At some point in development, there was going to be an elite team of female firebenders hunting Aang down. Forget Hunger Games, that would have been the real catch and fire. Each type of bending is based on a specific martial art, but the team also cites Shaolin Soccer, one of their favorite movies, as an inspiration for the concept of bending overall. The series hired a martial arts grandmaster, Manuel Rodriguez, to be a consultant and choreographer specifically for Toph's bending and fighting technique. Rodriguez holds black belts in Kung Fu, Tai Chi Chuan, Taekwondo, Judo, Shitoru Karate, Hakoru Jiu Jitsu, and Shuai Jiao, or Chinese wrestling. No wonder Toph's the greatest earthbender in the world. Speaking of, the first human earthbenders were Oma and Shu, two star-crossed lovers. Who knew the badger moles who taught them were such suckers for romance? Fans disagree about what time period in our world the setting of Avatar corresponds to, but the general consensus is the late 1800s. However, characters and technology draw influence from centuries way before and after. The Fire Nation soldiers in the opening sequence of the show wear their contemporary uniforms, even though a hundred years ago they would have had a different design. Everything changed when the Fabric Nation attacked. Putting stuff in the fridge helps it keep longer, but turns out what kept Aang minty fresh in that iceberg for a hundred years was the Avatar State. Aang's glowing Avatar State eyes were inspired by the last episode of the TV show FLCL, or Fooly Cooly, when main character Nauta experiences the full power of space pirate Atomsk. Originally, Appa and Aang were found floating in a rotating ball of energy, but that was too difficult to animate on a limited budget. Turns out, Frozen Solid is the easiest animation there is. It could have been a little more crowded in that iceberg. Originally, Aang was going to have an entire pack of flying bison. The writers cut it out from a dozen to three to just Appa. The blue arrow tattoo on Aang's head is the mark of an airbending master, which he received after inventing the air scooter at age 12. At that age, I was still waiting for the ice cream man. You don't see all of them that often, but Aang has five arrow tattoos, imitating the flying bison's natural markings and running along his chi paths. One goes from the base of his spine to his forehead, and four go from his torso down to each of his limbs. Unlike other nations, all air nomads were born with bending abilities. Cool, I was born with not really any abilities. <laughs> Firebenders are the only group who create their own 
own element. But at least Earth and Airbender don't have to worry too much about their element not being nearby. Waterbenders, on the other hand, are told to carry skins filled with water just in case someone drops them in the middle of the desert. A dragon mask is visible on the wall of Zuko's cabin on his ship in the series' second episode. That's kind of amazing when you consider that the relationship between dragons and firebenders isn't mentioned again until way later. Zuko's ship is a smaller version of the Fire Nation cruisers, which resemble sleeker versions of warships that represented a number of nations at sea during World War One. Meanwhile, Water Tribe boats strongly resemble Polynesian catamarans sailing as early as 600 years ago. When Aang disguises himself with Appa's fur to enter the Omashu, the wig he makes looks just like his friend Boomy's hair does in Aang's memories from 100 years back. Boomy's hairstyle was a hot mess, so we know Aang really loves him. We don't officially meet Azula until the last scene of Book 1, but keen observers can spot her all the way back in Episode 12 of the show, during Zuko's flashback about how his father gave him the scar. Of course, Azula smiles as she watches it happen. The blue spirit was originally supposed to be the red spirit, but with the color scheme and the original design, it made the vigilante look too much like an ancient Korean version of Spider-Man. Fair enough, although an ancient Korean version of Spider-Man does sound kind of amazing. Brian Konitsko designed Zuko's blue spirit mask after a wooden opera mask he bought in Insadong, a craft and handmade art neighborhood in Seoul, Korea. Turns out, Zuko's distinctive scar is not all that distinct. According to a recent study done by Dr. Julia A. Crowley at the University of Texas, 60% of the most famous villains in film history have some kind of scar or facial abnormality. Sure, but how many of them are also the blue spirit in their spare time? In Bato of the Water Tribe, June arm wrestles a guy in a bar who looks suspiciously like Ryu from Street Fighter. Everything changed when the Fire Nation had Dukened? Sokka plans to make the Northern Air Temple safer by adding a rotten egg smell to the natural gas that powers it. This plan is derived from the way modern gas companies do the exact same thing. The chemical is called Mythyl Mercaptan, but we prefer the power of stink. During just the first season of the show, Sokka ends up drenched in snow, fishy water, Appa snot, Appa saliva, raw platypus bear egg, and mud. We hope for his sake that Katara's waterbending extended to laundry. Sokka started off as a more low-key character, but voice actor Jack DeSena brought so much energy to the role, the writing team wrote Sokka to match his liveliness. The playwright Anton Javak believed that if a loaded gun appears in the story, it had better shoot something before the story ends. It seems as though Kanisko and DiMartino believe a similar thing, that if a cabbage stand is going to appear in a story, it had better get smashed before the episode ends. The Cabbage Man was originally meant to be a one-off character, but the writers liked him so much, they kept bringing him back and destroying what he loves so much. So cruel. The fans love him too. Cabbage Man regularly appears in the top 10 list of favorite characters from the show. Go Cabbage! Zuko and Iroh cut off their top knots when they break ties with the Fire Nation at the beginning of the second season. In addition to serving as a disguise, this gesture references the decline in social status the Japanese samurai face if they stop being warriors and cut their own hair. Sokka's hairdo has a name. It's a warrior's wolf tail, and it was inspired by a Japanese Edo period do called the Chamage, none of which stops the rest of the gang from making fun of it. Speaking of hair, or rather, rather lack of it, viewers watched for over a season and a half before learning why our hero, a 12-year-old boy, is bald. Did the sentry in ice freeze his follicles? Nah. Turns out he shaves his head nearly every day, but we don't see it happen until one of the vignettes in Tales of Ba Sing Se. Duck and Tho of the Swamp Benders are caricatures of two other Nickelodeon show creators, Doug Tenaple of Cat Scratch and Carlos Ramos of The X's. Apparently, this started a caricature war between the three teams. As Konitsko said, if the design of Carlos seems unflattering, you should have seen the drawings he did of us. Sokka sets about solving the mystery of Avatar Day by puffing bubbles from a fake pipe and wearing a hat and a monocle. In homage to the most legendary detective of all time, Sherlock Holmes. The Earth Kingdom Village celebrates Avatar Day by giving out pieces of uncooked dough to commemorate Aang not being boiled into oil. This is a play on the Jewish tradition of eating unleavened matzah during Passover. In Season 2, Episode 6, The Blind Bandit, the show tried to get actual wrestler Dwayne The Rock Johnson to play the character based on him, The Boulder, but it didn't happen. Instead, he's voiced by The Rock's frenemy, Mick Mankind Folly. The first time we see all four elements bent outside of the credits is Episode 6, Book 1, Imprisoned. But it's not until Episode 8, Book 2 that all four elements are bent to attack the same target. The only other time this happens is when Aang goes into Avatar mode to attack Fire Lord Ozai in the show's final episode. You can spot Jin, Zuko's never-mentioned-again date from Tales of Ba Sing Se, in the back of her father's shop during a montage of the Fire Nation invading the city. The Kyoshi Warrior's fighting style resembles Taisen Jutsu, a Japanese martial art involving metal fans. You may also remember the cameo that the fan-based combat makes in Mulan. The Kyoshi 
warrior makeup obviously derives from how Avatar Kyoshi painted her face. But what was the original inspiration for her look? Kyoshi's style combines the color palette of traditional geisha makeup with the angular design of kabuki theater face paint. Guess the former Avatar was a master of bending and blending. Firebenders, earthbenders, and airbenders all learned their techniques from animals, but airbenders were unique in forming one-on-one -on -one relationships with flying bison as children. It's no coincidence that Appa ended up in the ice with Aang. Those two were bonded for life. In 2007, animal rights activists at the Humane Society honored Appa's lost days with their Genesis Award of Outstanding Children's Programming. It was awarded for demonstrating the cruelty of keeping animals captive in circuses for entertainment. Fifteen episodes pass before we see Appa do more than just zoom the group around and cover them in fur and slobber. The first time we see our favorite flying bison fight is against June's sheer shoe when it tries to attack Aang. Appa sheds his fur for the first time that year in the chase, but as Avatar Extras points out, that's technically the first time in a hundred years that he shed. No wonder he's so white. The world of Avatar has its own calendar. While the outer ring uses the traditional Chinese zodiac, the inner ring names 16 separate eras. The two inner circles are months, then days. Though each of the 16 eras has a different name, the first characters contain an ideogram that rotates between the four elements, just like the Avatar. It's not confirmed, but some speculate that the eras relate directly to the Avatar cycle. Dang, that's complicated. So, of course, in the show, it was created by Wan Shi Tung, Spirit World Librarian. Out loud, his name in Mandarin means, he who knows 10,000 things. But his written name means, Paul of Immeasurable, or literally 10,000, knowledge. What's with the specific number? In Taoism, 10,000 is expression for all of creation. So saying 10,000 knowledge is the same as all knowledge. Energy bending predated the other forms of bending in the world of Avatar and outside. In the world of Avatar, lion turtles knew the art of energy bending before the Avatar existed. And before the show was even pitched, the creators knew that Ozai wouldn't be killed by Aang, but rather stripped of his fire bending by a special power only avatars had. They just weren't sure what it was yet. In fact, the power is never officially named in the show, and at Comic-Con 2008, the creators called it anti-bending and unbending. Maybe they're still not sure what it is. The only type of bending that works in the spirit world is energy bending. Why? Energy bending is the only type of bending that can be done by spirits. I guess that makes sense then. Earth Kingdom currency, which are round coins with a square cut out of the middle, resemble ancient Chinese coins from around the time of the Qin Dynasty. In our previous rounds of Avatar Facts, we mentioned how much the team loved Shinichiro Watanabe, creator of Cowboy Bebop. The Earth Kingdom Orphan Gang is led by Jet, whose appearance is based on Spike Spiegel, but he's named after Jet Black, the other protagonist of Cowboy Bebop. Jet's hideout was inspired by Return of the Jedi's Ewok village, while the forest around them was a nod to the film House of Flying Daggers. And unfortunately, Jet definitely died in Season 2's Lake Laogay. It was confirmed by the staff at Comic-Con 2008. Sorry, Jet. The staff said you're in the hot guy heaven now. So, why wasn't it shown? Well, Nickelodeon didn't think it was appropriate to actually show the death, which is one of the few times they and the show team differed on appropriate content. For earthbending, Zuckerman and Wynn use a special set of sounds from library recordings of rocks being crushed and boulders falling processed to sound larger. Along with processed whooshes, they set aside just for earthbending. The earthbender-powered tank design was inspired by a Leonardo da Vinci tank illustration. That guy did everything. Earthbenders have 85 jings, or choices of how to direct their energy. The most important is the neutral jing, which is listening and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Because a waterbender's power comes from their chi, an internal life force, their powers fluctuate based on their emotions. So, you're more powerful if you rage, but you have less control. The chi nature of their power also makes them excellent healers. Blocked chakras prevent Aang from reaching the avatar state at will. We may not associate them with the four elements, but lots of people believe that blocked chakras can wreak all sorts of havoc on a person. Symptoms include nightmares, asthma, or even impotence. Aang talks coherently in the avatar state for the first time after Appa is stolen in the desert. There's a theory that everyone in the world is at most six degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon. This extends to Avatar, when Aang reenacts Bacon's iconic role in Footloose by teaching a town of repressed Fire Nation kids to dance. Avatar Extras notes that the dances that Aang teaches the kids are inspired by the badass Brazilian dance martial art, Capoeira. Episode 5, Season 3, The Beach, references 80s teen movie, The Breakfast Club. While in the animatic stage, episode director Joaquim Dos Santos put the movie's credit song, Don't You Forget About Me, at the end of the episode. I can't believe they didn't go with something by the Flamios. A total solar eclipse renders all firebenders powerless. Meanwhile, in our world, it renders us victims of dorky glasses. Darkness and full moons can also weaken a firebender, and they're less powerful when it's raining. Does having an umbrella help? 
Nightmares and Daydreams, the ninth episode of Book 3, Fire, wins the prize for the most references crammed into one episode. Trigun, Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, Nightmare on Elm Street, The Ring, The Grudge, Samurai Chaplu, Seven Samurai, FLCL, and Cowboy Bebop, just to name a few. For bloodbending, Wen used food recordings to suggest the sound of muscles stressing. He didn't specify which foods, but I'm going to say it probably wasn't pizza. If you made it all the way through the show and asked, wait, what happened to Zuko's mom? You're not the only one. While working on the finale, a scene was storyboarded in which he meets her, but it was nixed at Demartino's request. From season one of Avatar, writers kept pitching on an airbending villain. They didn't get one until the third season of The Legend of Korra, when Zaheer showed up. Better late than never. For the finale episodes, composers Zuckerman and Wynn decided that they needed to do it live. When they wrote an email saying that they had to have a live orchestra so badly that they pay for it, the president of Nickelodeon themselves said to give them the cash. The series covered so many adventures in so many places that it's easy to forget the whole show only spans about one year. So if you were feeling bad, that Aang never really gets much taller, you can relax. The most watched episode of the series was the four-part finale, which had an audience of over five and a half million viewers. Looks like they went out with a but Aang! Sorry. Avatar aired in over 105 countries. In its third season, it was the number one rated show on Nick in Germany, Indonesia, Belgium, and Colombia. I'm confused. Are those Fire Nation colonies? And in case you're wondering, sorry Zatura fans, but the creators specifically said in an interview that the relationship between Zuko and Katara was never gonna happen. When asked which nations they belonged to, Mike DiMartino chose the Airbenders, while Brian Konitsko apologized for picking Fire Nation. To keep the good word of Aang, Katara, Sokka, Toph, and Zuko alive and well, we came back a few years later to make another fact video for ya. Some folks don't know about this awesome show yet, so we figured it was a good idea to make another video singing its praises. This is 107 Avatar Facts You Should Know from November 2021. Even though we've done videos on both the Avatar shows previously, we thought it would be high time to take another look at the show, but this time with a bit of a more narrow focus, namely on the titular avatars. Who were these people, and what stories of their creations are out there? I'm Adrian, and let's find out in 107 facts about the Avatar. Number 1. With the release of the second Kyoshi novel, we now know the names of 9 Avatars. They are in chronological order, and I uh, apologize in advance if I don't know how to pronounce some of these because they are in the books. Wan, Salai, Zeto, Yang Chen, Kuruk, Kyoshi, Roku, Aang, and Korra. Number 2. Of these 9, only Yang Chen, Kuruk, and Kyoshi had the same voice actors in all of their appearances across both shows. Not unimpressive, considering both Kuruk and Kyoshi have speaking roles in The Legend of Korra, however, only briefly. Number 3. And Aang cinches the win on a technicality by having had three voice actors. He was voiced by Mitchell Musso in The Unaired Pilot, Zack Tyler Eisen in The Last Airbender, and D.B. Sweeney during his appearances in The Legend of Korra, both as old and very old Aang. Number 4. Before the episodes of Beginnings, there was a lot of speculation on the exact origins of the Avatar. The creators had a book in which they wrote down all their ideas for the show, humbly called the Series Bible, which was 65 pages long and not to be confused with the released version of the IP Bible. In their own version, they wrote that the Avatar is the incarnation of the spirit of the planet in human form, though they would later drop that idea. Number 5. That being said, there's another oblique hint coming from the title screen, with a Chinese phrase at the top and bottom of the map translating to powers are divided into four, all under heaven is guided by one, and the characters above the title itself translating to the divine being who has descended upon the world. Number 6. Katara discovers in Wan Chi Tong's library that at least one of the avatars was left-handed, which one however, we don't know, not even if it's one of the named ones or one preceding those. Number 7. Back to the avatars themselves. Of them all, Salai is the one we know the least about, given that they're only briefly mentioned in a conversation between Kyoshi and Yun. We don't know when they lived, which nation they were from, and as you might have surmised by now, if they were a man or a woman. Number 8. All we know is that they're remembered as one of the better avatars, considering Yun mentions them in one breath with Yang Chen. They're remembered, especially when Kyoshi was still young, to be a great avatar. Number 9. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. So let's go back to the beginning to when Wan first merged with Rava. The order in which Wan learned to master the elements would end up becoming the Avatar Cycle. Fire, air, water, earth. Number 10. Similarly, by the time he faced Vatu, his wardrobe had amassed the colors of the four elements. His robe was orange for the air, his sash blue for water, his armbands green for earth, and his scarf red for fire. Number 11. The time span in which Wan learned to mend the other three elements after his native one is broadly similar to the time Aang had to master his three remaining ones. About a year. Number 12. 
Observant viewers may have actually caught on that Wan's name would translate to 10,000 in Mandarin Chinese, given that Wan Chitong says the meaning of his name multiple times. However, this word is frequently used in a non-literal manner to suggest infinite or uncountable. Number 13. The armor in which Wan is last seen is an interesting design because it's clearly not made for a bender. The raised guard on his pauldron is to make sure that if you take a sword hit to the shoulder, it wouldn't deflect up into the neck, which is far less of a concern for someone who can fight at range like a bender. Number 14. Then again, him wearing armor clearly didn't help him as he's seen dying in it. Could also be a combination of his old age by that point, but still. Number 15. His death also mirrors Roku's story from the Avatar and the Fire Lord, as both times we see the death of an Avatar, it's followed by the screen fading to white and then the cry of a baby. Number 16. Moving on to the next named Avatar in the line, Salai. As mentioned, we don't know much about them, but there are clues in their name. A Salai is a needle used by Hindus to keep their turban in place, suggesting an Indian point of origin. Number 17. To use that as a clue for the nation they were born in, this is, uh, completely useless because India wasn't a primary inspiration for any of the four nations. Number 18. However, we can make an educated guess. They would have to be a relatively recent avatar, given that Yun expects the uneducated Kyoshi to know who this avatar was. So the most recent unnamed one was the avatar before Zito, who would have been from the Earth Kingdom. Plus, the Earth Kingdom is huge and enormously culturally diverse, so this seems like a logical option, even if it is conjecture. Number 19. Speaking of Zito, let's focus on him instead. He was first mentioned by name in The Shadow of Kyoshi, the second novel in the series. However, his first appearance in the show was in the episode The Avatar State. Number 20. That said, it's ironic how he's only demonstrated as bending lava, which is actually a subskill of earthbending, not firebending. Number 21. The most unusual thing about his life, though, is the way he chose to bring stability to his nation. At the time of his birth, the Fire Nation was anything but unified, and there was a series of plagues and natural disasters threatening to plunge the entire nation into chaos. Number 22. Zito didn't choose the easy way out, though. Rather than beating troublemakers into submission with his enhanced bending prowess, he chose the diplomatic approach, working his way up the ranks to becoming one of the Fire Lord's primary advisors. Number 23. He also refused to be promoted based on his lineage and instead solely wanted to be judged on his achievements so as to give his advisory role to then Fire Lord Yosor more weight. This hints at him being from a noble background, same as Roku would be centuries later, but again, that's conjecture. Number 24. Here's the most remarkable thing about that though. It worked. His efforts managed to bring stability to a nation in turmoil. He set up relief programs for farmers in times of famine that were still in effect by Kyoshi's time, and brokered a mostly stable peace between noble houses that were ruling different parts of the Fire Nation. Number 25. But with all of that said, because there was a 14-year gap between his first appearance and the reveal of his name, many fans took to calling him Jafar, mostly because he looks more than a little like the villain from Aladdin. Number 26. That said, the actual etymology of his name goes back to the ancient Chinese title of Situ, which can be translated into Minister of the Masses, fitting given how he chose to spend his time. Number 27. Let's move on to Yang Chen, the first airbender avatar we have details on. Before her name was revealed in Book 3, however, she had already appeared in the Avatar state, and Brian Konietzko joked that her name was Susan when asked about it at an expo. Number 28. She was born in the Western Air Temple which suggests a counterclockwise rotation of the origin of air nomad avatars relative to the temples they were born in. Number 29. This isn't a theory that comes completely out of the air though, as we know for a fact that the place of origin for water tribe avatars alternates between northern tribe and southern. Number 30. My earlier claim was not a typo. There is a giant statue of Yang Chen at the eastern air temple, but she really was born in the western one. Number 31. Even though she was an air nomad and believed in pacifism, when Aang asked her for advice on how to deal with Fire Lord Ozai, she replied that it may be necessary for him to put aside his personal feelings for the good of the world. Number 32. Thing is, she practiced what she preached in her own time. Yang Chen's steadfast guidance of the world, presumably with the occasional demonstration of her power as mentioned previously, led to a great era of peace. This is also why she was hailed as a great avatar, even many years after her death. Number 33. Yang Chen even went so far as to make deals with criminals and pirates in order to maintain her peace. But then again, because of her reputation, this worked. Number 34. But this isn't to imply that she was some kind of ultra-violent savage. Part of the reason Yang Chen was so beloved was because of her encouraging nature and her compassion. Number 35. But this brings us to Kuruk. And for the obsessives among us, finally, an avatar of whom we know his age. He lived to the ripe old age of... 33. Bummer. 
Number 36. That being said, we don't actually know any dates or ages of the previously discussed avatars, only that Juan lived exactly 10,000 years before Korra. This still doesn't tell us much since we don't know his age during the events of his episodes. Number 37. His name is derived from the Pawnee Native American word meaning bear, possibly a reference to the animal pelt he's seen frequently wearing over his head. Number 38. Kirk is the most recent avatar who didn't have to deal with any kind of major political conflicts between humans. Instead, he spent most of his time trying to fight off dark spirits crossing between the human and spirit realm. Number 39. He's also the only avatar to appear on screen to not have a known animal companion. Instead, his favorite method of getting around was by sea, creating tidal waves to surf on. Number 40. But for some reason, Kura kept this side of his duties a secret to everyone except his spiritual mentor, a fire sage from the Bonte tribe. Number 41. Fighting all those spirits took a huge toll on his body, and it greatly contributed to his relatively early death. Number 42. This led to Kuruk being remembered as something of a failed avatar, given his short lifespan and his outward appearance of spending more time using his bending power to impress women. Number 43. The funny thing is, even though we know his age, there's conflicting information out there about him. Ko the Face Stealer mentions to Aang that Kuruk tried to kill him 8 or 900 years ago, which is admittedly a pretty big margin for error, but he only lived about 350 years before the conversation took place. Number 44. Another inconsistency is his fiance Umi, whose face Ko ended up stealing. She's mentioned briefly in the second Kyoshi novel, but we only ever read about him being together with Heiran, mother to Rangi. Number 45, which is as good a moment as any to move on to Kyoshi, ironically the longest lived avatar we know of, clocking in at 230 years old when she died. Number 46, this not only makes her the oldest avatar to ever live, but the oldest known human to have lived in this world. Number 47, the exact method in which she obtained this extremely long life is still unknown. We do know that it was taught to her by Lao Ge, one of the outlaws she traveled with, but he sure is vague on the details when it comes to sharing them with the readers. Number 48. We do know that this secret was passed on to at least one other person, Guru Pathak, who was an impressive 150 years old during his appearance in the show. Number 49. Kyoshi has garnered a bit of a split reputation, as her methodology seemed to involve a lot of brute force, but at the same time, she didn't enjoy causing other people pain and suffering, and would frequently go out of her way to prevent bloodshed. Number 50. That having been said, she was quite the badass, one time going so far as using her own blood as war paint when she didn't have anything else handy. Number 51. Kyoshi is the only known avatar to have struggled mastering bending her native element. Number 52. As a teenager, Kyoshi frequently struggled to do precise acts of bending, and was only really good at enormously powerful earthbending moves and all the destruction that would come with that. Number 53. This definitely matches her enormous stature, towering over pretty much everyone she came across. It also follows that she had the largest feet of any avatar, according to the Kyoshi Islanders. Number 54. There has long been a notion that the fully realized avatars are capable of reshaping the geography of the world, but really, we only ever see Kyoshi do this. It's possible that even for an avatar, this would be a stretch, given the size of Kyoshi Island. But then again, she had a knack for bending large volumes of Earth. Number 55. Also, Kyoshi is, chronologically anyway, the first person we see to use tools to enhance her bending, using her mother's fans to make her earth and air bending even more powerful. Query whether that was fully necessary, but it looks cool. Number 56. Much like her predecessors, Kyoshi had quite the legacy, leaving behind both the Kyoshi warriors and founding the Dai Li. However, after learning what the Dai Li had become, she would express regret in doing so. Number 57. She's the first avatar we know to have had descendants. We know both of her immediate successors did. Korra's still pending, but it's not too late for her. However, we don't know about any children or even descendants of Kyoshi's predecessors. Number 58. If you discount my earlier speculation about Avatar Salai, Kyoshi is the only named avatar to have Earth as their native element. Number 59. She's also the only female known to be capable of lava bending. Of course, with her being an avatar, this is kind of cheating. Number 60. Kyoshi would start something of a tradition for avatars to come, namely defying the rulers of their respective nations. Kyoshi against the 46th Earth King, Roku against Sozin, Aang running away from the elders of the temple, and Korra blowing the starting whistle on a civil war against her own chief. Number 61. She holds the record for having seen the most passes of Sozin's comet at 3, even if it was called the Great Comet in her time. Lucky time of birth meant she was 12 the first time it passed. Number 62. And with all that said, Kyoshi is also the first known avatar to be openly bisexual. Then again, there wasn't much of a stigma against non-heteronormative relationships in the world at that time, at least not according to Kaya. So maybe it wasn't so unusual. 
Number 63. Speaking of, Kyoshi's girlfriend, Rangi, has a story worth telling about her design. The first official look we got at her was on the cover of the second novel, but the cover artist was working backwards from a piece of fan art by Tumblr user Kachi95, who based his design on the descriptions in the first novel. Number 64. Let's move on to Roku. He's been somewhat unlucky, because prior to the release of the second Kyoshi novel, it was kind of a toss-up between him and Kurok who was considered the worst avatar. But ever since it was revealed Kurok died because he was fighting spirits, that balance is shifting to Roku's side for letting the Hundred Year War happen. Number 65. It was his own greatest regret, as he considers himself to be too indecisive. Had he been more determined, he could have stopped Sozin. After all, Sozin delayed his plans for decades precisely because Roku would have been there to stop him. Number 66. Part of Roku's encouraging attitude towards Aang really is him being a genuinely warm and cordial person. But part of that is also because he wants to make sure Aang doesn't make the same mistakes he did. And in fact, even tries to help Aang right Roku's own mistakes. Number 67. His methods frequently seem to involve intimidation, even if he doesn't necessarily follow through with his threat. Him appearing before Jiang Zhang, nice little nod to the Book of Exodus there, falls into that category as well, as it's simply a show of force, but not a direct threat. Number 68. That scene also makes him one of two people to generate fire that doesn't directly originate from his body, with the other being Zhang Zhang. Number 69. Roku's first appearance in the show proper was as a statue in the Southern Air Temple. That said, even though the statues are supposedly all avatars, they don't appear to be placed in the proper order, as the one next to him is definitely not Kyoshi. Number 70. This was changed as in The Legend of Korra, when Jinora is seen in the sanctuary, Aang's statue is standing next to Roku. Number 71, the episode in which Aang first learns airbending is titled Bitter Work, which would later be referenced by Roku as he considered his journey to master the four elements to be bitter work. Number 72, Roku has a, um, let's say bad habit of destroying important buildings. Even in the few times we see him, he destroyed the throne room of the Fire Nation Palace, and he destroyed the Temple of the Fire Sages twice, once to save Aang and once in his youth when he tried the easy way of mastering the Avatar state. Number 73, even though he was a firebender, his preferred element seems to be air, as he uses it more than any of the others, both when fighting Sozin and when fighting the volcano. Number 74. We don't exactly know who Roku's parents were, but we can throw an educated guess out there and say that they were both high nobles, given that he was good friends with Prince Sozin before he was revealed to be the Avatar. Number 75. But because Roku's granddaughter Ursa would marry into the Fire Nation royal family, his family tree is by far the most extensive of all the known avatars. Number 76. Moving on to Aang, technically the second longest living avatar after Kyoshi, clocking in at 165 years old at the time of his death. Number 77. However, this is only chronologically, as biologically, he was only 66. The stated reason for his relatively early death is that being stuck in the avatar state while frozen in the iceberg for almost a century drained his energy. Number 78. Aang has the most episode titles referring to him, either directly by name or by proxy, coming in at 3. The Boy in the Iceberg, the Avatar Returns, and the finale, titled Sozin Comet Part 4, Avatar Aang. The titles of the first and last episodes mirror his growth from a boy to him becoming a fully realized avatar. Number 79. The number 2 spot is shared by Zuko and Avatar Roku, both being directly referenced in two episode titles. Number 80. Creator Michael Dante DiMartino has said that Aang was by far the hardest character to find a good voice actor for. They ended up going for Zack Tyler Eisen, but if you listen closely, you can hear that his voice is notably lower in the last episode when compared to the first. It lets me control the air currents around my glider and fly. I learned there was another way to defeat him and restore balance. Number 81. When dubbing the show to Russian, they did exactly what the creators were mocking in the episode The Ember Island Prayers. Aang is voiced by a woman, Olga Zverova. Not only that, she also voices Katara and would later go on to voice Korra. Number 82. Aang's name is spelled out on both the Fire Nation Wanted poster and on the flyers he spreads through Ba Sing Se while looking for Appa. It would literally translate to peaceful soaring. Number 83. Even though Azula shot him in the back with lightning, this isn't the only scar he got from this. There's another scar on the bottom of his left foot where the lightning left his body. Number 84. Aang is of course the titular last airbender, but he wouldn't be the only one to hold that title. Because Korra is 7 years older than Jinora during that period, Tenzin was the last airbender. Number 85. In the original pitch for the series, Aang was supposed to be 10 years old, not 12. He was aged up two years at the behest of Eric Coleman, executive at Nickelodeon at the time. He can be seen at his original age in the unaired pilot, where he does appear younger. Number 86. Outside of his skills at bending, Aang seemed to have quite a bit of interest in the arts. He's a skilled and agile dancer and can play both the flute and the sungi horn. 
However, he admits to being terrible at the latter. Number 87. There might be something resembling the saying birds of a feather flock together, given just how many of his friends were nobles. Toph, Zuko, Bumi, and technically even Katara and Sokka. Maybe the position of Avatar just has an inherent attraction to power. Number 88. Aang actually has his face appear on the Yuans in Republic City. Number 89. The design of Aang's beard as an adult was based on that of Michael Dante DiMartino. Number 90. One of the best and most iconic pieces of music on the show's score, which is played multiple times throughout the series, is known as Aang's theme, but it's not exclusive to him. It also plays when both Juan and Korra are seen going into the Avatar state for the first time. Number 91, which brings us neatly to the present, and to Korra. She was the youngest Avatar to learn of her true identity by quite a margin, learning at only the age of four, whereas the next in line was Aang, who was told at age 12. Of course, Gyatso thought it was a mistake to have told Aang so young, when all of the other Avatars were only told at age 16. Number 92. Also, this makes Korra the only Avatar to discover it by her own merit, rather than being told by someone else. Number 93. Korra's name follows something of a tradition in the Avatar universe, namely having both a K and an A sound in it. Almost all the characters native to the Water Tribes have either one or both of these elements. Number 94. Much like Aang, Korra's name is spelled out on a wanted poster, though unlike Aang's, which makes basic sense, hers would have the characters translate to bandit drag. What, whatever that means. Number 95. The creators admit that they were struggling to come up with a name for the main character of the second series, until the owner of an eco-lodge they stayed in introduced them to his dog Korra. All it took from there was a spelling tweak. Number 96. Incidentally, young Korra was voiced by a girl called Korra Baker. Number 97. It was an uphill struggle for the creators to convince Nickelodeon that the main character for the next show would be female. They had to make what amounted to the first episode and run it by focus groups to prove to the studio it wouldn't be an issue. Number 98. Her go-to excuse when caught in a place she shouldn't be is, I'm looking for the bathroom, as she's seen using it at least twice. Number 99. Unlike Aang, who appears in all but one episode of his show, he's absent in Zuko alone, Korra does actually appear in every single episode of her own show, though it should be noted that her appearances in both The Sting and After All These Years were extremely brief, and both limited to one line. Number 100. This also makes her the only character in The Legend of Korra to appear in every episode. Number 101. Contrary to Aang and Roku, who had the greatest difficulty mastering the element that was opposite to their native element, earth and water respectively, Korra had the most trouble learning airbending, because it was the most opposite to her personality. Number 102. Korra is one of three people to be directly responsible for the death of a family member, the others being Tarlok and Ozai. Unlike Ozai, however, Korra lamented the fact that she had to kill her uncle Unalak, rather than being able to save him. Number 103. Unlike her three closest predecessors who were conflicted upon learning that they were the Avatar, Korra is actually excited at the prospect. This does come with the small caveat that we don't see the actual moment she learns though. But even after a little bit of time to process the news, Kyoshi, Roku, and Aang were not looking forward to being the Avatar. Number 104. Unlike what we see all of the previous Avatars doing, Korra is actually a fairly skilled fighter in unarmed combat. Number 105. Korra and Aang were both bloodbent on multiple occasions, and while both broke free of it on their own, Aang had to resort to the Avatar state for doing so, while Korra did it without the extra boost of power. Number 106. But for all the things she's good at and you feel inadequate by comparison, take comfort in the knowledge that Korra is still a terrible driver. <laughs> Number 107. Of all the Avatars, only Aang and Korra are heard speaking in the Avatar state, and while Aang does so by speaking with the voice of all the past avatars at once, Korra speaks in tandem with Rava. With the timeline sorted and a whole bucket of facts, why not relive some key moments the way that they were originally experienced? Let's dive right into our top 7 avatar episodes. I'm sure your list looks a little different and we understand. Everyone's got their own set of favorites. Just make sure you argue your case down in the comments. We'd love to see what other episodes folks adore. For those of you who have been watching since the revival of our channel in October, it should come as no surprise that we here at Frederator love us some Avatar. So why not take a look at the very best it has to offer? I'm Jeremy, and these are the top 7 best episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender. Number 7. The Tales of Ba Sing Se. And yes, we're starting with this one for two reasons. It's technically a filler episode, but it gives us something that is sorely needed in an epic adventure like this one. It broadens the characters. The reason this is so important is because it makes them feel more human, to show us that they aren't just concerned with fighting the Fire Nation and mastering the elements. There is more going on in their lives than that. 
Aang is still on the lookout for Appa, sure, but that doesn't mean he can't stop to help other animals, because that's his nature. Zuko is slowly coming around to life in Ba Sing Se not being so bad, and him going on a date with a girl makes that all the more believable. It's very rare for a show like this to take that kind of time and just let the characters be. It's a welcome breather after episodes that had major plot developments, and one last big action scene before they go into the city. And that's about as far as we can go without addressing the elephant in the room. The Tale of Iroh. It's made all the more poignant by the fact that Iroh's voice actor passed away between books 2 and 3, and that this part of the episode was dedicated to him. But it's not just that. It's also pretty much the only part of the show to be truly Iroh-centric. Every time he features more prominently, the episodes are still largely focused on Zuko. This makes sense, but it's nice to have him finally get a proper segment all to himself. Not only that, but this is where we get a lot more insight into his character. While he generally has a very laid-back attitude, treating his journey around the world with Zuko almost more like an extended vacation than a desperate manhunt, this is where we get to see a side of him that we would otherwise never get to. A side that he likely never showed to anyone, maybe not even to Zuko. From the brief glimpses we get, Iroh always held a deep affection for Zuko, but now we see why Iroh went with him, because he didn't want to go through that kind of loss again. Maybe it's even as a replacement for his own son Luten, but that seems a bit selfish for a man like him. So with it being so interesting and such a tearjerker, why doesn't it score higher on the list? Stiff competition, obviously, but also because the tale of Iroh is the clear standout in terms of quality. The other segments are all good, but none of them quite reach that same level. So while it deserves to be mentioned, this is as high as it will go. Number 6. The Desert This one, I believe, deserves to be on the list for a reason you might not expect. It really highlights the relationship between Aang and Appa, and how important it is to him. Even with pretty much everyone he knew growing up being gone, Appa was still there for him. He was more than just a convenient mode of transport for Aang. He really was a great and loyal friend. So to lose him really puts Aang in a state, no pun intended, that we haven't really seen before. This is the only episode where Aang is genuinely scary, and it seemed like he was inches away from murdering someone. He is normally very attached to his values as an air nomad, but this episode demonstrates that even someone who is as much of a pacifist as Aang has a breaking point. Of course, this culminates in him going into the Avatar state, and it's probably the most tragic time this happens. Especially because of the way he gets pulled out of it again, the fact that Katara has to hold him as a form of assurance, even though by right she should be just as scared as everyone else. It also gives Katara room to shine as the true moral center of the group, to try and keep them all alive. The other side of Appa being missing is simply practical, them being stuck in the middle of the desert following their adventure in the library. Also, cactus juice. It's the quenchiest! The other half of this episode, Iroh and Zuko's story where they start heading to Ba Sing Se as well, has some very clever storytelling of its own. It's great to see something that seemed like a throwaway joke at the time, the lotus tile, come back as a critical aspect of the plot. A timely reminder that no matter how small a detail seems to be in this show, you should never underestimate how important it can end up being. Number 5. The Avatar and the Fire Lord The episode that was the most work according to the creators, and it shows. In an interview, they stated that because this episode visited so many locations, it had a ton of background artwork that needed to be done, and that turned out to be a disproportionate amount of work, and they still did it. Even though this episode mainly focuses around a minor character at best, it gives us so much background on both Aang and Zuko, and even the war and how it came to be, this has to be one of the most densely written episodes in the show. And yet, it's still extremely well paced. We follow these two men from the time they were teenagers until they were old men, and yet I don't really feel like anything important was skipped. Even Sozin gets a ton of characterization in this episode, because the creators knew it mattered. Incidentally, if anyone ever tells you a prequel will never work because we know how it turns out, point them at this episode. We know that Roku is going to die, and we know that Sozin will start the war and wipe out the Air Nomads, but we still get invested in their ultimately doomed friendship because it is simply well written. Also, there is something incredibly cool about watching a fully realized Avatar in action when they are at the height of their power. It worked for Kyoshi, and it definitely worked here for Roku. This one also holds one of the greatest bits of how to use the camera to tell your story, 
and it's in the final scene between Zuko and Iroh. Yes, this also applies to animation. Even though Iroh is the one in prison, he is always sitting in the light, while Zuko is shot sitting in the dark and while behind the bars. Iroh is exactly where he wants to be, while Zuko is the one who is really trapped. It's a brilliant bit of subtle storytelling and demonstrates the kind of attention to detail that few showrunners have, which earns it the number 5 spot on this list. Number 4, Zuko Alone. This one really highlights that the creators can and will go places that lesser shows won't. An entire episode that doesn't even mention the titular character of the show, and instead focusing entirely on the antagonist, question mark. This episode really goes into how Zuko came to be the person he is by this point. Not necessarily the motivation for why he is doing what he's doing, we'll get into that a little bit later, but what shaped him. The fact that his family is seriously messed up paints a pretty clear picture, of course, and just how deep the roots of his trauma run. It's also pretty disturbing to see that Azula has been a terrible person to everyone around her ever since she was a little girl. Though at least Zuko can take comfort in the notion that his own sister is trying to kill him isn't personal. It's not the flashiest of episodes. The only fight Zuko wins with relative ease. The only reason he struggles is because he didn't want to use his firebending. And it's so brutal on him that when he actually does the right thing, free the people of this little town from the corrupt soldiers, he gets ostracized for it. And I think it's here that they really lay the foundation for Zuko choosing sides with Azula at the end of Book 2 because no matter what he does, he always seems to lose. He stands up for the people of the Earth Kingdom, and they reject him for it. And yet, there's still honor in him. He could have robbed the pregnant couple, but he chooses not to. Great work by the designers, by the way, making his cheeks so hollow. He's built in book one, but this is him at his skinniest. A few weeks of barely eating will do that to a person. Just one more piece of attention to detail that earns Zuko alone a spot on this list. Number 3. The Beach you might be surprised to see this one snag the number 3 spot over Zuko alone, but there is a good reason for it. That one was about background, but this one is about introspection. It's very rare to find a show that will dedicate basically an entire episode to give both the villain and the antagonists, again they are different, room to breathe. Going back to what I said about the tales of Ba Sing Se, it humanizes them in a strange way. They are still teenagers and there is more than a single aspect to their personalities. Also, rather than just being about Zuko, it also gives us more background on Azula, Mei, and Tai Li, which is a very welcome addition, especially with Azula. We definitely knew what she was like, but this is pretty much the only time we ever see her open up somewhat. Azula is always some kind of mixture between calculating and sadistic, but here you get the first real look at the fact that that is an exterior covering up a deeply troubled girl. My own mother thought I was a monster. It's only for a brief moment, but the fact that you get so much from the reading of a single line really speaks volumes to the quality of both the voice acting and the animators. She tries to cover it up with a joke, but even then, it's too sincere for us to be fooled. The B story, Team Avatar for a change, is pretty cool, as it provides the action almost entirely without music. Something you normally don't pay much attention to, the sound editing, really gets to shine here. The combustion beams just have so much impact even if you were to look away from the screen, you can hear just how incredibly powerful it must be to produce that kind of noise. It's a great action scene to mix things up a little bit, even within the context of the show. But really, the scene around the campfire is what makes this episode so great, and it's what earns it the number three spot. Number two, the storm. With how much we've been talking about Zuko, it should come as no surprise that this episode ranks so high. The true brilliance of this episode lies in making us realize that Zuko and Aang are not enemies per se, they are just opposite sides of the same coin. Both of them are haunted by the mistakes of their past, and both of them are trying to make up for those. Right from the word go, Zuko had been a very atypical antagonist, as he was not after money or fame or glory like all of the other villains, he was after his honor. But now we understand him. It's also great to see just how much of an extra dimension they add to Aang by making it his own decision to run away. It wasn't an accident, he was actively running from his responsibilities. That might sound like a highway to making him more unlikable, but by this point in the show he is well underway to owning up to his responsibilities, so we can see that he is already trying to make amends, which is good. Then there is the usual list of details that make this episode so much richer and deeper. 
It's technically Azula's introduction, and they waste no time demonstrating that she is a brutal sadist. They lay the groundwork for how seriously messed up Zuko's relationship with his father is, and we also get to truly understand Aang's loss and why he feels so guilty about it, even though that guilt is probably misplaced. Survivor's guilt is a real condition, and it's very clear that he is not over it. It's also the first time we see Iroh bending lightning, and while it is kind of played for laughs, it's yet another small detail hinting at the fact that Iroh is a much more powerful firebender than he is letting on. The list of things that are great about this episode is way longer than we have room for, so suffice it to say, it deserves to be here. Number 1. Sozin's Comet Is this cheating? Yeah, probably. So for the sake of technical correctness, I'll say the fourth one is the best. But really, you can't watch them individually. You have to sit down and watch all four. It's such a complete experience, such a masterfully crafted finale to an amazing show, that even the bean counters over at Nickelodeon wouldn't dare to get in the way. The original deal was for a three-episode finale, but when the creators turned over the script, it was plenty for four episodes. And Nickelodeon just gave them the money to make the extra episode, which is what gives their best show such a great finale. Because truly, that's what it is. There are many shows that have dragged on well past the point where everyone is thoroughly sick of it by the end. But by having the most amazing of finales, Avatar cemented itself into the mind of a generation. There is a reason that there are still creators here on YouTube making a living by talking about this show that's a decade and a half old, yours truly included. Apparently, some people have a problem with Aang taking away Fire Lord Ozai's bending, seeing it as a deus ex machina. But come on, it's been three seasons of non-stop magic, surely a bit more by the end doesn't suddenly ruin your immersion. Plus, it's not like it comes completely out of thin air. Aang talks with all of his friends in his past lives for advice, and is just about ready to sacrifice his own values for the sake of the world. We effectively have three finales at once, and it's kinda smart that two of them are all about the characters using their heads. Sokka's airship slice, and Katara freezing Azula in place. That's logical thinking. Making Aang's finale one that's a bit more out there is kind of earned that way. These episodes also have some of the boldest animation and music scores in the entire show. How often do you see the camera moving through 3D space in 2D animation? Almost never because it's incredibly difficult and expensive to do, but they did it. Using the music to create a glaring contrast between the comet-enhanced Agni Kai and the other two is another stroke of brilliance because it creates juxtaposition. The other two fights are loud, but this one is muted, and the music just highlights the tragedy of these two siblings agreeing to a fight to the death, a fitting conclusion to Azula's descent into madness. Of course, it doesn't get that far, but they didn't know that going in. In short, these four episodes have it all. The emotion, the drama, the action, the music, the animation. It's a fitting end to a gigantic epic of a story that will endure for generations to come. And if that's not worthy of the number one spot on the list, I don't know what is. And that's it. Quick note on the runners-up. If you're wondering if there were any, well, basically all of the episodes we didn't mention. Except for you, Great Divide. Nobody likes you. Where would we be without the first avatar we met? The rambunctious air nomad Aang. Yes, that's Aang, not Ong. He's got quite the deep history and learns so much throughout his journey as the avatar. So why not take a deeper look at his story with 107 Aang facts you should know. Flamio Hotman, welcome to Channel Frederator, the cartoon center of the internet. Today we're flying straight into the eye of the storm to unveil the saga of a boy who, with his trusty glider, loyal sky bison, and a heart full of courage, embraced his destiny as the savior of the world, Avatar Aang. We're trying something new with this video. It's going to be a combination of Aang's biography with some lesser known facts about everyone's favorite cabbage crasher. We'd like to make sure that all the fans out there know everything there is to know about Aang, including some facts from the comics and other canon resources. Think of this video as an all-encompassing resource for the fanbase. So whether you're a bender or a non-bender, Fire Nation or Water Tribe, it's time to embark on a whirlwind journey. We'll explore the wonders, secrets, and challenges of a boy forced to grow up in the face of adversity, all in our grand tour of 107 facts about Avatar Aang. Hold on tight to Appa and maybe avoid the cactus juice, because this is one adventure you don't want to miss. Number 1. 
Born 165 years before his death, Aang has the second longest lifespan of any known avatar, bested only by Avatar Kyoshi who lived an impressive 230 years. Aang's extended lifespan isn't just due to his natural vitality, but largely because he was frozen in an iceberg for a hundred years. Number 2. There's a deep, spiritual connection between Aang and the Fire Nation royal family. Because Avatar Roku, the avatar preceding Aang, was the maternal great-grandfather of Zuko, Azula, and Ki, Aang was actually spiritually related to them. In the grand scheme of things, it was almost like family fighting family during the ultimate conflict of the Hundred Year War. Number 3. Not many know this, but Aang's name translates to peaceful soaring in Chinese. Quite fitting for our high-flying, peace-bringing avatar, don't you think? Number 4. When it came to conceptualizing Aang's physical appearance and movements, the creators found inspiration in an unlikely source, a young boy named Arjuna, the son of the martial arts consultant on the show Sifu Kisu. Photographed by Brian Konietzko when he was just six, Arjuna's kung fu movements would become the basis for Aang's dynamic airbending forms. Number 5. A fun bit of trivia about Aang's design. His adult beard was modeled after none other than series co-creator Michael Dante DiMartino. It seems that some elements elements of the creators themselves made their way into Avatar. Number 6. If you recall, during the climactic battle against Azula, Aang was hit with a lightning bolt that nearly ended his life. He survived, but was left with two scars. One on his back, where the lightning entered, and another on the sole of his left foot, where it exited. These scars were more than just physical. They were a constant reminder of the dangers he faced in his role as Avatar. Number 7. Aang's journey of maturation and growth is beautifully symbolized in the names of the first and last episode of the series. First, the boy in the iceberg, and last, Sozin's Comet Part 4, Avatar Aang. We watch him grow from a playful, carefree boy to a wise and powerful avatar. Number 8. Not many people notice this, but according to Katara, Aang was left-handed in one of his past lives. Even avatars can switch things up every few lifetimes. Number 9. Sadly, Aang passed away before his granddaughter Jinora was born. He never got a chance to meet any of his grandchildren. Though he may not have met them, his legacy lived on through them, shaping the future of airbending. Number 10. Aang's journey to becoming a fully realized avatar was faster than any other known avatar. Given that he was trapped in an iceberg when he was supposed to start his training, he only officially began after his release. This makes his journey just 12 months. Number 11. While we usually see Aang in his Air Nomad robes, there's a special accessory he wore during Zuko's coronation, a necklace. This necklace bears a striking resemblance to the one found on the skeleton of Monk Yatso, his airbending teacher and father figure. Number 12. Have you ever noticed the similarities between Aang's time encased in an iceberg and Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytic theory of the id, ego, and superego? It's a bit of a mind bender, but hear us out. In Freud's theory, the ego is represented by the small visible part of the iceberg, while the id, the unconscious self, is the massive submerged portion. When Aang encased himself in ice while in the avatar state, the visible part represented his conscious self, while the submerged part signified his immense, often unconscious, avatar power. Number 13. When the creators first pitched the series, Aang was supposed to be just 10 years old. Following a suggestion from Eric Coleman, they decided to age him up to 12. Imagine how different things might have been with a younger Aang. Number 14. Sokka's sword instructor, Master Piandao, and Aang share a unique connection. They are the only two characters in the original series who had both their parents as benders. It seems that bending runs strong in their families. Number 15. Aang holds the unique distinction of meeting the original source of each bending art during his lifetime. He met a flying bison for air, the moon spirit for water, badger moles for earth, and two dragons for fire. It's like he had a direct line to the roots of bending itself. Number 16. Co-creator Michael Dante DiMartino admitted that Aang was the hardest character to find a voice for across both the original series and The Legend of Korra. Despite this challenge, they found the perfect fit and brought Aang to life. Number 17. A little-known fact about Aang in The Legend of Korra. He was first voiced by actor Rob Paulson. However, in a post-production change, D.B. Sweeney took on the role. Number 18. Aang is proudly displayed as the representative airbender in the opening sequence of The Legend of Korra. Number 19. Aang's encounters with bloodbending were momentous occasions in the series. He holds the distinction of being the first known avatar to be subjected to bloodbending. Number 20. 
He didn't just experience bloodbending either, he also fought against it. Aang was the second known individual to break free from a bloodbender's hold, though this was only possible by entering the powerful avatar state. Number 21. Aang's abilities extended beyond the four elemental bending arts. At the end of the original series and in the final episode of the first book of The Legend of Korra, he was shown using energy bending, the ability to bend another person's life energy. Number 22. While we saw Aang take away Fire Lord Ozai's bending using energy bending in the original series, he demonstrated the flip side of this ability in The Legend of Korra. With this, he restores Korra's bending, making him the first person known to be capable of restoring another's bending. Number 23. Aang's marriage is unique in the Avatar universe. He was the first known Avatar to have an interracial marriage, hailing from the Air Nomads and marrying Katara of the Southern Water Tribe. Number 24. Aang's connection to the Southern Water Tribe went beyond his marriage to Katara. In fact, he is the only known Air Nomad to be considered an honorary member of the Southern Water Tribe. Number 25. Aang's union with Katara brought another first for the Air Nomads. Their daughter Kaya made Aang the first known Air Nomad to have a waterbending child. Number 25. 26. Aang's presence in the original series is almost constant. Out of all the episodes, there's only one where he doesn't appear. Zuko alone. And that one, of course, is all about Zuko alone. Number 27. Avatar Extras revealed that Aang had a favorite food, the egg custard tart. His love for this dish was clearly visible when he discovered it in the Great Divide. Number 28. Aang's love for food didn't end with custard tarts. He was so fond of a vendor's seaweed wraps in the Earth Kingdom that the vendor renamed them Aang Aang rolls in his honor. Number 29. Aang's legacy permeates the world of Avatar. His image is printed on the obverse side of the Yuan Bill, a testament to his influence and significance. Use one of these bills to buy yourself some tea from the Jasmine Dragon. I hear it's hot and delicious. Number 30. Aang's abilities continue to set him apart even within the earthbending community. Despite not being a metal bender, Aang is the only known non-metal bending earthbender in the Avatar franchise with the ability to use seismic sense. Number 31. Aang was the first known Avatar to have his photograph taken. Good thing he's so photogenic. Number 32. Aang is a playable character in Nickelodeon's video game, Nickelodeon Kart Racers 2 Grand Prix. Number 33. In July 2020, Aang's character was incorporated into the MOBA game Smite. A battle pass was launched that featured two skins for Merlin, a wizard who uses different elements in battle. The skins allowed him to look like Aang did in Book 1 or like he did during his final battle against Ozai, complete with access to the Avatar state. Number 34. Aang also made a cameo in Nicktoon's Attack of the Toybots as a master model. This means that within the context of the game, he was captured and needed to be rescued. Number 35. He's also a playable character in Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl, and it seems like he's a favorite among competitive players. S-Tier Aang. He's strong in his own universe and in others. Number 36. Aang was born to two Air Nomads in 12 BG. Despite being an integral part of the Avatar cycle, Aang's childhood was relatively normal until his destiny was revealed. Number 37. Aang was identified as the Avatar because he picked out four specific toys from thousands. The same toys that previous Avatars had selected as children for generations. This practice mirrors a real-life tradition of Tibetan Buddhist monks who use a similar method to identify the reincarnations of the Tulku Lama. Number 38. After this revelation, his life changed dramatically. He was taken away by the monks of the Southern Air Temple who chose to keep his avatar status a secret from him, a decision that undoubtedly would have heavy repercussions later in his life. Number 39. Aang had the privilege of traveling extensively around the world at a young age. As an air nomad, he got a first-hand view of the different cultures and peoples that make up the world he was destined to protect. Number 40. While traveling, he visited cities in the Earth Kingdom like Omashu and made friends like Bumi. These friendships would prove to be very valuable and instilled in him the importance of bonds and camaraderie. Number 41. In the Fire Nation, Aang developed close bonds with children like Kuzan, demonstrating early on his ability to make friends across cultures and nations. This trait would serve him well in his future diplomatic duties. Number 42. One of Aang's childhood adventures was saving a dragon egg from poachers alongside Kuzan. This not only underscored Aang's bravery, but also his commitment to balance and harmony among all living creatures. Number 43. 
Monk Gyatso plays a pivotal role in Aang's life. Serving as Aang's guardian and mentor at the Southern Air Temple, Gyatso was not only a teacher, but also a father figure for the young Avatar. It was Gyatso who provided Aang with a sense of home and stability amid the great expectations placed upon him. Number 44. One significant event in Aang's childhood was the choosing of his Sky Bison companion, a tradition among Air Nomads. He chose Appa, and we all thank him for doing so. Appa best boy. Number 45. Prodigiously gifted, Aang was able to master complex bending moves quickly. By the age of 6, he was already a better airbender than children twice his age, and by 10, he had surpassed his own teachers. Number 46. Aang's skills as an airbender were so advanced that he earned his airbending tattoos and the status of an airbending master at the young age of 12. This made Aang the youngest airbending master in the history of the Air Nomads. Number 47. His creation of the air scooter technique was a major factor in this early achievement. Number 48. Aang's life took a significant turn when he was informed about his status as the Avatar at the age of 12, four years earlier than the traditional age of 16. Number 49. Despite his Avatar status isolating him from the other children, Monk Gyatso made sure that Aang enjoyed some aspects of a normal childhood. Gyatso knew what kinds of pressures Aang would face as he was friends with an Avatar himself. Number 50. Fear and confusion about being sent away for further training led Aang to running away with Appa. It could be said that the hefty expectations placed upon a young child caused his untimely disappearance. Number 51. Of course, his running away led him into a storm and had Aang and Appa trapped in ice for a century. Number 52. Aang entered the Avatar state unconsciously to save himself and Appa from drowning, and created an ice sphere around them using a combination of airbending and waterbending. Number 53. Aang was discovered and released from his icy cocoon by Katara and Sokka of the Southern Water Tribe. Number 54. Prince Zuko was on the case pretty much immediately afterward, as he was incredibly determined to capture the Avatar and restore his honor. Number 55. Aang, Katara, and Sokka, or as we like to call them Team Avatar, embarked on a quest to find a waterbending master who could teach both Katara and Aang, all while evading Zuko's relentless pursuit. If only they knew how helpful Zuko could actually be. I guessed first he had to do some learning himself. Number 56. While helping Senlin Village deal with a rampaging spirit, Aang ventured into the spirit world. There he met Avatar Roku's animal guide, Fang, who instructed him to visit the Avatar Temple on Crescent Island during the winter solstice. Number 57. Despite conflict with the Fire Sages who were loyal to the Fire Lord, Aang managed to speak with Roku, who warned him about the return of Sozin's Comet, which would grant the Fire Nation the power to win the war. Number 58. Aang was captured by Admiral Zhao, but was freed by Zuko, disguised as the Blue Spirit. Don't get the wrong idea though, this rescue was a tactical move from Zuko, who wanted to capture Aang himself. Number 59. Upon reaching the Northern Water Tribe, Aang was dismayed to find that Master Paku refused to teach Katara combat waterbending due to tradition. However, Katara managed to change Paku's mind, and both she and Aang began to learn under him. Number 60. Their peace was short-lived as Admiral Zhao launched an attack on the Northern Water Tribe. In response, Aang sought the guidance of the Ocean and Moon Spirits, patrons of the tribe, who revealed themselves to be in the mortal world. Number 61. Zhao succeeded in killing the Moon Spirit, causing a drastic reduction in the waterbenders and Aang's power. This also made Sokka's girlfriend turn into the moon. That's rough, buddy. Number 62. In a show of incredible power and determination, Aang merged with the Ocean Spirit and annihilated the Fire Nation fleet, winning the battle. Many more battles to come. Sorry, my young Avatar friend. Number 63. Aang, Katara, Sokka, and their new friends left the north and arrived at an Earth Kingdom base where they planned to find King Bumi so that Aang could learn earthbending. Number 64. The general attempted to forcibly trigger Aang's Avatar state, which at that point was a big no-no. Thus, Team Avatar decided to travel alone. Number 65. Upon reaching Omashu, they found that the city had been taken over by the Fire Nation. Bad luck. Number 66. After a series of unfortunate events, including a failed prisoner exchange, Aang managed to find Bumi. However, he told him he wouldn't leave Omashu, and encouraged Aang to find a master who understood the principles of neutral Jing. Number 67. In the city of Gaoling, they attended an earthbending tournament where they discovered a blind girl named Toph Beifong who was an incredible earthbender. She used her unique technique of earthbending to win the tournament, catching Aang's attention. Number 68. 
Toph later joined Aang's group as his earthbending teacher. She took some convincing thanks to her fancy upbringing, but it was all good in the end. Number 69. Aang struggled with earthbending due to its nature being the direct opposite of air. However, under Toph's guidance, he made progress and successfully bent some earth within a day of starting his training. Now that's what I call progress. Number 70. Aang was unsettled after capturing a Fire Nation soldier as the young man believed that the air nomads were evil. Propaganda at work, folks. Number 71. While taking a break at the Misty Palms Oasis, the group was sent to Wan Shi Tong's library. There, they discovered important information about a solar eclipse that could render firebenders powerless. Number 72. With good news comes bad, as Appa was captured and sold by desert tribesmen while Team Avatar perused the ancient library. Number 73. The group decided to head to Ba Sing Se to inform the Earth King of the impending solar eclipse and the opportunity it presented. Number 74. They faced many challenges, including an attempted breach of Ba Sing Se by a Fire Nation drill and the political conspiracy within the city headed by Long Feng and the Dai Li. Number 75. After reuniting with Appa and revealing Long Feng's betrayal, Aang received a message from Guru Pathak. The Guru wanted to teach Aang to control the Avatar state, and thus Aang set out to meet him at the Eastern Air Temple. Number 76. Despite making significant process and opening his chakras, Aang was unable to let go of his emotional attachment to Katara, which hindered the opening of his thought chakra. This was brought on by a vision of her in danger, which prompted him to rush back to Ba Sing Se. Number 77. In Ba Sing Se, Aang and his friends were confronted by Azula, Mai, and Tai Li, who had infiltrated the city. In the ensuing conflict, Aang entered the Avatar state but was struck by Azula's lightning, causing severe injury and disconnecting him from the Avatar state. Number 78. While mortally wounded and unconscious, Aang entered the spirit world, where he reconnected with his previous four incarnations to help heal the Avatar spirit. Number 79. Aang awoke aboard a Fire Nation ship, initially fearing that he'd been captured. However, he discovered that it was commandeered by Team Avatar and their allies. Number 80. The group spent some time in the Fire Nation, preparing for an invasion on the day of the eclipse while evading a mysterious assassin dubbed as Combustion Man. Number 81. On the day of the eclipse, Aang, Sokka, and Toph tried to find Fire Lord Ozai, but Azula successfully kept them at bay. Realizing that their plans had failed, they retreated to the Western Air Temple. Number 82. The group found refuge there, where Zuko eventually located them and expressed his desire to join their group and become Aang's firebending teacher. After initially refusing him, Aang decided to give Zuko a chance after he protected the group from Combustion Man. Number 83. Zuko's first attempts to teach Aang firebending were unsuccessful due to his own inability to bend fire, caused by a shift in his motivation and internal balance. They visited the Sun Warriors, the original firebenders, and learned the true essence of firebending from the dragons Ron and Shaw. Number 84. While Aang started mastering the four elements, he still struggled with the prospect of killing Fire Lord Ozai to end the war, a decision that went against his air nomad teachings. He refused to eat raw meat, how is he going to end a human life? Number 85. While on Ember Island, Aang had a series of nightmares about his impending confrontation with Fire Lord Ozai, causing severe sleep deprivation and stress. This prompted him to seek solitude on a mysterious island that appeared overnight. Number 86. The island was actually a giant lion turtle, an ancient being. This encounter taught Aang the forgotten art of energy bending. Number 87. The final battle against the Fire Nation, known as the Sozin's Comet Battle, took place in the capital city. Aang confronted Fire Lord Ozai, who had declared himself Phoenix King. In the final face-off, Aang managed to subdue Ozai without killing him. Using energy bending, he stripped Ozai of his firebending abilities, thereby effectively ending his reign of terror. Number 88. Following the end of the Hundred Year War, Aang and his companions parted ways, and Aang dedicated his time to re-establishing harmony and order. Number 89. Aang and Katara visited Yudao, when Zuko withdrew his support for the decolonization process. The situation was complicated. Zuko saw the colonies as prosperous communities with a right to exist, while Aang perceived them as a threat to the balance between the four nations. Number 90. Aang and Katara promised to find a peaceful resolution and approached Earth King Kue. However, Kue's decisions to remove the colonies by force did not sit well with Aang, so he rushed back to persuade the locals to leave before a new war broke out. Number 91. Amidst increasing tensions and the eruption of the battle for Yudao, Aang decided it was impossible to keep the nations apart. He halted the battle and convinced Kue to allow the old colonies to remain with their own governing bodies. Number 92. 
Aang repurposed the official Avatar Aang fan club into the first Air Acolytes to revive Air Nomad culture, a significant move towards preserving the customs and traditions of his people. Number 93. Aang, along with Katara and Sokka, then decided to help Zuko in his quest to find his long-lost mother, Ursa. Their search led them to the remote village of Hira and into the Forgetful Valley, where they sought the aid of the Mother of Faces, a powerful spirit. They discovered that Ursa had her face and memories changed, but the team managed to get them restored. Number 94. Aang had an encounter with the spirit of Avatar Yang Chen, inspiring him to revive Yang Chen's festival. This prompted a mission to the Earthen Fire Refinery, where they discovered it had been built on sacred air nomad lands. Number 95. When an earthquake trapped Katara, Toph, and several others in a mine beneath the refinery, Aang saved them. He also learned that the festival was initially designed to pacify the spirit, General Old Iron. After a confrontation with the spirit, Aang decided to reform Yang Chen's festival into the spirit's friendship festival. Number 96. Aang went to the Fire Nation to assist Zuko with alleged dark spirit attacks. Upon discovering that several children had disappeared, Aang, Zuko, Mai, and Kalo journeyed to the Dragonbone Catacombs to uncover the Fire Nation's history and find a possible explanation for the spirit's anger. Number 97. The Avatar's investigation led to the discovery that the kidnappings were done by human imposters led by Azula, disguised as Kimurikage spirits. Aang and his friends eventually located and rescued the missing children, though the Kimurikage imposters evaded capture. Number 98. Aang then traveled to the South Pole to spend time with Sokka and Katara. There, he had to deal with the Southern Water Tribe nationalists under Gilak, who intended to overthrow Hakoda, Katara's father, and head chieftain of the South. Aang found himself in the middle of a tense prison exchange at the Bridge of No Return. In the ensuing battle, he saved Hakoda and Melina from falling to their deaths. Number 99. Later, Aang traveled to the Earth and Fire Refinery again, discovering a city dubbed Cranefish Town. He was then tasked by Lao Bei Fong to help settle disputes between benders and non-benders at the new settlement. Upon investigating a series of sabotages at non-bender-owned factories, Team Avatar decided to intervene, resulting in he and Katara staying to help develop Cranefish Town into a better community. Number 100. Aang played a significant role in transforming the former Fire Nation colonies into the United Republic of Nations, with the renamed Republic City as its capital. He worked with Zuko to ensure the city's growth into a prosperous environment and dealt with a growing number of bending criminals. Number 101. Aang strived to revive the culture of the Air Nomads, reconstructing old recipes, scouring Air Temple ruins for documents, and restoring the ancient Air Temples. He also built a fifth temple near the heart of Republic City, Air Temple Island, to house a herd of surviving flying bison and a new type of winged lemur, the ring-tailed winged lemur. Number 102. Aang married Katara and they had three children. Despite experiencing family tensions due to his duties as Avatar and keeper of Air Nomad traditions, Aang remained supportive of his family, even finding solace and rejuvenation in the hermitage of an ancient Air Nun, Master Wangmo. Number 103. Aang's efforts for maintaining peace and order included dealing with notorious crime boss Yakon, a master bloodbender. He assisted Toph Beifong, the chief of police, in Yakon's arrest, and used energy bending to permanently remove Yakon's bending. Number 104. Even as his health began to deteriorate, Aang continued to work for the betterment of Republic City, teaching his son Tenzin the way of the Air Nomads and carrying out peaceful conflict resolution. Number 105. Aang's time frozen in an iceberg had drained much of his inherent life energy, and he died at a biologically young age of 66. Before his passing, he tasked the Order of the White Lotus to find and care for the next Avatar. Number 106. After Aang's death, he was reincarnated into a rebellious girl named Korra from the Southern Water Tribe. Aang's legacy lived on in the massive statue erected in his honor on Aang Memorial Island, and through the work he had done to foster peace, unity, and cultural understanding. Number 107. Aang continued to guide Korra on her journey as Avatar through visions and spiritual connections, reminding her of her duty and passing on his wisdom even in death. Now, Aang may be the heart and soul of the group, but Katara is the badass everyone needs on a perilous journey. The way she grows throughout the series is incredible, from her powers, to her personality, to her leadership skills. Sometimes it's easy to forget just how far she's come. So, to help you remember, we've put together a little timeline of her life. This is the complete Katara timeline. Today on Channel Frederator, we're going to try something a little bit different. Rather than taking a broad look at an entire series, we're going to take a deep dive into one particular character. And for that, we have chosen Katara from Avatar The Last Airbender. That out of the way, I'm Jeremy, and this is the complete timeline of Katara. 
We start in the year 85 after the Air Nomad Genocide, AG for short, when Katara is born as the daughter of Hakoda and Kaya, and the younger sister to Sokka, all non-benders. By the time of her birth, the Southern Water Tribe had its strength severely weakened by half a century of Fire Nation raids, intent on capturing the waterbenders there. These raids had come to the point that Katara was the only waterbender left. When she was eight, the last raid took place which would change her life forever. The commander of the raid, Yan Ra, had received word that there was one waterbender left in the South Pole. Kaya, wanting to protect her daughter, said that she was the waterbender. Rather than capturing her, Yan Ra killed her on the spot, leaving Katara half-orphaned. Winter 99 AG This event drastically accelerated the pace at which Katara was forced to grow up, as would become apparent another four years later. Hakoda and the men of the tribe left to go join the fight against the Fire Nation, so at the age of 12 she and Sokka were left to take care of their grandmother Kana, although Katara still carried way more responsibility for keeping her family running than was reasonable to expect of a girl her age. In fact, she did more than just care for her own family, but for the entire tribe. In the meantime, she still tried practicing her own waterbending as best she could, at least in secret, but without a master to teach her, her progress was slow and she was mostly limited to basic moves. Another two years later, in the winter of 99 AG, her life would be turned upside down once more, when in a fit of rage she broke open the iceberg that Aang had cocooned himself in reflexively after crashing into the sea during a fierce storm nearly a century earlier. After Zuko attacks her village to capture Aang, she and Sokka chase after them, ultimately freeing Aang, and they set out to the Northern Water Tribe to find a waterbending master for both of them. Throughout their journey, the group stopped in several locations across the war-torn Earth Kingdom. Their first stop was the Southern Air Temple in the Patola Mountain Range, where Aang had grown up. After Aang came across Monk Gyatso's skeleton and reflexively entered the Avatar state, Katara was able to help calm him down. The trio stopped on Kyoshi Island where they were ambushed by Prince Zuko and barely managed to escape. Following this encounter, the team flew to the Great Earth Kingdom Kingdom of Omashu where they were brought before the city's elderly king who treated them as honored guests before imprisoning them. Katara and her brother were given genomite crystals that nearly covered their whole bodies, before Aang solved all of the king's tasks, discovering that he was a childhood friend, Bumi. Before reaching the Northern Water Tribe, the trio had several other adventures while being pursued by multiple firebenders, including Zuko and his uncle Iroh, as well as Zhao of the Fire Navy. Among their missions, the group helped several earthbenders to escape from a Fire Nation prison rig, including Haru and his father Tyro. They helped the people of Senlin Village, who were being attacked by the Spirit High Bay before venturing to the Fire Nation, where Aang learned about the urgency of defeating the Fire Lord by Avatar Roku. The trio barely escaped the clutches of Zuko and a group of pirates during a confrontation where Katara lost her mother's necklace, a precious keepsake. She also discovered the darker side of the Resistance when they came into contact with Jet and his freedom fighters who tried to destroy the village of Gaipan to kill its firebender occupants. The team later encountered Bato, one of Hakoda's friends and a Southern Water Tribe warrior, where they almost departed from Aang before being reunited due to an unexpected Shushu attack. The team met Zhang Zhang later on their journey, who unsuccessfully tried to teach Aang the weight of firebending. During Aang's training, he accidentally burned Katara, whereupon she discovered that she had healing abilities. When the group reached the Northern Air Temple, they defended a group of refugees led by a machinist from War Minister Qin. After their long journey, the team reached the Northern Water Tribe in its capital city of Agna Kela, where Sokka and Katara were celebrated as kin from the Southern Tribe and Aang was honored as a special guest. It was decided that Aang would be taught waterbending by Master Paku, but Katara was prohibited from learning combative bending on account of her gender. After it was discovered that Aang was secretly teaching Paku's techniques to Katara at night, the master dismissed Aang as a student. At the palace, Katara pleaded with Chief Arnook for Paku to take Aang back as his student. The master agreed to do so if Katara apologized, and while she conceded at first, she renounced her apology and challenged the master to a duel after being patronized. Although Katara was defeated, the master picked up her necklace, revealing that he had made it for Kana 60 years prior, and decided to accept Katara as a student. When the Fire Nation's ships arrived at the Northern Water Tribe, 
Yue took Katara and Aang to a hidden oasis, where Aang crossed over to the spirit world. After Zuko unexpectedly arrived, Katara dueled him and was able to restrain him by freezing him in ice, but the prince overpowered her when the sun rose and kidnapped the Avatar. Katara and her allies searched for and found Aang in the frozen landscape outside Agna Kala, and on their return confronted Zhao before the Admiral killed the moon spirit Tui. Failing to revive the dead Koi with healing, Princess Yue realized it was her destiny to give her life to repay the moon spirit, and transcended to the spirit world. Aang won the battle after merging with the ocean spirit La and repelled the Fire Navy from the tribe. With the group now ready to move on and find an earthbending teacher for Aang, Paku assigned Katara as Aang's new waterbending master. Spring 100 AG Katara and the others sailed back to the southern Earth Kingdom so Aang could learn from King Bumi. While they stayed at the Pohuai Earth Kingdom stronghold to be escorted to the city, General Fong placed Katara's life in danger to induce Aang's avatar state, but achieved only the destruction of his own fort. Unbeknownst to them, however, they found that Omashu had fallen to the Fire Nation. In the city, it was revealed that King Bumi had let the Fire Nation conquer his city, and Katara and the rest of the team barely managed to escape Princess Azula, Mei, and Tai Li. The team was later stuck together in the foggy swamp, experiencing hallucinations. Katara's own vision was one of her late mother. Following their escape, the team visited Chin Village, where Aang was placed under arrest for one of Avatar Kyoshi's crimes, and it fell upon the siblings to prove Aang's innocence. Although unsuccessful, they were pardoned after saving the village from the rough rhinos. After the earthbender Toph Bei Fong joined the group to teach Aang, Katara initially quarreled with the new member of the group, but after being pursued by Azula, they began to trust each other more and became close friends. Soon after Toph started teaching Aang earthbending, they were attacked by Fire Army troops and Katara was separated from the rest of the team. She ended up in a small Earth Kingdom town where she encountered and befriended the pirate leader Jiang and her crew after helping them with a smuggling mission. She was reunited with the rest of Team Avatar the same day and parted ways with the pirates. Along with the others and Professor Zay of Ba Sing Se University, Katara visited Wan Shi Tong's library where they learned that an eclipse would leave the Fire Nation vulnerable to invasion. Katara proved vital in Team Avatar's escape from the Siwang Desert after Appa's kidnapping by Siwang tribesmen, and helped a family of refugees cross the Serpent's Pass. After reaching the Earth Kingdom's capital, Katara first helped to thwart another of Chin's plans by helping destroy the Fire Nation drill, before being welcomed into the city. Though they wished to inform the Earth King about the invasion plans, they were turned away, and found that a government conspiracy was taking place in the city. After the team recuperated while waiting to meet with a king, they resumed their search for Appa and eventually found him in the captivity of the Dai Li, a secret police force under the leadership of Long Fang, who had complete control over the city and controlled Earth King Kuei as a puppet. Team Avatar managed to subdue the Dai Li and began to plan an invasion of the Fire Nation in cooperation with the Council of Five, but a coup led by Azula hindered their plans. In the crystal catacombs below the Earth Kingdom Royal Palace, Katara encountered both Prince Zuko and his sister Azula, battling them both even after a brief moment of understanding between Katara and Zuko. A battle ensued where Aang was mortally wounded by Azula's lightning before he and Katara managed to escape. With the city fallen to the Fire Nation, Team Avatar fled Ba Sing Se with the Earth King. Summer 100 AG After the fall of the Earth Kingdom's capital, Katara spent her time trying to heal an unconscious Aang while aboard a stolen Fire Nation ship with the rest of Team Avatar and several other allies, including her own father. Eventually, Katara and the rest of her team traveled through the Fire Nation disguised as civilians. Among several adventures, Katara helped clean the Zhanghui River from pollution after disguising herself as the Painted Lady, and bettered her relationship with Toph when she saved them both from Combustion Man in Fire Fountain City. In one village, Katara met a southern waterbender named Hama and began to learn the southern style of bending from her, but turned on the woman after she revealed that she was a bloodbender. Katara was forced to use the art against Hama in order to save Aang and Sokka from harm. When the day of the invasion arrived, Katara and the rest of the team met with the rest of the invasion force and started to stealthily advance toward the capital via waterbending-powered submarines designed by the Northern Air Temple's machinist. During the eclipse, the invasion advanced steadily towards Caldera City, while Aang reached the Fire Nation Royal Palace. It was quickly revealed that the invasion had been anticipated 
and the Fire Nation's counterattack with airships destroyed much of the invasion force's vehicles, with only Team Avatar and a few younger allies managing to escape on Appa. After the failed invasion, Katara and her friends retreated to the Western Air Temple, where they started searching for a new firebending master to teach Aang, and unexpectedly found one in Zuko, who introduced himself as an ally. The relationship between Zuko and Katara was at first intense and troublesome, with Katara determined to never forgive Zuko for his betrayal in Ba Sing Se. Eventually, Katara forgave Zuko for his actions after he helped to find Yan Ra, the man who killed her mother. Although she did confront the man, she hesitated from ending his life, but was able to move past her grief and her grudge against Zuko. Right before the final battle between Team Avatar and the Fire Nation, Katara and the rest of the team retreated to Ember Island. The team watched a play performed by the Ember Island players, with Katara growing embarrassed and annoyed while viewing an exaggerated caricature of herself. Although the team had wished to only battle Ozai after Sozin's comet, they were made to act against the Fire Lord as soon as possible, after Zuko revealed the plan to annihilate the Earth Kingdom. After Aang's unexpected disappearance, the team traveled to the Earth Kingdom before going separate ways, with Katara and Zuko heading to the Fire Nation to confront Azula. After the pair interrupted Azula's coronation as Fire Lord, a fierce, comet-enhanced Agni Kai was fought between the two siblings. Azula broke the rules by shooting a bolt of lightning at Katara, but she was saved by Zuko who redirected the attack. Katara eventually managed to goad Azula into walking directly over a grate of water. While freezing her opponent in ice, Katara was able to chain the princess to the gate before rushing to Zuko and healing him. She was present at Zuko's coronation after the team's victory in the century-long war. Later, Katara traveled to the Jasmine Dragon with Team Avatar, celebrating their hard-won victory. She followed Aang outside the tea shop and embraced him. The pair subsequently looked at each other lovingly before she instigated a romantic kiss, beginning the couple's formal relationship. In the year following the war's conclusion, Katara and Team Avatar helped Fire Nation colonials resettle in their homeland in the Harmony Restoration Movement. However, when the group came to Yu Dao, they were attacked by Fire Army soldiers and confronted by Zuko. Aang and Zuko began to battle, but Katara managed to calm her boyfriend after he entered the Avatar state. The Fire Lord explained that unlike in the newer colonies, people of the Fire Nation and Earth Kingdom descent had been living together for generations. Katara and the team traveled to Ba Sing Se to discuss the Yu Dao situation with the Earth King, and while waiting, the couple met a group of young women who had devoted themselves to Aang and Air Nomad teachings. Though Katara grew somewhat jealous, she realized they reminded Aang of his people. The couple failed to dissuade the Earth King from attacking the Fire Nation colonies and returned to Yu Dao to evacuate its citizens, where they were confronted by the Yu Dao resistance before they explained the impending attack. When Aang came to the conclusion that the four nations must remain separate after meeting the Air Nomad devotees in Yu Dao, Katara reminded him that the separation was an illusion. As the armies arrived, Katara told him that she saw their own future as a couple of different nations reflected in the families of Yu Dao. As the battle raged on, Katara propelled herself up to the Earth King's war balloon to help convince him that he was fighting a battle against his own nation. After the Earth Kingdom and the Fire Nation agreed to make peace, Katara observed Aang welcome his devotees as the first heir acolytes. Sometime later, Zuko invited Katara, Sokka, and Aang on a search for his mother. As they readied to depart, Katara was horrified to see Azula, apparently escaped, but Zuko explained that she was coming with them in return for obtaining information from Ozai. Katara was unhappy with her coming with the team and helped to apprehend Azula during her psychotic episodes on their journey to Hara. In the town, Katara and Aang were welcomed by Norin and Noriko, with the former telling them that Ursa's lover Ikem headed to Forgetful Valley. As they ventured into the environment, the group was attacked by their surroundings, though Katara deduced that it was the work of a waterbender and Rafa and Misu showed themselves. Another confrontation with Azula was halted by the appearance of the Mother of Faces. The ancient spirit began to battle the group, but it was halted when the spirit was reminded of her son Ko. Rafa's face was restored, and Noriko was given back her memories and appearance as Ursa. Although Azula had escaped, Katara and Aang remained optimistic that she had begun to change. Katara stayed in the Fire Nation for several weeks afterward and comforted Ursa during her anxious return to the Fire Nation capital. The team returned to Yu Dao after the conclusion of peace talks and the formation of the coalition government. After a banquet, she found Aang meditating, who told her that he had seen a vision of Avatar Yang Chen. 
Reminded of Yang Chen's festival, Katara set off with Aang and the Acolytes to pay their respects in the Yue Bay area. Katara consoled Aang when they found an industrial town built on previously sacred ground and was surprised to see her childhood friends Nyok and Nutha in the area. Katara and the team were confronted by Loban's guards and the rough rhinos for trespassing on the earth and fire refinery. She discovered an iron ore mine during the fight, but the area was unstable and began to cave in, with Katara and several others only being saved by Toph's earthbending. With Katara lending her support to Toph, the group was eventually freed with the aid of Aang and Toph's metalbending students. As a dangerous storm brewed on the horizon, Katara helped evacuate the town's houses and businesses before the arrival of General Old Iron. After the spirit's defeat, she reminisced with Neok and Nutha and lent her emotional support to Aang in his challenging situation. Katara and Sokka returned to Ba Sing Se for some time afterward, where they prepared to return home for the first time since they left the South Pole. Katara was surprised to find that their village had grown into an urbanized city, with the Southern Reconstruction Project already underway. The siblings reunited with their grandmother, step-grandfather, and father, and met Malik and Malina, who were managing the redevelopment project. Katara expressed skepticism for the project, as she had seen foreign workers harassing the locals. After Malina was robbed, Katara and Sokka chased the thief to an abandoned ship, where Galak and Thad explained that they believed the foreigners were making them weak and had to be removed. The siblings escaped Galak's men and headed back to the city, where they were surprised to discover their father's romantic relationship with Malina. Katara remained skeptical of both the romance and the project, and also met a pair of children that Paku was trying to train as waterbenders. Aang also arrived in the south, following the end of the great threat in the Fire Nation, as well as Toph, aiding in the construction. At a festival, Galak's men attacked, Chi blocking Katara and stabbing Hakoda. After her father's recovery, Earth King Kuei was kidnapped. Katara participated in the skirmish at the Bridge of No Return, managing to save Melina from falling into a ravine. Afterward, she managed to inspire Siku and Sura to display their waterbending skills. Later, Katara made her way to Yudao with the team, though they stopped at Cranefish Town upon Toph's request. The group was stunned to see the growth of the town in the earth and fire industries, though they learned that the city was threatened with turf wars between bending gangs and an increasing social divide between benders and non-benders. She was awoken by a large explosion at Lao Bei Fong's factory shortly after their arrival and helped to put out the fire. Katara and the rest of the team investigated the perpetrator, which led them to Li Ling and her daughters. Toph had discovered a planned bending supremacist rally, which Katara attended in disguise along with Aang and Toph. Toph confronted Li Ling at the rally, leading to a fight where the businesswoman was captured. Katara and Toph also disagreed whether Aang should remove Li Ling's bending. After the woman escaped, Katara helped to battle Liling's supporters and convinced Aang to stop when he entered the Avatar state to remove Liling's bending. Following Liling's final arrest, the group felt a special connection to the city and decided to stay, helping Cranefish Town grow and prosper into a metropolis later known as Republic City. Sometime after the Harmony Restoration movement, Katara married Aang and gave birth to three children. Bumi, a non-bender who gained the ability to airbend later in life, Kaya, a waterbender, and in 119 AG, Tenzin, who was born an airbender like his father. Katara continued to develop her skills in waterbending, eventually becoming a leading expert in its various styles and respective skills and techniques, as well as being regarded as the best healer in the world. She passed these skills on to Kaya, who became a renowned waterbender in her own right. In 124 AG, Katara wrote a letter to include in the book that Aang was assembling for Tenzin, in which she wished her son the joys of youth and the strength to accept his legacy as one of the world's last airbenders. When Kaya revealed her sexual orientation to her, Katara was supportive of her. In the mid-130s AG, she joined Aang in watching Tenzin and some vandals clear the airbending gates on Air Temple Island. Aang noted that conflict resolution was not always so easy, but Katara told him to settle the easy disputes for now as Tenzin was still young. Before 128 AG, Katara's efforts led to the outlawing of bloodbending in the United Republic. After the passing of Avatar Aang and his reincarnation into the new Avatar Korra, she became the Avatar's waterbending teacher once again. During one of her early training sessions with a young Korra, Katara taught her that waterbending was all about slow and calm movements. Her lesson did not stick with the Avatar, however, as she accidentally bruised Katara under a pile of snow. Not for the first time, when she tried to copy the Elder's moves. 
Uncovering the elder, Sena apologized for her daughter, though Katara brushed it off, noting that she had battled more dangerous waterbenders during her life than the youngster, and expressing her confidence that the Avatar will learn to control her abilities in time. The session got cut short by Tonrock that day, as a snowstorm was heading their way. Upon learning the next day that Korra had snuck out during the bad weather, Katara joined Tonrock and Senna during their search for their daughter. Discovering the young Avatar safe and sound with a polar bear pup whom she desired to keep, Katara took the reluctant Tonrock and Senna aside and convinced them to let her bring the animal home, noting that every Avatar had an animal guide and that raising Naga may be exactly what the high-energy Avatar needed. Afterward, Katara and Korra's waterbending lessons continued. Korra often spent a lot of time in Katara's healing hut growing up, where she taught Korra to heal wounds. Korra eventually became a skilled healer under Katara's instruction. In 170 AG, Katara supervised Korra's firebending test alongside other members of the Order of the White Lotus. She noted the Avatar's ferocity, to which the White Lotus leader responded that she also lacked restraint. After Korra defeated her opponents, the White Lotus turned to Katara for counsel, wondering whether or not they should let Korra start her airbending training with Tenzin, since the young Avatar had yet to grasp the spiritual side of bending. Confident in her son's abilities, Katara announced that she believed Korra to be ready to commence her airbending training, as Tenzin would be able to teach her what she needed to know. When Tenzin and his family arrived at the Southern Water Tribe compound, Katara and Korra greeted Tenzin and his family. At her son's asking, Katara helped Milo off of his head, much to her grandson's displeasure. As she expressed her joy over seeing her family again, Janora approached her, informing her that she had read everything about her past adventures and asked what happened to Zuko's mother, Ursa. Katara attempted to elaborate, only to be interrupted by an excited Iki, who fired several random questions at the old waterbender. As the young airbenders ran off to play in the snow, Katara turned her attention to Tenzin and Pema, the latter being pregnant with their fourth child. She predicted that the child would be an airbender, much to Pema's dismay, who explained that it would be nice to have a non-bending child like her. When asked if Tenzin and his siblings were as rambunctious as the young airbenders, Katara said that Tenzin had always been more serious than Kaya and Bumi. When it was revealed that Korra's airbending training with Tenzin was to be delayed, and the Avatar decided to find her own path by traveling to Republic City on her own, Katara was the only one who understood that Korra had to go and find her own place in the world. Confident in Korra, she gave her husband's reincarnation her blessing. Months later, after Korra's bending had been removed by Amon, Katara tried using her healing powers to restore Korra's abilities, but to no avail. She later witnessed Korra, whose bending was restored by Aang, energy bend Lin Bei Fong, restoring her earthbending abilities. Six months later, Katara invited her oldest son, Bumi, to attend the Glacier Spirits Festival with her and the rest of her family. She, alongside her daughter, awaited the arrival of her sons at the dock, having a joyful reunion with her grandchildren. She later attended the royal banquet in honor of Chief Unalak, sitting at a table with her family, where she looked on with concern as Tenzin was being picked on by his elder siblings. The next day, Katara encouraged Tenzin to take his siblings along with him on his trip to see all the air temples reasoning that he should cherish the time he spends with his entire family. She also felt that the three siblings should visit Aang's birthplace together. Tenzin agreed to let his siblings join him and gave his mother a farewell hug, promising to see her soon. Before they all left, she gave Kaya an old family picture of their family together while they were still young. During the Water Tribe Civil War, Katara did not interfere between the two combating parties, believing her fighting days to be over and instead helped tend to injured rebels along with several other healers in her healing hut. She was sought out by her family who brought a spiritless Janora for her to examine. Alarmed over the amount of time Janora had been in that state, Katara placed her granddaughter in a bath of water to heal. Assessing the situation with her bending, she stated that she was unsure how much longer Janora would be able to survive with her body and spirit separated, noting that Janora was strong to have lasted as long as she had. When Janora's spirit later returned to her body, Katara happily embraced her granddaughter and later accompanied her and her family to Korra's announcement that peace was restored between the Southern and Northern Water Tribes, and that the South was officially independent. Five weeks after the insurrection of the Red Lotus was put down, Katara was visited by a still-injured Korra and set out to heal her. Katara commented that the mercury poisoning Korra had suffered had caused a lot of internal damage. Upon being asked if she could heal it, she remarked that all she could do was help guide the young Avatar's healing process, though the ultimate result of that was out of her hands. 
Reminiscing on the feeling of going through a traumatic experience, she told Cora that if she dedicated herself to getting better, she would recover stronger than ever. The two waterbenders set out on the hard process of recovery. Progress was slow, however, and after nearly six months, a frustrated Cora snapped at Katara over the Elder's inability to heal her. Katara tried to console her, stating that it was all right and urging her to let her anger and frustration flow like water. When Korra admitted that she was tired of the situation, Katara told her that she was not the first Avatar who had to overcome great suffering. She recalled how Aang felt about the destruction of his entire culture and revealed that he had sought meaning in his suffering, which eventually led to peace. She urged Korra to do the same and guided her to take her first steps again in a long time. Katara continued to help Korra over the next two years until she was physically fit again, which is the last time we see Katara. However, she does get another mention afterwards from Toph, who says that old age was the main reason she didn't interfere with the Water Tribe Civil War. What ifs are a fun and fascinating way to find out what might happen to a specific world with the flap of a butterfly's wings. This flap is a big one, but it definitely causes some interesting changes. What if Azula killed Aang? Strap in, folks. We all remember that scene that made us think that the Kazuka, that is, Katara X Zuko ship, was setting sail. In the final episode of the Book of Earth, Zuko is thrown in prison with Katara. After some talking, Katara begins to believe Zuko to be as much a victim as anyone else, and she is about to heal the scar on his eye with the spirit water. But before she does, Team Avatar arrives. It's at around this time that Azula appears and offers Zuko the one thing he has always desired, his honor. In the end, his weakness and inability to let go of his own desires forces him to accept her offer, and the two of them face off against Aang and Katara. Aang enters his avatar state to fight against them, but is wounded in the back by Azula's lightning and falls to the ground, dying. Uncle Iroh steps in between his niece and nephew to protect Katara and Aang as they get away and while escaping on Appa's back, she uses this spirit water to heal and revive Aang. Unable to reach the Avatar state but alive, the story continues as you know. But a question that has crossed all of our minds as we watched this episode was a simple one. What if Aang really had died? What would have happened then? Well, I hope to answer this question today with logic as well as a healthy amount of headcanon. So make sure to grab your cactus juice as we quench your thirst for answers with the quenchiest of what ifs. I'm Jeremy, and this is What If Azula Killed Aang. So, our what if starts in a very familiar way. Katara and Zuko are in prison, and Zuko is spilling his life story and identifying with her. She offers to heal his scar. This is the divergence point. For our purposes today, we'll say that Team Avatar took longer than expected to find them, and Katara actually went through with it. She would have expended that miracle juice to take away Zuko's scar, and then they are found by Team Avatar. After this, everything goes the same. Azula convinces Zuko to join her, Aang faces off against Zuko and Azula, and Katara faces off against the agents of the Dai Li. Aang ends up struck in the back by Azula's lightning and falls. Iroh appears to defend Aang and Katara as they escape, and is captured by the Fire Nation. Aang and Katara escape on Appa. Aang is wounded, but can't be healed. Katara realizes that if she had the spirit water, she could have healed him, but she already used it on Zuko. It was this moment when the world needed the Avatar most and he has vanished, and it was her fault. Now, to pull out of our little story for a second, I need to explain this to you right quick. Now, most fans of Avatar know this, but for those who either didn't or don't remember, when an Avatar is killed while using the Avatar state, it ends the Avatar reincarnation cycle. If Aang had been killed normally here, he would have reincarnated into his next life as a certain waterbending girl with a pet polar bear dog. But this wasn't a normal death. Aang had been killed in the Avatar state, meaning that he cannot reincarnate ever again. The Avatar is lost to the world forever. This will upset a lot in the world of Avatar, but for the sake of this story, we'll focus on just Avatar The Last Airbender. Depending on how it floats over, we may continue into the Legend of Korra's era with a part two, but for now, we're just going to focus on The Last Airbender. The story picks up on a stolen Fire Nation warship. Sokka and Katara are reunited with their father, Hakoda. Despite Aang's death, as well as the dethroning of the Earth King, it is still paramount that they plan for the Day of Black Sun. Hope is dwindled to a minimum, but they still plan to try. If they do nothing, then the Fire Nation's rule of the Earth will go uncontested, 
and the world will fall under the tyranny of a cruel dictatorship. Jumping to said dictatorship, Zuko and Azula return home. As usual, Zuko has butterflies due to not seeing his father in a long time. Zuko is welcomed by his father, who notes Zuko's lack of a scar, as well as the death of the Avatar, to be the symbolism of his regaining of honor. Zuko realizes that he has been credited with killing the Avatar, which is unlike Azula to allow, considering that she was the one who killed him. Zuko's distrust of Azula causes him to believe that she is using him for her own purposes, which she denies. Iroh in the meantime begins intensively training and building strength in anticipation of escape. We also get the beach day episode and none of that changes really. They still trash the house. <laughs> kids will be kids, you know? After this, Zuko learns the truth that Avatar Roku was his own great-grandfather, which means he helped to kill his own family member's reincarnation. Iroh says that this symbolizes the battle within Zuko's heart to restore balance as well. Zuko's lack of comfort continues to increase with his paranoia brought on by distrust of Azula. He is seated next to his father and sister during the war meeting, but he doesn't feel like himself. He leaves a letter for May and spills his heart to his mother's portrait and decides to finally choose the side his heart has been leading him to all along. He grabs his swords and sets out to confront Ozai. Meanwhile, what is left of Team Avatar Let's call it Team Sokka now, just because Sokka deserves more respect. Meanwhile, Team Sokka reunites with all those they had helped in the previous seasons and begins their invasion, hoping that the Day of Black Sun will give them the opportunity they need to end the Fire Lord's reign and defeat the Fire Nation. They fight to the capital city, but it is abandoned. As it turns out, Azula already knew of the plan and so the Fire Lord had been moved. They seek Ozai in a hidden bunker, but find only Azula who stalls them until the end of the eclipse. Zuko engages his father, but during this time, he is told the story of what happened to his mother, which stalls him long enough for the eclipse to end. Ozai attacks his son, but Zuko escapes. He steals an airship and follows Team Sokka who escape. Realizing that their plan had failed and that their father and the rest of the resistance were captured, Team Sokka falls into hopelessness. Zuko eventually arrives on the scene to help, but is completely turned down by the group. Katara blames him for Aang's death, as do the others. Zuko admits that if he had been stronger that day and done the right thing, maybe things would be different now. Perhaps they could have ended the Hundred Year War on the Day of Black Sun if only he had, like Iroh, chosen to stand for what he knew was right, instead of what he wanted to do personally. The team, however, still do not trust him and even go so far as to attack him in retribution for what happened to Aang, but Zuko escapes. Now this is where we reach an issue. Realistically, Zuko joining the group at this juncture is a near impossibility, but for the sake of the story, we'll do something to get him on. Despite Katara having used up the spirit water on his eye, we'll say that Zuko assumed that she had more and still hires Combustion Man to hunt Team Sokka, despite Aang having been dead. So now we'll say that Combustion Man finds them, and Zuko appears to selflessly help them and protect them. Combustion Man ends up defeated due to the help of Zuko, and the affection that Appa shows toward him, as well as Toph's insistence that they literally have nothing to lose, convinces everyone to allow Zuko onto Team Sokka. After discussing the coming of Sozin's Comet, as well as Zuko's connection to Avatar Roku by three generations, they begin to form New Hope, believing that they can instead use the comet at the end of the summer as a benefit to them instead of a time constraint. They decide to place their faith in Zuko and consider him to be the spiritual successor to Aang. Katara is still hesitant to trust him though and continues to seethe in anger, which Sokka understands, but reminds her that he currently is their last and final hope to stop the Fire Nation, and essentially tells her to suck it up until the end of the war. But it's not long that Zuko finds that he has lost his ability to firebend, which causes the team to lose hope once more. <laughs> Roller coaster, am I right? Toph suggests that they should instead look to the originators of firebending in hopes that they will be able to help Zuko find something else to fuel his fire besides the rage he has relied on. She tells them a story on how she learned to earthbend from badger moles who were blind like she was. Zuko tells them that dragons were believed to be the originators of firebending, but that they all died out. Unable to think of anything else, Zuko decides he wants to search for the ruins of the Sun Warriors to learn more about the history of firebending, in hopes that this will help him regain the fire in his belly, which has seemingly gone out. They travel to the Sun Warrior ruins. Toph, with her earth sensing, manages to discover traps in the ruins and begins to point out where they are, and helps Team Sokka avoid it. 
they come across a mural of a sun warrior facing two dragons. Sokka thinks it's awesome and begins to really want to see a dragon himself, but Zuko crushes this dream by saying it was a long-standing tradition in the Fire Nation to hunt dragons and that they all died, with the last surviving one having been killed by Iroh, the last bearer of the title Dragon. They explore the ruins and find a massive locked door. They manage to fool the gem thingy by reflecting light onto it and enter the ruins. They are confronted by the Sun Warriors, who are shown to have survived. They task Zuko with taking some of the first fire up to the firebending masters, Ran and Shaw. From here, Zuko learns the truth behind firebending and finds his power restored. Then after this, the Boiling Rock two-parter happens, but nothing changes in it essentially, so there's no need to go deep into it. The next episode begins when the Fire Nation war balloons attack the group. Zuko attempts to hold Azula off while the others escape, but they refuse to do so as Zuko is currently their only hope. While Zuko manages to fight on even grounds with Azula, he is aided by the others and manages to defeat her. She attempts a surprise attack on Zuko, but Katara's reflexes catch her before she can, and she strikes the princess, knocking her from the ship. Azula falls through the mist to her death. The team manages to escape from the fleet, Katara realizes what she did, and wonders how Zuko is taking it. Zuko seems to be unaffected by it, stating that she always was evil from the day he met her. But deep down, Zuko truly hurts, as, despite her having been evil to the core, he did care for her. They escape to Ember Island, where they stay at the Fire Lord's beach house. Katara manages to find Zuko outside crying and begins to feel bad. She begins to realize that she took his sister just as the Fire Nation took her mother, and finally decides to trust Zuko and forgive him for what he did in betraying her trust at Ba Sing Se. Later, Zuko speaks with them, mentioning how if he could barely defeat Azula by himself, he has no chance at beating Ozai, and states that the only person he thinks could do it would be Iroh, so they search for Iroh with the help of June. They eventually find themselves with the Order of the White Lotus, which is run by Iroh, with its main members being King Bumi, Zhang Zhang, Master Paku, and Master Pian Dao, with Iroh serving as their Grand Master. Meanwhile, at the palace, Ozai is infuriated with the death of his daughter at Zuko's hands and curses that he no longer has an heir to the throne. Zuko apologizes to Iroh and begs his forgiveness, only to be immediately forgiven before he can even get the words out of his mouth. He asks Iroh to fight Ozai, and Iroh states that he is not sure he can beat him. He states that his time has come and gone, and now it is Zuko's turn. He says that as Zuko is the great-grandson of Avatar Roku, that the Avatar's duty falls to him, and that he must make things right. He states that he has reclaimed his own honor in defying his father, and must now reclaim the Fire Nations in defeating him too. Zuko hesitantly agrees. He realizes that if it had not been for him, Aang would still be here, and they would have had a better chance. He also knows that his uncle is correct in stating that it is now his responsibility. Zuko is not only responsible for the Avatar's death, but is also the descendant of the Avatar, and thus his duty is clear. It's decided that Zuko will face his father in battle while Katara, Toph, Suki, and Sokka deal with the airships. While they are doing this, Iroh plans to lead the Order of the White Lotus to Ba Sing Se, where they will recapture the city. At this time, Sozin's comet arrives and Ozai makes preparations to use it to destroy the Earth Kingdom once and for all as to stop them from rising up against him and contesting his rule of the world in the future. Team Sokka arrives to the airbase and boards the airship. They make it to the bridge where they capture the vessel. Sokka then comes up with an idea of how to get rid of the other crew members, by asking them to go to the bomb bay to celebrate a crew member's birthday. Katara tells him that it will never work, but is pleasantly surprised when it really is a crewmate's birthday and the plan succeeds. Iroh and the Order of the White Lotus manage to liberate Ba Sing Se from the Fire Nation, and Zuko confronts his father, choosing to wear clothes fit for an Agni Kai. Standing upon a rock pillar as his father lays waste to the earth in front of them, Zuko uses his own firebending to disable Ozai's ship and bring him down to their level. Ozai comes down to Zuko's location and begins to speak with him. He angrily accuses Zuko of murdering his sister, to which Zuko does not reply. Ozai tells him that it reminds him of himself when he was younger, to which Zuko denies in disgust. Ozai then goes on to tell him how ironic it was that Zuko spent so many years of his life hunting the Avatar and even killing him only to become him. Zuko reaffirms that he will stop his father's plans and informs him that just as Sozin's Comet has increased Ozai's firebending, it has increased Zuko's as well. 
Ozai laughs at the thought that Zuko considers himself to be on Ozai's level. He then goes on to tell Zuko how this moment reminds him of the Agni Kai they had all those years ago when he banished Zuko. He tells him that at the time he planned to teach him respect when he scarred him for life, but mentions that it seems it didn't take, and that he would need a new scar to remind him to never stand against his father. Zuko dares him to try and the two begin their battle. Back in the sky, Team Sokka use their airship to destroy the armada by ramming it. Zuko and Ozai fight, but it's clear Ozai has the edge. Zuko has to continuously retreat from attacks which Ozai mocks him for running away, and being just as much of a coward he was all those years ago. The battle escalates quickly and Zuko finds he is no match for his father. His father tells him that he will teach Zuko respect through pain once more and drag him back to the Fire Nation where he will torture him day and night until he learns to respect him. And only when Zuko is as cruel and unforgiving as Azula was when he will allow him to come out. Zuko says he'll die before he becomes like Azula, and Ozai decides to take that bluff and charges a lightning attack, sending it at Zuko to execute him. However, Zuko recalls the technique his uncle taught him and catches the lightning. It electrocutes his body with its sheer force, but he manages to redirect it to the tip of his finger. Looking into the eyes of his surprised father who realizes the position he is in, Zuko knows he is about to kill the last surviving member of his immediate family. Zuko laments this, but knows it is the only thing he can do, and if he were to let this golden opportunity pass, Zuko would find himself dead, and Ozai would completely destroy the Earth Kingdom, and finally succeed in subjecting the world under the flag of the Fire Nation. Zuko closes his eyes and fires the lightning back at Ozai, striking him and killing him. Zuko, exhausted from his fight, falls over and passes out. The story skips to a few days later where Zuko is crowned as the new Fire Lord and declares an end to the Hundred Year War. Once returning into the palace, he looks at a portrait of his family and seems completely upset that his family has died, but wonders if his mother remains out there somewhere, still exiled as he was, and hopes to find her. Mei appears behind him and the two reconcile. Sometime later, Team Sokka all meet up at Iroh's tea shop where they celebrate a toast to Aang who even in death managed to inspire people and bring balance back to the world, fulfilling the Avatar's mandate to protect the balance. Stepping outside to watch the sunset, Iroh comes to him and talks to him about the big decision he had to make. He tells his nephew that it is unfortunate, but in that moment Zuko did not kill Ozai. Ozai killed himself with his own power. Zuko just stood as resistance. Zuko nods, but asks why it doesn't make him feel any better. Iroh replies with, it's because you're still human. Iroh promises to stand with Zuko for as long as he is alive, offering wisdom, though he no longer thinks his nephew needs it. And the series closes. If you're watching this video, you're probably an Avatar fan. And if you're an Avatar fan, you probably know that there are new shows and a movie on the horizon. Yep, we've got a brand new series taking place some hundred years after The Legend of Korra featuring a brand new earthbending avatar. Plus, there's the live action series coming to Netflix, which seems a little less scary now considering the success that One Piece has seen, and a feature length flick revolving all around a grown up gang. All of this spells good things for the future of the series, but they gotta make sure they don't fall down some of the pitfalls that have been seen in the past. You know, there was that live action movie that we don't talk about. Here's a video outlining what we'd like to see left out of anything new. It's the seven worst changes in The Last Airbender. With plenty of new content in development surrounding Avatar The Last Airbender, we figured it would be a good idea to do something of a little retrospective here. Not necessarily debating how good the show was, but what lessons can be learned from the 2010 movie. There were a lot of changes made from the show, and while that is necessary in an adaptation, a lot of them were most definitely the wrong call. So today, we're going to dive in and analyze how and why that is the case. I'm Jeremy Freed with Channel Frederator, and now, in no particular order, this is the top seven worst changes in The Last Airbender. One, whitewashing the cast and getting rid of the historical perspective. Let's get the really obvious one out of the way first. There's been talk surrounding whitewashing in movies going on for half a century now, and even though it became a much more prominent cultural conversation over the past few years, even back in 2010 this was wildly inappropriate. And just to make matters worse, here are two things making the problem so much more pronounced. 
The show it is based on is widely praised for its exploration of Eastern cultures. So to see that aspect of the show get watered down by a studio to what they think will appeal to a majority audience is a real kick in the teeth. Second, I am fairly confident when saying that this was a studio decision because all of the extras and even supporting characters aren't whitewashed to nearly the same degree. The water tribes do appear to be mostly Inuit and Yupik people. The Earth Kingdom does largely consist of Asian people and so forth. But this only highlights how bad the lead actors were cast, as the movie itself is living proof that they could have easily found ethnically appropriate actors for the main characters. The main exception to this is the Fire Nation, which seems to be switched from taking influence largely from Japan in the show to India and Near East regions of Asia in the movie. And the casting is done with the right consideration for ethnical origin, so in theory this should just be a neutral change, but it isn't. The creators of the show weren't just throwing darts when they decided to base the Fire Nation largely on Japan. It's to get historical reference. Sozin's idea of sharing the prosperity of the Fire Nation with the rest of the world bears more than a passing resemblance to Japan's ideas prior to World War II and their justification for invading large swaths of Asia. By changing the ethnicity of the Fire Nation for the movie, you lose this kind of historical analogy. On its own, it's not a huge loss, and a better movie could have recovered from that. But as it is, it's just one more straw that ended up breaking the camel's back. 2. Making bending less powerful. One of the easiest things to make cool on screen should be the bending, telekinetically controlling the four classical elements. So how on earth they managed to screw it up so badly is anybody's guess. Firebending definitely bore the brunt of this one, going from a scenario where they can generate fire at will to needing a source like all the other elements. On the one hand, it's an adaptation. Changes need to be made in order to keep it fresh and interesting. So in theory, making a change like this isn't the worst idea. But once again, it falls apart on execution. This one just makes firebending much less of a threat, because hey, if there's no fire nearby, you're completely safe. Also, it loses something that Zhao mentions in the show. Namely, that at least part of the reason firebenders feel superiority over the other elements is because they are the only ones who can generate theirs spontaneously. On top of that, the moves required in the movie compared to the show are a bit… silly. The actors have to wave their arms around for what feels like ages before something happens, whereas in the show it's just one or two moves. The infamous scene of it taking seven earthbenders to move one pebble shouldn't need me to explain why it's hilarious. And at times, there's an odd delay in the moves they make and the effects happening. It's almost like the stunt coordinator fell asleep at the helm, and feels much less focused than the show. For the creation of the show, Sifu Kisu ran them through the motions of real martial arts, which the animators could use as reference, but again, one more loss. 3. Making all the animals look scary and other design elements. This movie is a harsh lesson in the old rule of thumb. A 3D render converted to a 2D cartoon will generally end up looking cute. A 2D cartoon converted to a 3D render generally looks horrifying. Nice to see that demonstrated so clearly, most prominently with Appa and Momo. Their on-screen presence is already severely cut down in length compared to the show because they have to be fully CGI and that's expensive, but considering how terrifying their designs are, that's probably for the best. Momo's design is based on a real-world lemur, which are kind of creepy with their buggy eyes, but this raises the question, why couldn't they have picked an animal that looks a bit cuter to base the design on? Appa was different there weren't many creatures that could serve as a real-world reference, which the artists have admitted to being part of the reason as to why he was difficult to produce. But again, if they had free reign to design it, why not design something that isn't so scary? There are a lot of other design elements that suffer. Zuko's scar looks nowhere near as gruesome as it did in the show. And while I can understand not wanting to make him look too horrifying in a kid's movie, surely they could have done better than this. And of course, no discussion of this movie's design choices is complete without mentioning that Yue's hair now looks like… well, like what everyone says it looks like. The most amazing part to me is not just that design choice making it past who knows how many layers of producers, executives, and costume artists, but rather who they stuck it to. That's Seychelle Gabriel, who would later go on to voice Asami in The Legend of Korra. Guess she forgave Nickelodeon for her… Disturbing haircut. 4. 
compressing the runtime. One of the things that always strikes me odd about The Last Airbender is how short this movie is. Without credits, the movie clocks in at just over 90 minutes, which is incredibly short given that they had nearly eight hours of material to adapt from the first season of the show. Sure, some episodes should have been cut, but that doesn't excuse how even by the standards of kids' movies, this is very short. And I don't know where to place the blame for this. The director had mentioned in an interview that the script that he initially wrote would have turned into a movie that would have made Lord of the Rings feel short. So obviously cuts had to be made. But who exactly decided what should be cut and where is not really clear. According to Shyamalan, the script turned a lot more serious, as one of the main things they cut was Team Avatar joking around and a bunch of the humor. You know, like they do in the show. And this is a nice lead-in to... 5. Writing on the characters This is probably the main problem with the movie. The creepy animals, the lackluster bending, the stiff acting, and maybe even the whitewashing could have been forgiven had the characters been well written. And they just aren't. Shyamalan both wrote and directed the movie, which is a dangerous combination because it removes a step of quality control. What's more, he mostly made slow-paced intrigues, so the shift to a high fantasy adventure movie for children was quite a big one, and he definitely wasn't the right director. But that still doesn't excuse how badly these characters are written. Katara and Sokka are wildly different than in the show, her being forced to grow up early through the horrors of war, and him trying to be taken more seriously, yet still having a witty sense of sarcasm, and both of them get boiled down to boring sticks in the mud. Aang should be torn between his duties as the Avatar and wanting to have fun, but he just comes off as an insecure twerp, largely because of the casting. Noah Ringer wasn't an actor. He was mainly cast because of his martial arts skills and the fact that he sort of looks like Aang. Zuko gets off best, but is still missing the intrigue, and Iroh's patronly wisdom and deep love for his misguided nephew gets reduced to nothing but an exposition vessel. All of the characters suffer from that. Going back to the point of this movie being way too short for it to fit every plot point of the show into a movie with less than a quarter of the runtime. The moment that truly sums this up in the movie is in the Southern Air Temple, where Katara still has to ask Aang his name. Are they seriously trying to make us care for characters who would fly hundreds of miles with a boy they just found in the ice and not once ask him for his name? Because that's what you lose when all the characters get turned into exposition vessels. You lose their humanity. Explaining the plot is more important to the filmmakers than the main characters behaving like human beings. 6. Choice of Episodes to Adapt but that brings us to the section where we get to delve a little into some constructive criticism, namely by asking how this might have worked. With a better writer and director, could this have been turned into a functional movie? Probably not, given the episodes that they chose to adapt for the movie. First two episodes? Obviously. Last two? Sure. But then they also choose to do Imprisoned. I guess that was to show the brutality of the Fire Nation's war effort? Hard to say. It comes across as very low effort, given that in the show, the Earthbenders are taken to a metal rig, whereas here they're surrounded by Earth. Why would they need Aang to motivate them to break out of here? And then they compress the storm, or at least Zuko's half of that episode, into a quick exposition dump from a random passerby, turning something intensely personal for Zuko into what appears to be common knowledge, even in the Earth Kingdom. Yes, this part 100% needs to be in the movie, but the reason The Storm is one of the best episodes in the show is because it paints Zuko and Aang as parallels rather than opposites. Aang gets the next scene, moving his half of that same episode to the Northern Air Temple, but okay. And he also explains his backstory to a random passerby. And for his trouble, he gets sold out to the Fire Nation. And this is after Katara already explains half of it in a sentence and half in narration when they're on their way to the Southern Air Temple. So this movie manages the impressive feat of giving us at once too much and not enough backstory. The Waterbending Master is another episode which gets the exposition dump treatment, as rather than showing us that Sokka and Yue hit it off really well, Katara tells us in another voiceover, and then it's off to the races for the invasion of the Northern Water Tribe. It ticks every single box of bad filmmaking, and the fact that it does so working off of one of the best cartoons ever made is just depressing. 7. 
trying to show off with one-take action scenes. Speaking of bad filmmaking, let's dive into the action scenes for a bit, because they all fall into the same trap. As mentioned before, the bending already appears to be lackluster due to the design and the frequently weird delay between moves and something happening, but definitely compounding this issue is the fact that for whatever reason, the director wanted to have the action scenes done in one take. This would be incredibly difficult under the best of circumstances, which is why you don't normally see this. The show is a great example, where they use editing and shifts in perspective to make it feel less visceral and fast-paced. And remember, that's in a cartoon, where every frame has to be drawn by hand and the director has infinitely more control over everything on screen than they would have in live action. The result is that for long periods of time, the actors just have to stand there, waiting for the camera to move into position, killing the pacing and making them look like fools. Alright, it's Korra time! We started the video with an Avatar The Last Airbender timeline, so we're gonna kick off this section with the complete Legend of Korra timeline. Enjoy! I found my water drive scarf, which I'm gonna try to put on without ruining all of the audio coming from the mic. It's also a thousand degrees, so I'm gonna record the rest of this video in the booth where it's colder. Korra, the woman, the bender, the legend, literally. The Legend of Korra covered a lot of ground in its four seasons, and I know, only four seasons with our favorite fiery, hot-headed protagonist. Cue the waterworks. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and we said we were gonna do it, so here it is, the complete Legend of Korra timeline. If you're watching this video and you haven't seen our last Avatar video we did about The Last Airbender, you should go watch that just so that you'll get the full Avatar timeline experience experience from us. And going forward, we're going to presume that you've already seen that video or have seen Avatar The Last Airbender. We're, we're not going to explain who certain characters are, you know? And also, you know, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon for notifications and you know all this stuff. All right. Before we get started, we want to give a special thanks to our sponsor, Audible. Stay tuned to the end of the video for some Legend of Korra themed recommendations from the Audible library. Real quick, we have decided in this video to omit a lot of the B-plot romantic storylines because those could just be put in their own video entirely. And I mean, to be fair, we didn't really spend a whole lot of time on that in the last video either. Remember when Suki just kind of turned up out of nowhere Nowhere, right at the end of the series. All right, tangent done, and with Aang gone, let's get to this new avatar that I've heard so much about. Book one, Air. As a toddler, Korra discovers that she's the next avatar, an all-powerful bender capable of wielding all four elements. The Order of the White Lotus visits the Southern Water Tribe to confirm her powers and finds out that their next avatar is a high-energy, headstrong little girl. But as Korra says in episode one, she's the avatar and you gotta deal with it. Speaking of avatars, remember Aang, everyone's favorite airbender and avatar from the original series? Well, he and Katara unsurprisingly had kids. Eldest son Boomy, named after his childhood friend who became a commander of the United Forces, Forces, daughter and renowned healer Kaya, and last but not least, Tenzin, who became an airbending master just like his old man. Tenzin visits Korra's tribe to begin her training as an airbender, but he's abruptly called back to Republic City for political reasons, Republic City being the capital city of the United Republic of Nations founded by Fire Lord Zuko and Avatar Aang, a bustling city where all are welcome. After Tenzin's departure, Korra, now a young woman, already adept in the ways of waterbending, earthbending, and firebending, loads up her polar bear dog Naga and heads to Republic City to pursue her airbending bending training, you know, to round out the set. Until she promptly gets arrested, that is. In her defense, she was trying to stop a crime. What's a little massive collateral damage now and again? Lin Bei Fong, daughter of everyone's favorite blind bandit Toph, has become the city's chief of police. Lin warns her to keep her head down. So Korra signs up for the extremely high profile sport of pro bending, where teams try to knock each other out of a ring in front of roaring crowds. Brothers Mako and Bo Lin welcome her onto their team, the fire ferrets, after their waterbender quits. Mako handles firebending, Bolin takes care of the earth, and Korra gets back to basics as a plain old waterbender. Even after she outs herself as the avatar, she's allowed to continue so long as she only uses waterbending. The fire ferrets make it to the championships, but they need to raise hella coin to buy in, so Bolin takes up a gig with a gang called the Triads. When he goes missing, Mako and Korra's daring rescue lands them in a turf war between the Triads and the Equalists, a group that strongly opposes the use of bending at all, believing that for everyone to truly be equal, 
rule, bending must be eradicated. Mid-fight, Korra has her first run-in with Chi blocking, a powerful attack that leaves her temporarily unable to use her bending, naturally. Chi and Mako track the goons to a rally led by Amon, an equalist rocking a totally sweet mask. Amon trumpets his anti-bending rhetoric and demonstrates his ability to remove someone's bending, a power only performed previously by the Avatar. When the town council hears about a revolution brewing, Councilman Tarlock starts a special task force to take down the equalists. Korra initially refuses to join, but Tarlock ambushes her and forces her into it. The task force enjoys a successful first raid, giving Korra the guts to challenge Amon to a solo duel on Aang Memorial Island. Now, I know I said I wouldn't get into the relationship stuff, but Mako does have a meet-cute with Asami Sato, heiress to the future industry's fortune. Her father offers to sponsor the Fire Ferrets, securing their spot in the finals. Now that the Fire Ferrets' very important and pressing financial problems are settled, back to the quashing of the, this underground revolution or whatever. Korra shows up for her fight with Amon, only to be ambushed by a group of Chi blockers and sent crawling back to the city. Amon promises a confrontation and broadcasts threats before the final match, demanding the city end pro-bending. But what's gonna let a little bit of terror threats get in the way of sports, right? Well, turns out, Amon wasn't kidding. The final match is swarmed by Chi blockers, Amon gives a speech to the bending elite, but while he's busy monologuing, Lin saves Korra. Tarlock blames Lin for not protecting the city and calls for her resignation. With her job on the line, Lin puts on her detective hat and finds equalist propaganda and Chi blockers in the Cabbage Corp warehouse! Oh my god, the while staying at the Sato house, Korra overhears Mr. Sato conspiring about the Cabbage Corp cover-up on the phone. An informant confirms Korra's fears and reveals a secret equalist hideout beneath the Sato mansion. Team Avatar 2.0 finds out it's a trap, a cellar made of pure platinum, a metal immune to bending. Mr. Sato is waiting for them down there, along with a horde of platinum mecha tanks. Asami learns that her father is an equalist, radicalized by the death of his wife at the hands of a bender. He only sponsored the Fire Ferrets as a way to set up Korra for the attack on the stadium. Everyone fights, it gets messy, as you'd expect, and the Fire Ferrets and friends barely escape. Lin decides to resign as police chief so she can pursue the Equalists outside of the law. Her replacement, Sai Khan, is essentially a puppet for Tarlock's task force. Suspicious. This pushes Korra over the edge and she quits her task force gig. To get some much needed distance, Mako, Asami, and Bolin move in with Korra and Tenzin on Air Temple Island. Later, the group goes into the city to beat up some Equalists, as you do. As soon as they round up a group of jailbreakers, Tarlock shows up and tells them to get out of his way. The next day, Tarlock sets a new law to outlaw equalist and puts a mandatory curfew on any non-benders. Team Avatar responds to a report of armed and dangerous equalists only to find the police forces rounded up a group of non-benders and cut off power to their neighborhood. When Korra tells Tarlock to let them go, he escalates. Korra and her friends fight back, which gets them arrested. She goes with Tenzin to Sai Khan to get her friends released, but Sai Khan refuses, so Korra goes to confront Tarlock personally. They fight, and in a shocking twist, Tarlock overpowers her with bloodbending, kidnaps her, and traps her in a platinum box. Box. On the bright side, that gives Korra some alone time to meditate on visions of past incarnations that have been bubbling up. She visits the memories of Aang arresting the crime boss Yakone, a bloodbender with the unique ability of being able to bloodbend without the aid of a full moon, though Aang took his bending away like Amon did at the rally. And what do you know, it turns out that Yakone is Tarlok's father. Tarlok frames the Equalists for kidnapping Korra, Lin breaks Bolin, Mako, and Asami free from jail to retrace the path where the Equalists took Bolin before the rally, hoping to find Korra. Instead, they find the Equalist prison where Lin's captured officers are being held and uncover Tarlock's lie. They rescue the officers and break out of the prison to hunt down Tarlock. Tenzin, Lin, and Team Avatar minus Korra accuse Tarlock of taking Korra, but he just bloodbends his way out and returns to the Platinum Box. And it's a shame that Metal isn't soundproof because he monologues at Korra about his father and his plan to skip town with her as a hostage. Amon shows up and Tarlock bloodbends Amon's chi blockers, but it has no effect on Amon himself, who promptly takes Tarlock's bending, but Korra escapes with Naga. With Team Avatar and Lin out of the city, the Equalists target and capture all of the council members except Tenzin. Amon moves into the city with airships and bombs the streets. Tenzin wires the General of the United Forces right before the power goes out. Equalists gas the building, forcing Tenzin and the police to evacuate, but they encounter mecha tanks and are taken hostage. Before they can drive away, the reunited Team Avatar rescues Tenzin. His wife, Pema, goes into labor as Amon's forces descend on Air Temple Island. She gives birth to Rohan while Lin and the other children fight off the Equalists, but the airships keep coming and everyone evacuates Air Temple Island. Lin, who is riding with Tenzin and his family, chooses to sacrifice herself to destroy the airships hunting Tenzin. Unfortunately, Amon captures 
captures her and takes away her bending. By the time General Iroh of the United Forces sends troops to Republic City, Amon has taken over and has made all bending illegal. And no, not that Iroh, this Iroh is Zuko's grandson, though he is voiced by Dante Bosco, who played Zuko in the original series, so now this is just needlessly confusing. The Equalists engage with the United Forces and get the upper hand. Korra saves General Iroh from the ensuing wreckage, and he, Asami, and Bolin head towards Mr. Sato's secret airfield to sabotage the Equalist aircraft. Meanwhile, Korra and Mako go out to fight Amon, but instead they find an imprisoned Tarlock who reveals that Amon is his brother, a Northern Water Tribe member and fellow bloodbender. Their father, Yakone, was abusive and asked them to practice bloodbending on each other. Tarlock wouldn't do it, so when Yakone tried to bloodbend Tarlock as punishment, Amon, aka Noah Tuck, his real name, stepped in and bloodbent? Bloodbended? Amon did the bloodbending thing to Yakone. Korra and Mako go to Amon's next rally to expose him as a bender, thereby discrediting him to his legions of followers. But mid-plan, Amon takes off his mask to reveal a huge scar across his face. This substantiates the propaganda he told about being attacked by a firebender as a child. Korra and Mako prepare to escape, but then Amon brings up his next group of benders to equalize. It's Tenzin and his family, everyone! Meanwhile, the trio at the Hiroshi airfield have been busy. Mr. Sato intercepted Iroh's SOS message and captured them. Luckily, Naga breaks them out of prison and they chase after the planes and mechatrons headed to intercept the United Forces reinforcements. Bolin and Mako destroy the mechas and the air fleet, and Asami takes her father into custody. Back in the city, Mako and Korra free Tenzin and the kids only to come face to face with Amon. He bloodbends them into submission and takes away Korra's bending abilities, but because Korra hadn't unlocked her airbending power prior to being equalized, it wasn't affected. She's able to use it to punt Amon into a river, which washes away his stage makeup scar. And when he waterbends to save himself in front of all of his equalist followers, it's, uh, it's, it's not a a great look for him. Amon and Tarlock run away together, but Tarlock blows up their boat, killing them both. Team Avatar takes Korra to Katara, but after much effort, she can't heal her bending. After a lot of angst, the spirit of Aang and the other Avatars visit Korra, and she regains her power along with the power to heal others' energy. Korra heals Lin's bending, and they set out to heal the bending of all of those who have had it taken away. Season 1? More like Season Done. Sorry, I'll hand in my resignation after this video. Book 2. Spirits. After defeating Amon and electing Raiko the new president of Republic City, Korra and the Benders travel to the South Pole to the Glacier Spirit Festival. Tenzin wants to take her to see the other air temples so that Korra can continue working on her airbending. They meet Korra's father, Tanrock, and her uncle, the chief of the Northern Water Tribe, Unalak. Oh, and also his two creepy as hell twin children. Their names are Eska and the other one. Actually, for the sake of credibility, I better mention his name is Desna. The whole group of Benders is attacked in the night by an angry spirit. Unalak dispels it using spirit bending and suggests Korra join him in the North Pole to learn airbending and spirit bending from him simultaneously. Tenzin and Tonrock think it's a bad idea, but Korra decides to go anyway, bringing Mako, Bolin, and Asami along, because, like, what else they got going on? That's a rhetorical question. I know Mako's busy doing police stuff. Unalak tells Korra that he wants her to open a portal to the spirit world to stop the Everstorm, a plague of restless spirits which are attacking the Southern Water Tribe. He reveals the Everstorm was started by Korra's dad after he destroyed a spirit force during a barbarian attack. So Korra opens the spirit portal against everyone's advice, naturally. But when they get back to civilization, she finds that Unalak is shipping in fleets of Northern Water Tribe troops to help the Southern Tribe, when all he really wants is a civil war. And boy, how does he get it. But first, Asami and Bolin convince a super rich Southern Tribe shipping millionaire Varric to partner with the failing Future Industries. Varric is only interested in making his movers, though, which is Avatar's version of, you know, movies. That, that, them, them, they're moving, talking pictures. You get it. Anyway, uh, a deal is struck. Back in the South, Unalak jails some Southern rebels and Korra's parents. When Korra steps in, it's revealed that everything, the portal, the civil war, the arrests, were all arranged by Unalak to take control. With Varric's help, Team Avatar jailbreaks everyone and returns to Republic City to get the new president's support for the Southerners' cause. He remains neutral, even when a protest march held by the Southern tribe is bombed. In Republic City, Mako and Asami enlist the Triple Threat Triad to help uncover who's been behind the bombings, but they turn out to be double agents. An encounter with a pyrotechnics expert on one of Varric's movers' sets leads Mako to suspect the mogul, but Varric buys out Future Industries and puts Baby in a corner. And by that, I mean he plants evidence that Mako was the bomber and gets him carted off to jail. Ah, uh, damn, guess we'll never hear from him again. 
During Mako and Asami's crime noir spin-off, Korra is attacked by Unalak's creepy twins, but a dark spirit swallows her before they can end it. Korra washes up on the banks of the Fire Nation with no memory. Eventually, Korra connects with the spirit of the first Avatar, Wan. Remember him from way back at the beginning of our last Avatar video? Anyway, Wan tells her to close the portal for good and then warns her about the dark spirit, Vatu, locked behind the portal during a moment of harmonic convergence. Turns out Unalak's master plan was to use Korra to open both the necessary spirit portals to free Vatu and then fuse with his spirit to become all-powerful because another harmonic convergence is coming up real soon. Korra returns to Tenzin and explains her plan to enter the spirit world and close the portal from the inside. Tenzin reluctantly sends his daughter Jinora to help guide Korra into the spirit world as Jinora has always been particularly attuned to the spirit world. Tenzin finally agrees after repeated assurance from Jinora that they'll be fine. Unalak also insists his twins to help open the portals but with uh, way less regard for their well-being. In the spirit world, Korra and Jinora get separated. Aang's good friend Iroh Yes, that Iroh finds Korra and teaches her that she's a bridge between the spirit world and reality and that her emotions affect reality. Jinora finds a library and hits the books to discover where Vatu is imprisoned, the Tree of Time. Unfortunately, Jinora gets captured by Unalak. There's there's a whole lot of X captures Y in this series. Korra goes to the Tree of Time, but Unalak threatens to trap Jinora forever in the spirit world unless Korra sets Vatu free. She does, but Jinora is stolen by spirits anyway. Unalak's spirit bends Korra, and just when it seems she's done so, a dragon hawk that Korra held heel swoops in and carries her back to reality. Oh, there goes gravity. Sorry. The Northern Water Tribe seems to be winning the Civil War. The attack at the premiere of a mover that Bolin is starring in, just as Varric tries to kidnap President Raiko. Bolin fights them off, though, and rescues the leading lady. And the president, I guess. But this foiled plot still isn't enough to get the president involved in the war, so Tonrock fights Unalak himself. Team Avatar and Tenzin's family get pulled into the fight, as do the twins, but all the good guys are shot down and captured, except for one of our old friends, Boomy. He breaks them out. Korra rushes to enter the spirit world to find Jinora and close the portal, but she's too late. Vatu gets out of the Tree of Time, and now it's final showdown time. Korra must stop Unalak from fusing with Vatu and becoming the Dark Avatar. Korra gets back to her punting ways and punts Unalak out of the spirit world for Mako and Bolin to deal with in the real world, while Tenzin and the adults trek through the spirit forest and ultimately find Jinora. Unalak and twins overpower Mako and Bolin, and Unalak pops back into the spirit world to fuse with Vatu and become the Dark Avatar. I feel like I just said that. It's almost as if that was kind of a pointless diversion. Whatever. Unalak's fusion leaves him with a triple tone voice and spooky red eyes, as you do. Unalak and Korra duke it out in Avatar mode, and the Dark Avatar severs Korra's connection to the spirit inside of her, Rava. Just when it looks like Rava is completely crushed, Tenzin's sister Kaya heals Korra, and she meditates herself into a giant blue glowing astral projection. What else could be next but a traditional kaiju battle? Korra's light overcomes the dark handily, but then things go south. Luckily, Jinora comes down from the sky and shines light into the dark avatar, illuminating Rava and allowing Korra to pull her out of Vatu's grasp. Then Korra tidily spirit bends Vatu and Unalak away and rushes back to the spirit world to fuse with Rava and become the avatar once more. Korra restores order to the world and in a bold move, honestly, decides to keep the portals to the spirit world open so that spirits can just hang with humans. We'll see if that's a good call in book three, which we're gonna do right now. Book three, change! Surprise! It's not a great idea to keep spirits and humans together in the same place. The spirits are growing vines all over the city, and only three weeks after vanquishing Vatu, Korra's approval rating is tanking, and the president banishes her from Republic City. Whoops. More importantly, some people have had airbending abilities awakened in them all throughout the city and world, a mite more than there used to be, which ranged from one to, like, five. So she leaves with Tenzin to find all of the people who woke up with airbending powers. It's, I mean, something to do, right? Meanwhile, a dangerous prisoner named Zaheer breaks out with his his newly acquired airbending skills. Zaheer is part of the Red Lotus, an anarchist group that wants to end the White Lotus and the Avatar altogether. Luckily, Lord Zuko hops on a dragon in an attempt to slow down the Red Lotus. Team Avatar starts off in the Earth Kingdom, where they realize that no one is that jazzed to become part of the newly rebirthed Air Nomads. They do recruit one kid, though, Kai, a wayward youth who turns out to be more trouble than he's worth. When the team gets to Ba Sing Se, still the Earth Nation capital, Mako and Bolin discover that they have an extended family tree. Team Avatar meets with the Queen and slowly finds out that she's been imprisoning new airbenders to form an army. Jinora astral projects and finds where they're hidden under the Earth Temple, and they plan a classic Team Avatar jailbreak. The Queen considers this to be an act of war, joining a log line of Korra's current enemies. Tenzin takes the new airbenders and trains them at the Northern Air Temple, while Korra continues the search. With Zaheer and his minions after Korra, Lin tags along as Korra's bodyguard as they head to Zhao Fu, home of the Metal Clan. There they meet Opal, a new airbender, and Lin's niece. Opal convinces Bolin 
Ren and Korra to learn metal bending while they're there. Back at the Air Temple, Zaheer shows up with a newly shaven head and face under the alias Yoru, hoping to collect intel on Korra. He snoops around Tenzin's study until Kaya recognizes him as Zaheer. They fight, and Zaheer escapes to track down Korra at Zhao Fu. Team Avatar has a run-in with our old pal Varric, who's developing a high-speed rail, or whatever wacky thing he's up to. Lin is stressed and injured, dealing with repressed memories of her half-sister, but they hash it out, and Lin convinces Opal to head to the Air Temple for training. Zaheer and co. make their way to Zhao Fu and try to kidnap Korra. They fail, and Korra learns that Aiwei, the advisor to Lin's half-sister, is in cahoots with Zaheer. Aiwei escapes, and Team Avatar leaves to track him down. Korra chases him to the spirit world, only to come face-to-face -face with Zaheer himself. Zaheer tells Korra that Unalak was part of the Red Lotus, which is why he's after Korra. They want to take out all of the world leaders and establish anarchy. Meanwhile, Asami, Bolin, and Mako battle Zaheer's comrades, trying to protect Korra's physical body, but they're unsuccessful, and they're all kidnapped. What a shock. The Red Lotus has Bolin and Mako, and Asami and Korra are being delivered to the Earth Queen via airship. The Red Lotus meets with the Earth Queen to trade the location of the airbenders and their hostages for Korra. The Earth Queen agrees, but Asami and Korra break out of their prison, and they commandeer the airship, which crashes into the desert. When the Queen cannot produce Korra, Zaheer airbends the air out of the Queen's lungs and suffocates her to death, which is the most metal death I've ever seen portrayed in any show ever. Well, except that it wasn't metal that was used. It, it was... Never mind. It was nuts! He then announces Amon style that the revolution is afoot. Zaheer sends a message to Korra through Bolin. Turn yourself in, or the Red Lotus will take down the Air Temple. Korra and Asami head back into the city on a pretty nifty little sandboat they made together, and I know I said no B-plots, but sparks are flying, y'all! They run into Lord Zuko, Tanrock, and Lin in a desert town. Bolin and Mako break their extended family out of Ba Sing Se and meet up with Korra, so now the whole gang's back together. Everyone heads to Zhao Fu to radio Tenzin and warn him, but they're too late. The Red Lotus has already made it to the Air Temple, and everyone is taken except for Kai. The team hightails it to the Air Temple, and Korra gives herself up in exchange for the airbenders. Zaheer double-crosses her, though. Shocker. And Gazan, the Red Lotus earthbender, traps Team Avatar in the temple. Thankfully, Bolin lava bends to get them out, which was a bold strategy considering Bolin didn't know he could lava bend until right just now. But their efforts are for naught, as Zaheer takes off flying with Korra as his prisoner. Like, literally flying like a dang Dragon Ball Z character. That's what happens when you let go of your earthly tether. Amid all this madness, we're properly introduced to some random captain named Kuvira while holding on a close-up of her for uncomfortably long. Well, that was weird. I don't know why they would do that for some random minor character. Zaheer and his minions metal bend poison into Korra, slowly forcing her into an avatar state so that they can kill her and end the cycle of the avatar. Kai and the gang rush to her aid while the poison Korra experiences hallucinations of her past foes, Amon, Unalak, and Vatu. Korra goes into the avatar state, but she fights back, breaking loose and fighting off each of the criminals. Zaheer tries to airbend the air out of Korra, but all of the airbenders create a massive whirlwind led by Janora, which breaks his concentration. With the aid of the whirlwind, Korra whips her chain around Zaheer's ankle, violently grounding them both. It seems as though Korra is dead, but Lin and her half-sister Suyin metal bend the poison out. Well, most of it at least. In the final moments of the season, Korra is alive, but bound to a wheelchair. Also, Jinora gets her super badass arrow tats, which is something that we can all celebrate. Book 4, Balance. Three years go by. Everyone is moving on with their lives. Mako is the new Earth Prince's bodyguard. The Earth Prince is kind of a dingle. Bolin is working for Kuvira, the interim leader of the Earth Kingdom, who isn't exactly ready to give up her power to this Prince Wu. Oh, I see where this is going. And Asami is busy inventing a whole bunch of stuff with future industries. Meanwhile, Korra's been doing frustrating physical therapy with Katara, just trying to get back on her feet. After two years, she decides to leave the South Pole for Republic City once again. On the way there, she suffers some embarrassing defeats and decides on new look. Changes her clothes, cuts her hair, that whole game. Clearly it was the ponytail that was stopping her from entering the Avatar state. I don't know, is that even a ponytail or is that considered something else? I, I don't I don't know hairstyles. Anyway, Korra even looks for answers in the spirit world but comes up blank. There's no connecting her with the Avatar spirit. She lies and says that she's in Republic City, reunited with her friends, but really just goes all eat, pray, love, and backpacks around looking for Rava or an answer or anything. She's hallucinating visions of her old self in Avatar mode around every corner. Or is she? She meets a small dog that can see the hallucination, so she must not be losing it. She follows the dog to the swamp and realizes that it's a spirit, but not one who cares enough to save Korra from a crushing defeat by her own Avatar apparition. She's knocked out, pulled into quicksand, and wakes up in the home of everyone's favorite tiny green swamp-dwelling energy wielder! No, not Yoda! 
or Shrek, but the return of everyone's favorite, Toph Bay Fong. She calls Korra Twinkle Toes. It's just an adorably epic scene. Meanwhile, upon discovering that Korra is missing, Tenzin sends all of his children, Jinora, Milo, and Iki, to find Korra. Well, all of his children, except Rohan, because he's like three. The world needs her, but Korra is still out in the swamps, physically and emotionally. Korra asks Toph to remove the last of Zaheer's metal poison from her veins so that she can reconnect with the Avatar state, but Toph encourages Korra to find balance and expel the poison herself. You know, like the title of this season. Tenzin's kids find them, imploring Korra to come back and stop Kuvira's power grab. For their sake, our hero faces down some intense PTSD flashbacks and metal bends the poison out of her own body to reconnect with the Avatar state. Nice. Now that Korra's back in business, she heads directly to Zhao Fu to challenge Kuvira. There, Varric is experimenting with harvesting raw energy from spirit vines, albeit unsuccessfully. He stops his experiments after realizing their devastating power, but Kuvira threatens to kill him if he doesn't keep working. Su Yin, the head of Zhao Fu, rejects Kuvira's order to become part of the Empire, and Kuvira declares war. After ages and ages of Are We the Baddies pontificating, Bolin finally gets smart about Kuvira's totalitarian ways and takes off with Varric and Zhu Li, his lab assistant. Korra asks Kuvira to back down, and she refuses. And at this point, Su Yin is already hatching a plan to put an end to Kuvira. When she and her sons try to kill Kuvira, they're taken hostage, and the city is ordered to surrender. Korra takes a final swing at diplomacy, but Kuvira challenges Korra to one-on-one -on -one combat. Korra nearly wins, but another traumatizing flashback gives Kuvira the upper hand, and Tenzin's kids have to ferry Korra to safety. Meanwhile, Zhu Li betrays Varric and Bolin and gets them all captured. Bolin and Varric are forced to research the Spirit Vine Bomb, which works in their favor when Varric sets it to blow up the lab, destroying the research and giving them an escape. They set off to warn Republic City about the weapon. In anticipation of her new weapon's unveiling, Kuvira has troops harvesting spirit vines for ammunition. The spirit vines aren't thrilled with this and start abducting people in retaliation. Even the vines are kidnapping people now. I wasn't kidding about the X captures Y thing. Janora goes in for the rescue and ends up getting trapped herself. On the home front, Varric and Bolin make it to the capital and warn everyone of the bomb Kuvira is developing. Bolin, Opal, and Lin set out to rescue Su Yin and her sons from Kuvira while Asami and Varric team up to create flying mecha suits. Prince Wu leads the evacuation of the city, and Korra fails to convince the spirits to help defend Republic City. Behind enemy lines, Zhu Li reveals that she was a double agent for Team Avatar all along and attempts to sabotage Kuvira's weapon. Luckily, Su Yin, Lin, and Bo Lin are breaking the prisoners out of Kuvira's fortress, and Zhu Li escapes with them. They head back to Republic City, where Korra is hitting a wall on the whole spirit world defense thing, but stands firm on her refusal to build spirit vine counterweapons. The recently returned crew fills in President Raiko on Kuvira's plan to attack in two weeks, and everyone agrees they've got to destroy the bomb before it can get to the city. But Kuvira's army starts marching a week before schedule. Kuvira has mounted the super weapon onto a giant mecha suit, which she is driving. Kuvira advances on the city and takes out the warships. Seeing his city in flames, Raiko surrenders. Kuvira sends her fiancé, Batar, to broker a deal, but Korra takes him hostage with an ultimatum. Stop the advance on Republic City, or she'll keep him away from Kuvira forever. Batar begs his fiancé to stand down, but she uses his location to mow them all down. Down. I guess the heart wants what it wants, and in Kuvira's case, it wants dictatorship. It looks like things are over for Republic City, but in true Avatar style, Korra's not down for the count just yet. They try blinding the mech, tripping it, and hitting it with electromagnetic pulses. As a last resort, Lin gets Asami's father, Mr. Sato, out of jail to mount plasma saws onto the flying mecha suits. That way, they can cut a hole in the mech and disable the suit from the inside. It's a great plan, except for the part where uh, Mr. Sato sacrifices himself and, and dies. Once inside, they tear apart the machine. Su Yin and Lin take down the gun arm, Bolin and Mako disable the power grid, and Korra takes on Kuvira for the last time. The giant mecha suit blows up and the parts come crashing down. Pursued by Korra, Kuvira finds the giant arm in the spirit forest and takes her shot, but she loses control. Both women land directly in the line of fire, and Korra shields them, redirecting the weapon's energy into the sky. The blast creates a new portal and Korra and Kuvira tumble into the spirit world. In a climactic heart-to-heart, -heart, Korra convinces Kuvira to end it. The whole lust for power thing, not like her life or anything like that. Back in reality, Kuvira finally orders her troops to stand down and is promptly arrested. The villain is defeated, balance is restored, and Korra and Asami walk off into a spirit world honeymoon hand in hand. If you thought we'd be following up our timeline with a video about 107 facts, well, you'd be right. Way to go. Here's a sticker. The Legend of Korra expanded the Avatar universe in unexpected and wonderful ways. It wasn't everyone's cup of tea, but you'd be hard pressed to find someone who refuses to admit there are any redeeming qualities here. So enjoy this next collection of facts. 107 Legend of Korra facts you should know.
The Legend of Korra, the critically acclaimed follow-up series to Avatar The Last Airbender, rocked our world for four seasons before going off the air too soon in 2014. The Legend of Korra broke racial, sexual and political ground like no other show, easily becoming one of the most progressive animated series ever. I'm Weeble with Channel Fredrator and today we're revisiting the legendary element bending tale. Are you a diehard fan or just wondering what all the fuss is about? We've got something for everyone as we count down 107 facts you should know about The Legend of Korra. Let's get started. The Legend of Korra was an animated Nickelodeon show created by Michael Dante DiMartino and Brian Konietzko, two animation power powerhouses who brought us four amazing seasons of more bending than we could ever need. Knietzko and DiMartino, or Bright as some fans like to call them, were initially worried about the project because fan mail demanded that they stop working on Korra in favour of an Avatar sequel. However, the duo presented the trailer for Korra at SDCC 2011 and of course the crowd was wildly ecstatic. DiMartino was a director at Film Roman for six years, working on series like King of the Hill, Family Guy and Mission Hill. He also animated and directed the short film Atomic Love, which is screened at Sunday Dance, the Los Angeles Film Festival, and the Nicktoons Animation Festival. Gnetsko began his career in animation as a character designer at Film Roman for Fox's primetime series Family Guy. He soon moved to assistant director on Mission Hill and King of the Hill, working besides DiMartino. He then became a storyboard artist and later art director for Invader Zim. The two brought on Joaquin Dos Santos and Ki Hun Ryu, who worked on the original series as the heads of the production. All the top creative leads contributed artistically. Konietzko, Dos Santos and Ryu share our direction duties. Originally, the show was to premiere in October 2011, but it was delayed until April 2012. It was also originally created as a miniseries, which Nick later expanded into a full show. You could say that Nickelodeon eventually realised how amazing this show would be. The aim of this series was to be a little more mature than Avatar, since Korra was older than Aang was in The Last Airbender. The idea for Korra's character stemmed from wanting a character whose personality was completely opposite from Aang's. She was inspired by one of Konietzko's sisters, who he says is pretty tough. He also says that female MMA fighters were an influence. In their 2014 interview with TheMarySue.com, Konietzko and DiMartino described their intention in designing Korra as a foil to Aang. Here Aang wasn't initially comfortable with assuming the responsibility of being the Avatar. Korra wanted the responsibility. She reveled in it. She had to let go of her ego and become a more spiritually balanced being. In describing their idea for Korra to their artist and Dos Santos, Konietzko and Di Martino describe her as being a water tribe version of a snowboarder or an MMA fighter. The idea was to break conventions of what female superheroes are. She's tough, she's rugged. Konietzko says it was fun to play with the familiar motifs of water tribe costumes by giving Korra a more fitted three-quarter sleeve parka as well as clashing her blue outfit with firebending gear when the audience first meets her as a teenager. Both things we don't really see in Avatar. Konietzko describes the art direction process of Korra as wholly collaborative. For Korra's final design, Santos provided the bulk of the work. Kihun Ryu added the spice and Konietzko merely baked it all together. The name Korra was inspired by the owner of an Okono Lodge who had a dog named Korra. You never know what you'll find at an Econo Lodge. Even as a child, Korra is very self-assured and aggressive. Ryu wrote a version of the dialogue, I am the Avatar, you gotta deal with it, in one of his early sketches of young Korra. The creators loved how perfectly it summed up her attitude and personality and incorporated it into the first episode. Unlike The Last Airbender, the creators wanted to make each book standalone with one main threat per book. However, Everything Korra does and learns in one arc carries over to the next and ties into her overall spiritual path. Mako and Bolin came out of a desire to include a story about brothers in Korra and also to illustrate how family and culture had become more mixed 70 years after the original series. The brothers were designed by Kihun Ryu and live in a modern metropolis in the United Republic. According to the creators, Aang and Zuko founded the United Republic after the war as a place where the benders and non-benders from all four kingdoms could live together in harmony. At a Comic Con panel in 2011, Konietzko said, if you're wondering, we did name him after Mako, which is in honour of the Asian American acting legend and voice actor of Uncle Iroh. Bolin takes a lot of his personality and character design from the original character concept for Aang's earthbending master Toph, before Aaron Ehad suggested that the role of Toph should be changed to a girl. Bolin rescued Papu from a nasty pet star at the age of 14. They've been inseparable ever since. I mean, I'd do the same if I found a fire ferret. The idea of Naga was dreamt up by Konietzko and actually originated alongside Appa and Momo. Everyone loved the character, but never found a place in the original show for her. When they came up with Korra and started thinking about her animal companion, they remembered the old sketch of Naga. The revision process of Naga wound up taking inspiration from Konietzko's and DiMartino's dogs. Naga and Korra's backstory is that people typically feared polar bear dogs, but when Korra was a kid, she courageously befriended a lost pup and named her Naga. Konietzko is very critical of his abilities when it comes to drawing women. 
but he wanted to handle Asami's design single-handedly. He wanted her to have some Hollywood glamour, but also having some killer racing outfits in her wardrobe. Her design was somewhat inspired by Rita Hayworth. Asami Sato was originally going to be an equalist spy who was using Mako to get close to Korra, but the team behind the show ended up liking her so much that they thought it was better to keep her on the old good guy's side. Chief Beifong, leader of the Metal Bender Cops, is mostly inspired by Toph, but visually she was somewhat based on one of the producers, Hang Young Jia, who worked at Studio Mir in the animation studio in Korea. Han Young Jia is also a longtime friend and colleague of Konietzko and DiMartino. Life is all about connections, guys. When her character was introduced at SDCC 2011 as Toph's daughter, the audience immediately started chanting, WHO'S THE DADDY?! The creators pretended not to hear this question. I don't know what you're yelling, but we have to keep moving, Konietzko said. If Asami is inspired by Rita Hayworth, then Lin's old Hollywood influence came from the harder-edged Marlena Dietrich, a tough and natural beauty. Lin gave the writers a good excuse to say things like, diddly squat, which was always a plus. Milo was based off of Konietzko's friend and former professor's son, Milo, who was such a force of nature that he and Mike knew they had to base a character on him. It really took to heart, write what you know. Ryu really wanted to make Milo an ugly kid but the show creators urged him to make Milo a little cuter. I imagine Milo is very appreciative of that. Hiroshi Sato was inspired by Theodore Roosevelt and Geita Goto, a Japanese industrialist. Production manager Benjamin Koltenecker has the exact same nose as Ryu's design for Tenzin, which Ryu is pretty obsessed with drawing during meetings. Bit weird. The artists had trouble with Tenzin, more specifically having problems keeping his nose consistent you would think be easy since they could simply look at the production manager. Voice director Andrea Romano is a legend at her craft with credits in the DC animated world as well as on Teen Titans, Spongebob Squarepants, The Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain. She also worked on the original Avatar series. Hey everybody, taking a quick break from the facts to let you all know that this is your last chance to enter StashRiot.com's $1,000 giveaway. To enter, all you have to do is click the link in the description below and enter your email address at stashriot.com for your chance to win $1,000 for all of your plushie and t-shirt needs. Contest rules apply. Stashriot.com is also offering free shipping throughout anywhere in the US, and if you're overseas, they're taking $5 off your order shipping. And if you're watching this video after April 30th, don't worry because stashriot.com does a bunch of giveaways, so be sure to check back for your chance to win. And now, let's get back to the facts. Cora is voiced by Janet Varney, who also starred in Burning Love and Dinner and a Movie. She also hosts a podcast on the Nerdist Network called The JV Club and has made appearances on At Midnight. When auditioning for the role, Varney said, I don't let myself think too much about it being Last Airbender related because I'm a fan of the show and I didn't want to jinx it for myself by getting too excited or too worried about it. Varney's inspiration for voicing Cora was Jodie Foster and Christina Ricci. PJ Byrne, who voiced Bolin, is known for his roles in The Wolf of Wall Street, Horrible Bosses and Final Destination 5. They made five? Byrne was given a lot of freedom in his voicing since his character is mostly comic relief. He was allowed to ad lib and his lines were either cut or kept. Mako's voice actor was David Faustino, famous for playing Bud Bundy on Married with Children. Faustino said he and Mako both don't understand women very well and they have bonded for it. Asami's voice actor Seychelle Gabriel appeared in the live action The Last Airbender movie as Princess Yu. Aang's son Tenzin is voiced by none other than J.K. Simmons, who is famous for his roles in Juno, Burn After Reading, and most recently Whiplash, for which he won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor. Aubrey Plaza, known for playing April on Parks and Recreation, voices Eska, Cora's cousin and Bolin's almost fiancé. Other animation credits for Miss Plaza include SpongeBob SquarePants and Monster University. Dante Brasco, a young swashbuckling hero and the youngest general in the United Forces history, is very close to his grandfather, Lord Zuko. To honor this relationship, they decided to use the same voice actor. So here is voiced by Henry Rollins. Rollins is also the voice for Benjamin Knox or Bonk in the 2000 animated film Batman Beyond Return of the Joker. Lin's voice actor is Mindy Sterling, best known as Frau Fabisner in the Austin Powers franchise. Mindy is also a breast cancer survivor. Hiroshi Sato was voiced by Daniel Day Kim, famous from Lost and the voice of General Fong in The Last Airbender. You might also know him from Hawaii Five-0. One, the first ever Avatar featured in Beginnings 1 and Beginnings 2, is voiced by Stephen Yen, known for playing Glenn in The Walking Dead. The show's composers are Jeremy Zuckerman and Benjamin Wynn, also known as the Track Team. The two met at CalArts, where they both studied music and composed the music for Last Airbender. The three primary styles of fighting incorporated into Legend of Korra are traditional Chinese martial arts, mixed martial arts, and tricking, 
which is a style that uses flips and twists from gymnastics as well as breakdancing moves. The origin story for the first Avatar is something DiMartino and Konezko kicked around for years on the original series. They knew they wanted a distinct art direction style for this mythic tale to help place it 10,000 years before Korra. The creative team drew inspiration from ancient and traditional East Asian ink wash paintings and woodblock prints for the environments, expanding the vision of the Avatar world, but also staying true to the building blocks of its visual influence. In an early version of the script, one was washed away down a waterfall before he found the Air Nomads, but they had to cut those scenes because the episode was too long. The Earth battlefield, where one died, is the same field Zuko passed through in Zuko Alone. Konietzko has described Republic City as a 1920s fictional Shanghai meets Manhattan, with coughing old-fashioned cars in a steampunk environment and floating iron blimps. The idea for Pro Bending, the spectator spot using benders in the series, was created before Korra was the Avatar. Part of the inspiration for Pro Bending was the Leatherhead era of American football. Not too bulky, but not completely streamlined. The Pro Bending arena was largely based on the Harmanda Sahib, the Golden Palace in Amritsar, India, and the Saltaire Pavilion on the Great Salt Lake from the late 1800s. Mako learned his lightning skills from his former boss, Lightning Bolt Zolt of the Triple Threat Triad, who also happened to be the first person to have his bending taken away by a mon. The scene with Mako learning pro bending from Toza and lightning techniques from Lightning Bolt Zolt were both cut out of the show to save time. During the time of the first series, bending lightning was incredibly rare, reserved for the inner circles of Fire Nation royalty and high-ranking military officers. Korra is the third female avatar mentioned in the series after Yang Chen and Koyoshi. For inspiration, mixed martial arts fight fan Konietzko referenced female fighter Gina Carano. Once we had the idea of a tough athletic girl, her personality took shape pretty quickly, he recalls. In the Avatar Meta series, Asami is the second person to be mistaken for the Avatar, the first being Sokka from The Last Airbender. Bolin's appearance in the last season was inspired by the Rocketeer, the most striking similarity is that slick leather jacket. Brian had the initial idea for Korosami early on, like season one early, but he and the other writers assumed that he wouldn't fly on a kid's network in 2010. As time went on and Korra and Asami's relationship developed through the later seasons, Brian says that the idea became a more and more organic possibility. He cites Hayao Miyazaki's belief that the lead male and female shouldn't be expected to get together storybook style at the end of a story. When they were approaching the finale of the show, Konietzko finally asked himself, why can't we depict them together? In his words, no one ever explicitly said so. It was just another assumption based on a paradigm that marginalizes non-heterosexual people. If we want to see that paradigm evolved, we need to take a stand against it. Korra is the first canonically bisexual heroine in American children's animation. Speaking of couples, Varric and Zuli weren't planned to end up as a couple, but that's where the story ended up, according to Brian Knietzko. Episode 8 of Korra's final season, Remembrances, was always meant to be a clip show. The budget cut was announced early enough that this season was planned out around it. Mike and Brian had planned out 12 episodes of plot. Reportedly, the alternative would have been to make a full 13 and let some of their production crew go early. The spirit who one encounters is based off an ai, a lemur that is found in Madagascar. DiMartino found the animal while looking for odd-looking animals. He thinks ai eyes eyes are very creepy. I'd agree that they're kind of creepy, but in a cute way. The Marching Spirit Parade in Beginnings Part 1 is a homage to Hayao Miyazaki, one of the greatest animation directors. Because the Nook Tuck film was shot in black and white, the fact that the guards weren't wearing pants wasn't super evident, but they are in fact pantsless. When it comes to creating water tribe costuming and culture, Konietzko turns to a book about the making of the film Tana Yuat, The Fast Runner. Photos of beautiful Inuit parkas inspired Judge Hota's robe. The trees in the sacred forest were based on ancient bristlecones pines, some of the oldest organisms on Earth. No attack slash Amon accidentally is the same exact hairstyle as Korra. Despite how different they are at present, they came from similar cultural backgrounds. The uniforms for the metal bending law enforcement officers of Republic City hark back to the traditional samurai armor blended with the military style uniforms of New York City cops in the 1920s. The currency of Republic City is based off the Chinese yen and Ang's face is on it. Underneath the Avatar Ang statue that looks out over Republic City is a museum containing many historical avatar relics, kind of like the Lincoln Memorial. Because the character was so popular with fans, a statue of the cabbage merchant appears in Korra, commemorating his first stand in Republic City. Konietzko and DiMartino even came up with an elaborate backstory about how this lowly vendor worked tirelessly to create Cabbage Corp. In the first draft of the script, they wrote in news reports that explained how Lao Gang Lan and his father, the cabbage merchant, had a long history of disputes with Avatar Ang 
and a discrimination against benders. A gag idea that never made it was a rabid fangirl who would appear at Amon's rally and pay tribute to the foaming mouth guy from the original series. Ultimately, they decided the comedy undermined the creepiness of the rally, so they cut it. While working on book one of the series, Mike pitched the idea of an Avatar follow-up movie. The pitch was declined in favour of a second season of Korra, but the story was published in comic book form instead. Studio Mir, which began animating for book two episodes, did not finish because they had begun work animating the boondocks. Eventually, they were asked to come back and reach the deal with the Japanese studio to work on the rest of the season. The CG legend of Korra was handled by Technicolor's India studio. Michael and Brian wrote the first season by themselves. When Nickelodeon asked for more episodes, more writers were brought in. Animation director Yu Jae Myung said the production of the series was suspended at one point because Nickelodeon execs still had an issue with the protagonist of the series being a girl. Michael and Brian had to change their minds before the series production was resumed. When shown to a test audience of kids, the boys of the group didn't care if the star was a girl and thought the show was just awesome. The decision to move Korra to a digital release came from the fact that the online presence and numbers were far higher than those on live television. By the time book two rolled around, the numbers on digital streaming greatly outweighed the channel anyway. Nickelodeon brought Korra back to television halfway through book four, giving it a 9pm slot on Friday nights on Nicktoons, but not on Nickelodeon. There was a lot of overlap in the production. The crew was having meetings about the beginnings of the final season, when the second season wasn't even done yet. Several episodes of season three were leaked online before they aired. This was partly to blame for episodes getting lower ratings, and eventually the show was shown only online. Nickelodeon shortened the length of episodes during season three from 24 minutes to 22. A Legend of Korra comic featuring a young Korra was released on free comic book day in 2015. After book two was complete, Nickelodeon asked the team to make free graphic shorts for their app. This ended up being a prequel to Korra, focusing on Mako and Bolin's life on the street before they became pro benders. There's a free interactive book called The Legend of Korra Enhanced Experience available for download through iTunes. Among the many features offered, a concept art, an in-depth look at the characters, animatics and storyboards from book one. After the show ended, the fan petition to have Netflix produce a new show in the Avatar universe gained 10,000 signatures. However, Nickelodeon still holds the right to the series. Having just come off over 10 years of bringing the Avatar verse to the small screen, both Knietzko and DiMartino have opted to close the door on it, at least in the medium of animation. After the Korra finale, Gallery Nucleus in Alhambra, California had an Avatar slash Korra art show featuring both art created by artists for the series and by fans. This show featured an exclusive exclusive canon print by Brian Knietzko of Korra and Asami embracing. Several prints were made available, and the proceeds were donated to a suicide prevention hotline for LGBTQ youth. However, some of the Korra staff is already working together on a new project, which is being jokingly referred to as Korra 2.0, not because of any connection to the Avatarverse, but because of the shared creative experience of most, if not all, of the creative team. The series premiere of Legend of Korra drew over 4.5 million viewers. It was number one in viewers on basic cable for a kid's show and an animated series. Book One, Air, drew an average of 3.8 million viewers per episode, making it the most viewed animated show in 2012. The premiere episodes of the second season only had 2.6 million viewers tune in, while the lowest rated episode of the first season had 2.9 million. This might have been because of the long hiatus between the two books or the change in time slot. Pixel Drip Gallery put together a core of fan art show along with a short documentary about it. The show was lovingly called I'm the Art Show, Deal With It. IGN named the show Best TV Animated Series in 2012 and 2014. IGN's People's Choice Award for Best TV Animated Series in 2012, 2013 and 2014 and IGN's People's Choice Award for Best TV Series in 2014. It was nominated for several Annie Awards, winning Outstanding Casting for an Animated Series or Special in 2013, Production Design in an Animated TV slash Broadcast Production in 2014 and Outstanding Achievement Storyboarding in an Animated TV stroke Broadcasting Production in 2015. The show is very well received as it was nominated for several daytime Emmy Awards winning an award for Outstanding Casting for an Animated Series or Special in 2013, won 17 BTVA Awards, and won a Gracie Allen Award for Outstanding Animated Program. On playing Cora, Janie Varney said, As a girl, as a woman, it's frankly really gratifying for me to see this new series catapult this incredibly cool female character into the minds of children, and girls in particular, who I hope will feel empowered by her and inspired by her. Everyone is Janet, you the best. The ending of The Legend of Korra had a few folks scratching their heads. There was quite a long will they, won't they relationship and a lot is implied but never quite confirmed. So we did our best to explain exactly what happened here with The Legend of Korra Book 4 Ending Explained.
Do they or don't they? The hashtag Kurosami ending of Book 4 Balance, the fourth and final season of The Legend of Korra, was ambiguous enough to keep everyone from the conservatives to the liberals happy, right? Wasn't that the ending you wanted? No? I'm Alyssa with Channel Frederator. Allow me to bend your ear and explain the ending and reception of The Legend of Korra Book 4 Balance, and the story continuing in the graphic novels. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. <laughs> Background. Who is Korra? And why does she have her own legend? You can get the full backstory on previous seasons and learn 107 facts about The Legend of Korra here. The Legend of Korra is a four season series that takes place a little while after the end of Avatar The Last Airbender. Both shows were created by Michael Dante DiMartino and Brian Konitsko for Nickelodeon, drawing inspiration from Miyazaki's Studio Ghibli films, as well as other forms of East Asian design and animation. Both Korra and Avatar were critical hits and award winners, picking up Annie's, Emmy's, and Gracie's. To recap, Korra is an Avatar, a spirit superhero responsible for maintaining peace among the four nations of her world. That's pretty much the entire job description. Responsibilities. Maintain world peace. The Avatar is also an advanced bender, as in, they can bend material elements like earth, air, water, or fire. Think magic spells without the wand. Korra is the reincarnation of Aang, the titular Avatar of the original series. Upon death, the Avatar spirit causes the Avatar to reincarnate into the next nation, dictated by the cycle order fire, air, water, earth. Aang was an airbender, so the next avatar, Korra, is a waterbender. The Legend of Korra takes place 70 years after the last airbender, and pretends a tonally different setting, an advanced, industrialized world with secular civilizations more interested in technology than in benders and the capital S spirit. The show thoughtfully explores the ideas of faith, purpose, responsibility, empathy, and balance, hence the final book's stated theme. The ending of The Legend of Korra reaffirms that the legend is a tale of self-discovery, and that self-awareness and acceptance serves as a form of ultimate strength. It's incredible. Let's get into it. The ending. Day of Colossus and The Last Stand. The two-part series finale, Day of Colossus slash The Last Stand, focuses on Team Korra desperately trying to prevent Republic City from being destroyed by giant mechs. Full of extraordinary action, heroic sacrifices, and quiet character moments, the finale manages to neatly tie up loose ends in a thrilling send-off. The mechs are war weapons of Kuvira, a master metal bender and a dark reflection of Korra. In the beginning of Book 4, Kuvira assumes power as a political and military leader in the Earth Kingdom as the Great Uniter. She began with mobile intentions to restore order in a power vacuum and lead her people. Like Korra, Kuvira wants to make sense of the world and her role within it. Both struggle with the weight of their responsibility, and both lose their way the more disconnected they are from the spirit realm. Kuvira's thirst for absolute control clouds her reason, and what saves the day is Korra's empathy. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Kuvira's takeover of the Earth Kingdom has led her mech army to Republic City, already surrendered to her by President Reiko. Team Korra initially thought they could reason with Kuvira by using her fiancé Batar Jr. as leverage. Batar Jr.'s expertise as an engineer helped Kuvira during her rise to power. Korra enters the Avatar state, her form of infinite power, and convinces Batar Jr. to help them talk Kuvera out of conquering the United Republic of Nations. It only took threatening to keep them apart forever to get him to cooperate. Unfortunately, this plan ends tragically. Kuvera is unmoved by Batar Jr.'s pleas, and fires a spirit cannon that Batar Jr. designed and built for her at the city, condemning them all to death. Team Korra survives the attack, but all seems lost. Kuvera's mechs are indestructible, and she'll stop at nothing to achieve her goals. Korra, the airbenders, and the rest of the anti-Kuvera resistance join forces one last time, knowing they're on the losing side but willing to see it through to the end. So wait, where's Asami? Didn't we say this was all about Korra and Asami? Patience, patience. Asami is with her father, Hiroshi Sato, who looks remarkably like a sexy Theodore Roosevelt. Oh yes, I just double checked and his design was indeed inspired by President Teddy. Asami and Hiroshi's relationship has been defined by disagreements and bitterness, as it was his imprisonment during most of her life that hardened Asami into a tough leader. Hiroshi was only released from jail in the hopes that his mechanical genius could be helpful to the resistance. Spoiler alert, it is. Asami and Hiroshi are working with eccentric billionaire Varric and his assistant Zhu Li to upgrade hummingbird jets with plasma cutters capable of penetrating Kuvera's impenetrable mechs. These scenes are quiet reprieves from the apocalyptic action outside. Asami and her father make amends, while Varric proposes to Zhu Li using an adorable variation on their do the thing catchphrase. Meanwhile, Prince Wu works with Pima to help evacuate the remaining civilians, suddenly revealing an inspiring and noble side to contradict his usual routine of being a vain weenie. Prince Wu's transformation encapsulates the theme of the finale and that all the characters have finally grown equal to their challenges. Just as all looks lost for Korra's crew fighting Kuvera's mech, the hummingbirds arrive, piloted by Varric, Zhu Li, Asami, and Hiroshi. But their bold plan is not enough to do the thing, so Hiroshi decides to sacrifice himself. He ejects his daughter from the hummingbird jet and continues on what can only be a suicide mission. It's a redemption of sorts, but shows that Hiroshi died as he lived, leaving Asami behind because of decisions he made alone. Hiroshi's sacrifice was not in vain, and Team Korra stormed the castle, so to speak. All of our favorite heroes paired off for critical missions. 
intermissions. It leads to three beautifully choreographed fight scenes, three concurrent scenes cross-cutting between the action. It's intense and jaw-droppingly imaginative. We see the most advanced forms of bending, moves that were hinted at in the original Avatar series used in life or death combat by characters the audience loves. And that's what makes Korra the show that it is. The story pairs gripping action with a focus that's fragile, human, and relatable. The fighting gives way to the true conflict, an inner one. A malfunction leads to Korra and Kuvera in the spirit world, where the Avatar finally realizes that she's fighting the very thing she's been in danger of becoming. At last, the villain is defeated not with violence, but with empathy. But wait, this is supposed to be about Korasami. Don't worry, it still is. The Legend of Korra is a story of internal growth and maturation. The titles of the last three books stated outright, air, spirits, change, and balance. The more the show leaned away from its airbender roots, the more it developed a unique voice. Which brings us to that iconic final image. Korra and Asami, eyes filled with love, holding hands as they head into the spirit world for a well-deserved vacation. Throughout the latter half of the series, we watched Korra and Asami come to understand and respect the other. Both recognize the other as a leader struggling to distinguish between what they need to do versus what they want to do, just as Kuvera did. Once Korra was able to confront herself and what she feared the worst version of herself would be, aka Kuvera, she was able to understand herself. She discovered what separates her from Kuvera is the unwavering support and love of her best friend Asami. And so the series ends with Korra and Asami acknowledging their feelings and deciding to try out that whole being in love business. Korasami canon. The final scene was a big win for hashtag Korasami, but the show's confirmation of a popular fanship led to some quote-unquote controversy among different parts of the fanbase. Some conservative viewers will always react negatively to any portrayal of same-sex couples, especially in a show aimed at a younger audience. At the same time, many liberal viewers reacted negatively to the show's reluctance to portray Korra's queerness more overtly. In between were the viewers who claimed the whole thing was nonsense, since it was never clearly stated in the show's canon, and others who ride or die on the Mako Korra ship that tried to set sail in episode 1. So while the show hinted that Korra and Asami's relationship blossomed from friendship to romance, it was never explicitly stated or shown on screen, left deliberately ambiguous for viewers to interpret however they chose. Many fans considered this queerbaiting, a term used to describe when a piece of media hints at LGBTQ plus representation to attract queer viewers, without risking the backlash that comes along with actual queer representation. That changed in the finale. Well, kind of. The show's subtext made its way to the surface in the final scenes when Korra and Asami earned their happy ending and finally became a couple. But even the iconic final shot of hashtag Korasami heading off to a vacation in the spirit world was still open-ended enough that it led to debate and confusion among fans. After the finale in 2014, co-creators Martino and Konitsko each posted essays confirming that hashtag Korasami is indeed intentional and canon, and their relationship is the culmination of both of their personal arcs throughout most of the show. The creators also addressed the criticisms that they were not very clear about Korra's love life, implying that part of the reason for the ambiguity was Nickelodeon's reluctance to show the relationship. The network was afraid of losing sponsors if the show became a lightning rod for controversy, but the creators also admitted that they assumed they couldn't show or state the relationship. Thankfully, Korasami fans got their wish to see the relationship explored in full when it was announced the story would continue in a series of graphic novels from publisher Dark Horse. The comics. The first graphic novel arrived in June 2017, written by series co-creator Michael DiMartino and illustrated by artist Irene Ko. It was the first of a three-volume set called Turf Wars. The second volume released in January 2018, and the final volume is expected to drop in June 2018. The comic picks up immediately where the show left off as Korra and Asami enter the spirit realm. Before long, trouble strikes and they're forced to return home and confront a new villain threatening Republic City, a gang leader named Takuga. As usual in the Avatar verse, the heart of the story is in the relationships, specifically the birds feelings between headstrong Korra and level-headed Asami. The story adds contextual world-building that depicts a troubled history of same-sex relationships in the Avatar universe. Similar to our own universe's long-delayed acceptance of human sexuality, Korra learns that a previous Avatar, Kiyoshi, was bisexual and rejected by society for it. Korra worries about sharing the truth with her friends, but Asami assures her that the Earth Kingdom has changed. At the end of Volume 1, Korra and Asami share a nice big smoochy kiss out in the open, right in front of their friends and allies, as a celebration but also as a statement. Bolin, Jin Nora and Opal all immediately accepting, but Mako is a little weird about it. Typical Mako, always making it about him. The Turf Wars graphic novels handle Korra and Asami's feelings of young love as gracefully as any other storyline was handled in the show. It's not too heavy-handed, nor too obtuse. The character relationships are rich and melodramatic, but they are, as always, balanced by the high-stakes action adventure. And to finish off this video in style, we've collected our personal favorite Legend of Korra episodes. Feel free to contest our choices down in the comments. This is the top seven Legend of Korra episodes. If you remember our previous video where we covered the top seven best episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender, it only makes sense to move on to the next Avatar in the cycle. 
Yeah, some people might tell you that that video is a year old by now, but does it really matter when you have such a timeless show on your hands? Because that's what makes both shows so special. The Legend of Korra might not be the fandom's favorite child of the two, but we beg to differ, as it is just as good of a show as its predecessor. And with the show celebrating its 10th anniversary this year, it's a perfect time to give it some love. I'm Keegan, and you're watching the top 7 best episodes of The Legend of Korra. Old Wounds With 6 episodes into Season 3, The Book of Change, Chapter 6, Old Wounds, is one of the season's strongest episodes that deserves a spot in our list, because it also holds up well with the rest of the series overall. The episode's main focus in its A-plot is the legacy of Toph herself, and we learn the truth behind the tumultuous relationship of her two daughters. One of the reasons why I like this episode so much is that it is one of the few instances in the show where our usual main protagonists take a back seat. After a bunch of episodes that mostly focused on rebuilding the new Air Nation and exploring the Earth Kingdom 70 years after the end of the war, this episode shifts focus from international politics to internal family matters. Season 2 already explored Aang's legacy of being the last of his people and how much it impacted his own family and we also had a national conflict going on with Korra's family right in the middle, so it was only a matter of time until we got to the Beifongs. With Lin and her family being in the spotlight, Korra is mostly on the sidelines during this episode, but while catching a break from running around in the Earth Kingdom, she uses the opportunity to become the first metal-bending avatar. This is where the writers decide to tie in metal-bending with Bolin's character arc because, like probably 90% of the other Earthbenders, Toph is his personal hero and he wanted to master the art of metal bending just like she did. This can't be happening! What, do you have to pee or something? <laughs> You're my hero! Up until this point in the series, Bolin's arc was incomplete and he was still trying to figure out his place in the world, which is a very relatable struggle for all of us. Taking inspiration from one of the last generation's biggest heroes, whom he had something in common with made sense considering his tragic past. And what I like here is that his lack of affinity for metal is not played off for laughs, and it's reminiscent of Sokka feeling inferior around his friends and sister, who were all benders. Because in a world of people with magical abilities, it's easy to forget that not everyone falls under the umbrella, and even benders like Bolin struggle with their identity because it's tied heavily not to who they are as a person, but rather to the art of bending. And for an ordinary teenager with a past in the slums, it makes absolute sense that seeing a prodigy like Korra get the hang of metal bending in just a few tries puts a damper on you. This side plot is cleverly tied in with the main conflict of the episode, which is mainly depicted from Lin's perspective, but at the same time functions as a parallel to Opal's. The theme of intergenerational trauma goes as far back as to the original show, and it makes perfect sense that the cycle goes on, because that's just how it is in reality. Seeing two women from different generations bonding over shared tribulations creates a powerful image and message. Even though family oftentimes comes first, it is important to talk about your feelings and do what is right for you, because everybody is individual and you cannot let yourself be guided by the decisions of someone else, even if they're family. I think the episode does this well, and picking Lin and her family for this theme is very realistic because you just know going off the bat that Toph, who hated her restrictive childhood as much as she did, would try to prevent her children from going through the same thing. And it's nice to get an official confirmation for that because it's very in character. Old Wounds does a good job of portraying the cycle of trauma and is worth of a mention here. But because it falls short on its heavily overshadowed B-plot, it comes in last on our list. When Extremes Meet Let's continue on with our sixth entry, which might surprise some. In my mind, When Extremes Meet is one of the episodes of the show's first season that doesn't get the attention it warrants. It's also an exemplary episode that not only highlights the hero, but also their antagonist, and this episode plays with their dualism. If you've watched the show, you will be reminded of what Toph imparted onto Korra. The problem was, those guys were totally out of balance, and they took their ideologies too far. I think Tarlok is a good example of that. In truth, his ideals align with Korra's, and so do their methods of action, which he himself brings up to her, rightly so. See, that's what I admire about you, Korra. Your willingness to go to extremes in order to get what you want. 
It is a quality we both share. It doesn't take much for someone like Tarlok, who's had his fair share of trauma and feelings of vengeance that last for one lifetime, to increasingly desire to bring change. But where do you draw the line? Being brothers, Amon and Tarlok operate differently on the surface, but what they have in common is their determination to get what they want, with the preferred method of manipulation. If you think about it, manipulation is the perfect tool for men in their positions, one being a leader of the masses and the other climbing up the ranks as a politician. Both of them exploit the system and play the cards they're dealt. In the case of Tarlok, he makes his move by using the city's fractured infrastructure to gain the upper hand, and he's not afraid to abuse his power status, even if it means publicly opposing the Avatar. As a man twice her age, with a clean record, and being a reputable member of society, Tarlok makes a great foil for Korra, the fresh out of the water avatar still in training. He knows where to hurt her most, because he would know himself all too well the feeling of failure at not being able to master bending. Knowing that he is the son of Yakon, a wanted criminal and master water and bloodbender, revisiting this scene makes you realize that he very well might have been projecting his own insecurities onto someone younger who reminds him of himself. With that being said, Tarlok is not a bad villain, and he had the potential to be more. This episode is also a good reminder of the systemic injustice that predominates in significant parts of the world be it the neglect of human rights or outsourcing of local workers for cheap labor under abysmal working conditions. When Extremes Meets shows one of the rare instances of how non-benders in Republic City are actually affected by the prevalent rules that favor benders over non-benders. The curfew scene of the police force rounding up innocent citizens is sadly an accurate depiction of police brutality that is standard procedure in many parts of the world. Non-benders are also a minority in the world of Avatar, which is another not-so-subtle nudge to making minority voices be heard in real life, with the anti-bending movement under Amon's flagship of equality being a clear nod to communism, this episode in particular is still relevant 10 years after its premiere. And yes, it does have a cool car chase scene, where we see the neglected pair of Team Avatar get to shine. But for me personally, the scenes that do not feature Korra's friends stand out more. Leading us to the last few minutes of the episode, which definitely left an impact when you watched it for the first time, because who would have expected that revelation? Again, Tarlok had as much potential as his brother, but if you rewind to just a couple moments prior, we see another interesting interaction between Tarlok and Korra, the two who are really the driving forces throughout the entire episode, which has led to this moment. The confrontation between the two and the ensuing fight is my favorite moment of the episode and in the entire season, but what really brings it home is that we're also being shown two sides of the same coin. What tips them both off is each of them hitting a sensitive spot in one another's ego. Tarlok feels threatened in his power and must contend with being compared to a criminal villain, while Korra is trying to overcompensate for her status as a half-baked avatar by going on the offensive, because that's just who she is. The moment where Tarlok lets his guard down and throws caution to the wind is the catalyst to a great but too short-lived fight sequence that is a great visual answer to what happens when two extremes meet. And the winner is… Our next entry on the list is another book one episode because in my opinion it's probably the show's most underrated season, even though it has a good plot that keeps you on your toes if you ignore the love triangle mess. Episode 6, and the winner is, is a good example for why that is, and it also just so happens that it's the turning point of the season. By now we're halfway through the season and we haven't seen Amon in action yet, barring his on-stage appearance in the Equalist Rally 3 episodes prior. We did get a brief glimpse of him in action when he confronted Korra at his feet, but that was just a tease of what was yet to come. It's in this episode that we see his power on full display. We're also shown how smart Amon actually is by him using the hero's ideals against them, and by the end of the episode it's not difficult to understand why they, for once, were the ones to blame for the damages caused. And that's not necessarily because we're talking about a dangerous man in his 40s successfully manipulating a bunch of teenagers, because he even had the head of the city's executive power play right into his hands. Whatever your sentiments about Republic City's chief of police may have been till this point, I think that a majority of people sympathize with Lin in this episode, because despite her iron exterior, you know that if there is one thing that this woman cares about, it's doing her job, which she gravely fails at this time. 
And it stings even more because we're talking about someone who had been opposing most of the Avatar's actions for good reason. Even though we may not have liked it, but here we see Lin being justified for keeping Korra at bay. It's an interesting reverse of character dynamics if we look at three of the main adult characters in the season. Tenzin, Lin, and Tarlok, a trio that has always been at odds when it came to deciding what's best for the city. Whereas Tenzin was beginning to loosen up towards Korra and supporting more of her actions, Lin and Tarlok were continuously keeping track of the big picture. And in this episode, we actually see a shift in that. It's one of the rare instances where Tarlok and Tenzin are on the same side, and while the divisiveness between Tenzin and Lin is nothing new, her own morals make her take up a stand alongside Korra and her friends who are admirably choosing the idealistic approach. It's even more heartbreaking that her decision to side with the Avatar has heavy repercussions. Considering the history the two have had so far, it's impressive that we see a change of heart in Beifang, who chooses the Avatar over the safety of Republic City once again, towards the end of the fight when she lets go of her metal cables and, with that, letting the biggest threat to the city slip away. It would have been easy for her to keep up her pursuit of Amon, but the fact that she decides against it is telling. With the heroes losing a big battle for the first time because of wrong decisions coming from the right place of heart, and the winner is marks a great halfway point of a solid first season and deserves a spot on this list. Skeletons in the Closet one of the things that makes The Legend of Korra so good is that the show takes its time to shed light on the villains and humanize them, which its predecessor did not. At least if you look at figures like Fire Lord Ozai or Commander Zhao. It's only natural that as the audience we side with the good guys, because why should we sympathize for those who are seemingly in the way of balance and harmony? While Avatar does a great job with characters like Zuko and Iroh, who get extensive character development, though more so on Zuko's part, its villains were not as fleshed out in comparison, and to a degree, you kind of understand why. With most of the villains being from a nation that's characterized as evil for the majority of 61 episodes, it's hard to convince the viewers of the opposite, but then again, exceptions prove the rule. Shifting the narrative structure from an overarching story into four separate storylines means more new villains, which could have easily been brushed over just like Ozai, whose seemingly only redeeming quality was looking cute as a baby. With Councilman Tarlock and Equalist Leader Amon, we get the show's first two serious villain threats, and the show wastes no time establishing their ill-mannered intentions. Despite being part of the Council and an official diplomatic ally to the United Republic, Tarlock's advances and taunting towards Korra happen early on, and you kinda know that whenever he shows up, he is not good news. It takes us 11 out of the 12 episodes until we discover his and Amon's backstory, which ends up being one of the best backstories in, dare I say, the entire franchise. In less than 20 minutes, we learn both brothers' true motivations, and we also see explicit child and animal abuse on screen, which is really heavy for a children's TV and makes you forget that this show is broadcasted on Nickelodeon. And that's why I love it so much, because it takes you to places you wouldn't normally expect, because Avatar, the last airbender, for what it was, was still limited in what it could do. This episode also adds to the world building that has been established in the original series, and we see how the hero's decisions, Aang taking Yakon's bending and Katara outlawing bloodbending, negatively affect others. You very much get the feeling that this is a sequel to the original, because Tarlok and Noatok are just one generation between the old team Avatar and the new team, with Korra having to grapple with the consequences of her predecessor. And herein, we again have the common red thread of intergenerational trauma, which we see running throughout the entire series. Unlike others though, this family does not meet a happy ending, and you will be forever haunted by Tarlok's last words to Korra, which gives you a sense of what's to come. Defeat him. Put an end to this sad story. The Ultimatum Book 3 is universally agreed to be the show's best season, and if you take a look at it, it's easy to see why. It's more similar to the original show, which spent a majority of its episodes in different locations and gave us the sense of adventure as any coming-of-age story would. But as we've already established, this is no ordinary kids show, and if somebody ever asks you why, this episode is probably a good example. The Ultimatum is one of my personal favorites, and maybe that's why it's rated so highly, but I will make my case for why it deserves its spot on the list. Starting off with what can arguably be called fan service, we finally get an interaction between Zuko and Korra, which is perhaps one of the encounters that we didn't expect, but it's an appreciated one nonetheless. 
Considering Iroh's important role in the second season and his cameo in this episode, reintroducing Zuko into the story makes sense to a certain degree. I like the idea of the new generation seeking counsel from those that came before them, and with Zuko and Korra especially, you have two people that have many things in common, at least as young adults. Both of them are known to be hot-headed and impulsive, most times acting before thinking. Thus, it's refreshing to see Zuko talking with an essentially younger version of himself. While his advice isn't quite near Iroh's wisdom, it's obvious that he had a lot of time to reflect on his past, and it's sweet to see the adoration for his uncle based on his reaction when Korra told him that she met him a couple times in the spirit world. It's also an interesting writing decision to have former enemies of the Avatar be the ones to give advice on how to save a nation that their own nation had once wiped out. It just gives you the feeling of the characters having come full circle, and it's a great way to connect the original show to the sequel. For me though, the second part of the episode is definitely stronger. Because, let's be honest, we all wondered what a duel between two airbenders would be like ever since the early days of ATLA. Fortunately, Avatar never disappoints when it comes to fight scenes, especially concerning its more complex fights, which this one falls right under. In a way, the fight between Aang's kids and the Red Lotus is reminiscent of the standoff between Azula and the others in the chase, because both fighting sequences have isolated fights that melt into each other. The best example is probably Zuko trying to one-up Azula with Aang caught in the middle, and Tenzin nearly beating Zaheer until the other Red Lotus members interfere, forcing the airbending master to fight against all four elements on his own. And it's incredible watching Tenzin successfully standing his ground because even after Gazan and Minghua join in on the fight, you still had the sense that he could make it. But to quote Obi-Wan, Plea ultimately had the high ground. We have a great ending to a high stakes episode as we are left unclear about Tenzin's fate as the camera ominously pans away from the characters, while viewers can still hear Tenzin's grunts and the elements bashing in on him. Thanks to its great character interactions, beautiful music, and brilliant fight choreography, the ultimatum is a worthy contender for number 3. Beginnings Beginnings tells the origin story of the Avatar cycle, and placing it in the middle of the second season works out well enough. We can all agree that the deviation from the season's fast-moving storyline that is split up into family time with Tenzin and a broiling water tribe civil war is a welcome one. If there is one point of critique, it's the use of the amnesia plot device, which is a rather unoriginal way to introduce this desperately needed origin story that fans have been wondering about since the original show. If anything, it would have been more interesting to see Korra grappling with her lost memories in a more profound way, other than getting to speak one last time with her past lives, which is also what Aang did during his coma. Sadly, this is the last time that Korra gets into contact with Aang and the others, which in hindsight is a bittersweet moment of what's likely foreshadowing. For a story that took place 10,000 years before the current timeline, Wan's story surprisingly fits in well with the events and conflicts in Book 2, even though you could argue that everything outside of this two-parter could have been executed better. Small details like the inclusion of lion turtles and the throwback to the dancing dragon thicken the connective tissue between the Legend of Korra and its predecessor, as well as the entire history of the Avatar universe. At the same time, it's clear that Wan's origin story is not something that the writers came up with on the spot, and it had been in fact brewing for quite some time in the creators' minds until they had the perfect opportunity here to tell it. Whereas the other episodes of the season and of the show overall did not have the same luxury, Beginnings is one of the franchise's standout episodes. Not only because it benefited from a well-thought-out storyline, but also because of its beautiful traditional art style and its centering on a never-before-known avatar. It is among the better flashback-heavy episodes, which makes sense because the two-parter is almost completely one big flashback sequence. Really, what taints it is that it is part of an overarching storyline instead of standing on its own two feet. That's why we ranked Beginnings in a well-deserved second place. Korra Alone At this point, you probably saw it coming. For those of you who would rather switch number one and two, that's totally understandable because they're both very good episodes. Just like its predecessor, on our list at least, Korra alone is a fan favorite, and that just might be because it is a heavy character-driven episode. As the title suggests, this episode centers around Korra, but this time we get to see her in an unknown territory, deep in the Earth Kingdom, all on her own, without being surrounded by friends or family like usual. 
Therein, we are able to see a different part of Korra compared to how she presents herself in the presence of those who know her. The episode does a very good job of portraying her character in a believable storyline that features very real themes that are often not thematized in media. Those being depression, disability, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And now consider that an indigenous woman is at the center of all that. Right there, you have the sort of multi-dimensional representation that you normally wouldn't see on TV, much less so on a heavily comedy-oriented kids network like Nickelodeon. It's probably common knowledge by now that despite being the main character, or because of it, Korra herself isn't very high up on the list of favorite characters in the Avatarverse, which seems contradictory to this episode's status within the fandom. Yes, it does have a very on-the-nose callback to Zuko alone, which deservedly shares the love and praise it constantly gets, but Korra alone on its own deserves the spotlight as well, maybe even more so. And as we've said before, Zuko and Korra are very much alike. They're both struggling with the idea of who they're meant to be and who they really are. However, unlike Zuko, who has had multiple moments in the series to shine, Korra didn't have nearly as much screen time on her own. Yes, both characters are often accompanied by their allies, but for Zuko, Iroh was his only go-to person for two-thirds of the show, and even the scenes shared between those two serve Zuko's character arc. Korra didn't have that. And this is one of the reasons why Korra alone is such a well-written episode that is completely justified, because it's essentially a return to the show's roots and the continuation of a certain pattern. Just like the previous three books, we see the main character stripped bare, and as a result of that, being vulnerable and feeling helpless. In fairness to the critics, she did already suffer big consequences for her actions by losing her bending and her connection to her past lives. But the first one was resolved in the blink of an eye, and the second one was seemingly no longer deemed too much of an issue after Korra was assured that she would be able to handle things just fine on her own, without the guidance of those who came before her. So putting the most powerful being of the two worlds into a wheelchair for three years with long-lasting effects is surely agonizing for your character, but it makes complete sense for their journey. With all that said, Korra alone is definitely one of the show's better episodes and in the franchise as a whole. Even though there's a lot of justified criticism out there, The Legend of Korra remains a show with much potential and doesn't get enough credit where it deserves. Wow, we made it. A long and arduous journey, not unlike that one an avatar might make to master all four elements. Give yourself a pat on the back and maybe grab a moon peach as a treat. Did you enjoy yourself? Did you learn anything new about this awesome series? Maybe you got all hyped up for the next iterations that are coming up. Make sure you let us know how you're feeling down in the comments and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching and remember, Frederator loves you.